The following is a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. The third stop of the 2023 Grand Chess Tour did not disappoint at the Super United Rapid and Blitz in Zagreb, Croatia. Both veterans and newcomers alike couldn't wait to show off their Rapid and Blitz prowess in the capital city. The lead changed early and often with several early favorites jumping out to impressive starts. But the main story following day two was the slow start of former world champion Magnus Carlsen, who uncharacteristically suffered back-to-back -back losses, leaving the tournament wide open. But much to the chagrin of hopeful frontrunners, Magnus quickly rebounded, winning two in a row to wrap up the rapid section before advancing to the faster time control. It was in this pressure-filled format that the ultimate wildcard proved that once he is in form, he is simply unstoppable. Blitzing out win after win, decimating the field to go a historic nine out of nine to take clear first. Once Magnus took over the lead, he could not and would not be caught, sealing his victory as the 2023 three Super United Rapid and Blitz champion. As the European legs of the tour come to a close, sights are set on the capital of chess in America for the tour's fourth and penultimate stop, the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. the chess capital of the US. We are here in front of the St. Louis Arch getting ready for the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. Let's go back to the studio and get the day started. Welcome to St. Louis, the home of chess in America. We proudly present the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, the fourth stop on the 2023 Grand Chess Tour. The action starts right now. Hello and welcome everyone. We're live from our amazing studio in St. Louis, bringing you some amazing chess action. I'm international master Tanya Sachdev. Alongside me, the one and only Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan. Tanya, I'm so happy to have you back in studio. It's been years. When was it? It was 2019. I was here last. It's amazing to be reunited <laughs> with you here, Yas. Incredible studio and some incredible chess action coming up. Absolutely. Tanya, welcome, welcome. Hello, everyone. And welcome to our live action of the St. Louis Blitz and Rapid. We are getting ready for round one. And my goodness, when I say we have the creme de la creme of the chess world, I really do mean it. Tanya, please do the honor and tell us the roster of participants. Let's take a look at the yes. players fighting it out in St. Louis in the Rapid and Blitz. And we've got the defending champion from 2022 Grand Chester, Ali Reza Firuja, back in action. Also, world number two, the reigning U.S. champion, Fabiano Caruana, the two times world championship challenger, Jan Nepomneshi. There's also going to be Wesley So, who's yes. had a shaky year, but is looking at finishing on a high. Absolutely. As you see, we have these four wildcard players as well. Liam Lee, Sam Sevillan, Jeffrey Zhang, Ray Robson. And they are so anxious to put their mark on this event. And tell us, if you will, about the Grand Chess Tour standings. Let's take a look at where the players stand going into the fourth leg of the Grand Chess Tour. Leading the pack is Fabiano Caruana, who did win the Super Bet Classic in Romania, the very first event. He's got 20 Grand Chess Tour points, a lot of money to boot. I'm looking at the prize money, actually, but go on, tell us more. Money talks, yes, <laughs> and uh, not just the money, but look at that. He's only played two events, so the players have to play a total of four. Exactly. Fabi's got two more events remaining. He's already ahead of the pack. The players have to do a lot, play their best chess. And, uh, and one of them who has to do that is Ali Reza Firuja, who is trailing Fabi. Exactly, and our defending champion. He came into St. Louis last year. He wasn't really a factor. Nobody had really expected him to do much. Guess what? He won the St. Louis Rapid Bowl. He won the St. Cup. He became the tour champion. And as he said, 
as a little boy, it was his dream to play in the event. <laughs> but tell us about the format. Let's take a look. And we do have a dream start with Feruja facing Fabi in the first round. It is a 10-player round robin, which means it's each plays each. The players will have 25 minutes to start with, and every time they press right. the clock, they get an additional 10 seconds. We've got three days of rapid and three games every day. Exactly, and in the Blitz, we have game five plus two. And the traditional uh, scoring system for the Blitz, two points for the rapid, but I love this. No draw offers. Just take that off your mind. You're never going to offer your opponent a draw because they can't accept it either. Tell us about the schedule. I love it too, yes. Uh, you've got to earn every each point here. Exactly. No draw offers, and this is the schedule coming up. It is five days of intense chess action, with three days of rapid and two days of fast and furious a blitz to follow, which will be on day four and day five. Outstanding. And we are very fortunate to have in studio Peter Spittler, Grandmaster Peter Spittler. Hello, everyone. Peter, you look great. Welcome, uh, welcome, welcome to St. Louis. I know you're not, you don't mean it, but <laughs> I'll take it anyway. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, let's take a look at the top three players uh, in the Grandchester standings playing in the Rapid and Blitz event, starting with Wesley So, who is uh, an absolute stalwart of the Grandchester Tour. He's won a couple of editions, but he's having a bit of a lackluster uh, tour so far. So far, you can see him in fifth place there on 15.3 points. Right. And uh, the Rapid and Blitz ratings, very, very solid, but he's capable of much more when he's uh, on song. Uh, following him in, in fourth place, we have Valerio Ferrugia. We've already spoken a little bit about his uh, wonderful uh, visit to St. Louis last year. Right. He's in fourth place in the tour, having played two events, 15.8 uh, points. Uh, there he is on your screen. And his rapid rating is not what you would expect, but his blitz rating is almost 2,900, and he is deservedly sitting atop of the world there. And uh, uh, after him, we have, of course, uh, the person on your screen there, not really uh, ready to take his seat yet. There he is, <laughs> Fabiano Caruana, uh, the American number one. Although it's very, very tight these days, who, who is the American number one. Yes. Uh, but there, there you have an absolutely stellar performance in the tour so far. Clear first on 20 points and way ahead everybody in money earned. Uh, 20, uh, 2765 rapid rating, and he is famously a completely useless blitz player. 20, 2813 there on your screen, fourth in the world. Nobody really knows why he why he bothers Weaky. showing. Yeah, Weaky. not not good at all. It's very well established that he can't play blitz. And on that note, we uh, throw to the final member of our commentary team, women, woman grandmaster Anastasia Karlovich, who will be doing player interviews and other very very important things we can't do from here. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Hello, Yasser. Hello, Tanya. It's so great to see you, but you are a little bit far and the players are closer. <laughs> so that's why I will be doing the interviews with them here in the studio. I will also do the social media and uh, I'm really asking everyone to subscribe to our social media accounts. Grand Chess Tour, St. Louis Chess Club. We are all waiting for you in Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. So let's have a look also to the winners of the previous St. Louis Rabbit and Blitz events. Let's remember who were the winners. So in 2017, it was Levon Aronian and then Hikaru Nakamura followed his steps. Look at this, Levon Aronian won it second time as well as Hikaru. He won it in 2021. There was a break in 2020 because of COVID. And in 2022, Alireza Firuja made it four rounds to go. He beat everybody and won St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. Will he be able to repeat his success and win it for the second time? It's a good question. And uh, I'm really excited to be here. I'm looking forward to the exciting event. And let's go back to the studio. Anastasia, it's wonderful to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And, well, do the honors. Round one coming up, and we've already taken a peek. We know our marquee matchup. Tell us about it, Tanya. The players are ready to go. We saw them in the playing arena, and this yes. is the action that's coming up. It is the All-American face-off as Ray Robson plays against Jeffrey Zhang. We've got Liam Lee, who is a last-minute replacement for Ding Liren, exactly. who withdrew from the tournament. Uh, we haven't seen much of Ding, but we're looking forward to him being back on the board next year. He will be playing a Wesley So. Sam Savian takes on Jan Napomnesi. Anish Giri against Maxime Bachelagra. We saw them have a little bit of a pre-game chat there earlier. So two friends facing each other. And the last one. Yes. That is our marquee matchup. No question. And a very special moment as we have uh, Susan Polgar, who was inducted last night into the World Chess Hall of Fame. A very solemn ceremony that was very nicely done. Thank you, Susan. As we are ready, round one. 
And again, that marquee matchup, mouthwatering of, uh, of uh, Fabi, Fabi and, and Ali Reza. Uh, Ali Reza. And before we get started, let's do it as quickly as possible. Tanya, who's going to win? Oh, are we doing predictions? Gonna, it, quickly. It's prediction time. So the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. Why do I have to go first? You're the lady. <laughs> You're ladies first. All right, let's do this. Well, I'm going to pick Fabi for this one. Uh, he's won uh, the bronze medal at the World Rapid Championship. His speed chess has been so on point US this year. US champion. US champion. He's just playing some of the best chess. It feels like the year of the resurgence of Fabi. It's 2018 true. was his big year and 23. Well, my horse, Fabi, in this one. Okay, Peter, jump in. I'm going to take Jan. Uh, I think he is very, very focused. He wants to do well here. Yasser and I met him uh, this, this morning. morning, and he looked, frankly, uh, scary. Fit. <laughs> fit, fit and scary. And uh, I think when he's in that mood, he is uh, an incredibly dangerous player, very, very strong player in shorter time controls. Well, so, wow, you guys are leaving the fairway open for me. I'm going to go with the number one ranked blitz player in the field. I mean, perfect. in the world. Come on, Ferruja, he's, he's, he's going to repeat. You, you heard it here first. And VAR is going to take Sam Sevillan, a wild card pick. Sam, as you remember, he did really well in the Fisher Random. He, he did. was fantastic, and, actually, in the Fisher Random. And I would say, like, picking a wild card is actually not such a bad idea. We saw in the first two events a certain wild card called Magnus Carlsen <laughs> he did won one win of the events. <laughs> exactly. And we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Peter, we're seeing a very... Very topical line of the Berlin. Uh, break it down for us between Absolutely. Fabi and so Ali Reza. This is the uh, the game between uh, Fabiano and uh, Ali Reza Feroja, and Fabi starts with uh, e4. Uh, whoops. That, that went fast. That was not supposed <laughs> to happen. Uh, Fabi starts with e4, and uh, Ali Reza replies with a very solid opening, which has not been banned in this tournament. There has been some <laughs> events recently where uh, it has been basically forbidden to play this, but uh, we're not at that stage yet uh, in St. Louis, regrettably. Uh, so uh, the d3 uh, reply to the Berlin not allowing the queens to disappear off the board by move 9, mm -hmm. something that we welcome here in the commentary booth. Mm -hmm. uh, Bishop c5 by far the main move here. All of this is, of course, very, very well established theory and I think the conclusion currently uh, is that uh, black is doing fine but it could become quite sharp in particular if white decides to go for the lines where the the white king goes uh, goes queen side uh, but hard to say by move six there is uh, you can either stop here or continue talking 15 minutes I think I should stop here no question but the move h2 h3 for me is a little bit of a surprise if you go back to the because are you afraid of bishop g4, Peter? I mean, why not, would you play h3? Not particularly. I, I think you, you're just trying not to commit to a plan just yet, and you feel that this move will be useful in most cases. Uh, one thing I will say is that with the black king still uh, in the center, once you've played h3, as he has, uh, if you now choose to castle kingside for white, it might actually invite black to not castle kingside themselves, mm. and black could try for something like rook g8 and then some counterplay with, uh, because with g7, g5, because, because the king on uh, g1 with white providing a hook uh, for, yes. for this pawn break uh, could maybe be a bit threatening. Not in this particular position, you still have to wait for white to cast king side. But it's, uh, there is a lot of uh, very fine details here which uh, are yet to be uh, clarified by our players. Exactly. And I also like how black isn't committing a side to castle on. Could go the queen option, side, yeah. yes, the options yeah. are open and it's Fabi who goes into the first thing in the position after the last move. Exactly. And as we uh, take our uh, look around, uh, we're going to go to the game of Anish Giri and MVL. Now, Anish is one of those players who, I mean, his potential through the roof. I mean, he, in any single game, I feel like he can play masterclass chess. Mm. And yet at the same time, he's one of those players who doesn't lose. He just doesn't win often enough. I mean, is that a fair knock? I mean, he's a great player. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but he's maybe too solid. <laughs> I think he's one of the best in the world. You hit Clear. the nail on the head. It's so hard to beat Anish. He's got this universal style of play. But I think we underestimate his ambition a little bit. It's, it's not the 
solid, boring approach. I think he really likes the correct chess. He plays principal chess. He's always trying to find the, uh, the best way forward in a position. And sometimes that might come in the way of some practical uh, decision making, which offers chances to win, but also sometimes mess up the game a little bit. Mm -hmm. So with not having that, uh, not taking that risk in those moments, Sometimes the win or those chances seem to slip out. But I feel we've been seeing Anish 2.0 this year. Yeah, we've been seeing him play ambitious. But it feels like a different Anish. He's fighting it out in every game. Not as many draws. And he did get this repetition. It was back in St. Louis when he earned this repetition of playing mm. for a draw. Okay, and getting, getting them as well. But Peter, I mean, the crazy part is they're playing your opening. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. Jump right in and tell us what, uh, is this the latest and greatest in Grunfeld theory? This is a, a very fashionable, a very fashionable line against the Grunfeld uh, where white in this, but this is a, we can start from the beginning, I guess. Uh, so this is the Grunfeld defense, which is something I've been playing since I was about 12 and uh, have even against better judgment written courses about. <laughs> Uh, uh, and this is uh, arguably maybe one of the most important positions of the Grunfeld. And this move h3, which uh, uh, Anish played here, is uh, a recent uh, quirky little way of trying to, uh, to approach this opening. Once again, somewhat non-committal, the main moves in this position would have been the move rook b1, or the move bishop b2, or the move bishop b3. But h3 keeps all of your options intact. And uh, what, uh, what they're discussing here is, I think, the correct way for black to play. This is also what I recommend in the course. Uh, check queen a3, d5, knight e5, castles. And this is a very complicated position, and MVL has experience with it. Uh, even up to the position they have on the board right now, these moves uh, are not forced, but they are very logical. Black uh, plays bishop d7, bishop a4 to drive the queen to this slightly awkward looking square trades the knight for the bishop on e2, and now white goes bishop g5. We're still, as you can see on your screen, we're still following the game between uh, Sam Sevian and uh, Maxim Vashile Graf played uh, last year, and clearly he uh, should be very well acquainted with this. This is a very, very sharp Grunfeld. It's uh, the type of position uh, a Grunfeld player from the black side normally enjoys playing because there is a lot of uh, scope for counterplay, but against an incre incredibly well-prepared uh, opponent uh, such as Anish, you're still fighting for equality for now, but you should be okay, I think, if you play precisely. Although I feel I may know the answer, uh, Tanya, I feel like a lot of our audience wants to ask the question, why didn't Black win the Rook on A1? Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that uh, might seem attractive at first glance. In particular, let's say in this position, in, exactly. uh, you, you can just take on f3. Hello. And then take I'm a rook. I'm a rook up. Take, <laughs> take a rook for the bishop. Right. Which uh, we're being taught that, you know, rook is five pawns and bishop is maybe three, and a, half, three and a half on a good day. <laughs> but uh, the, the threat of bishop h6, uh, the black king, once this bishop is gone, the bishop that is currently very notable for its absence on the g7 square, the dark squares are incredibly, uh, incredibly weak. You have to deal with the threat of bishop h6 immediately. White also has a very, very strong center. And black's pieces just don't impress very much. So, so you don't like this for no, black. You no. would not take the exchange, I, even though materially. Uh, for, for me, uh, there are some positions where you, 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 you have to commit to this particular uh, exchange. Uh, but this one I really dislike, and bishop d7 I, I would prefer in a hard bit here. Okay. I would agree with Peter on that. That you bishop would. in g7, the dark squared bishop, is the heart and soul in these positions. And sure, you win the exchange, but with all those dark square weaknesses, you might just end up losing the game. I think it's important to not be materialistic. And I know you're a pawn grabber. <laughs> it would have taken me 10 years not to take that rook. I mean, 10 years of experience. I mean, because you get to play f6 and rook f7, hmm. and you, you tuck and you hold on until the material speaks. It might not be losing as such, but it's, uh, I think it also leads to positions which Grunfeld players tend to, tend to dislike, and uh, MVL is also, I it, think, of, the, of a mind to, to play actively. It looks like the players have reached a unique position because the novelty, the, the, the game disappeared, mm. what you referenced, Sam Sevillan. What happened, Peter? Uh, after Honestly, they're doing this a little bit too quickly for me to, uh, to, keep, up. <laughs> to keep up. and. Uh, for the first time, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be Maurice here, and I'm on yet another level. I understand I will never be Maurice, and uh, <laughs> it's impossible to be Maurice if you're not Maurice. I, there's, no way, there's no way to keep up, in particular with Anish, 
uh, we saw the clock uh, on our screen just now. MVL is down to 20 minutes, and Anish, I think, gained a minute, a minute and a or half. Two, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah uh, there you that, see it. That's a different. That's a different board. But yeah, Anish currently has not spent a single moment thinking. H seven, H six, H six. As H six has been played on our played. screens, there. Um, once again, you have to, you know, having Yasser in uh, in the studio, you have to ask why the pawn e four hasn't been hasn't been. I, I guess we can still wait for a move and pick it up next move would be my best argument because honestly, breaking this pawn chain on e four and d five so should be something that you you absolutely need to do. So right. yeah, the question of exactly why we aren't doing it uh, immediately, immediately, I don't really have an answer. Frankly. Oh, good, 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 good. Because if you both were going to gang up on me and tell me, oh, I don't like taking pawns, yeah. we've got issues. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's a way. Fight. There's a way to find out, of course. But I was trying to trying to avoid it. But it seems to be playable. Honestly, it seems not to be a mistake. Okay. Yeah, and the the engine suggestion would be, I, I eventually might have landed on this, but I think wow. this is such a tricky position. I think what the engine, and I'm assuming Anish as well, because Anish is clearly still very much in, in book, in prep, is yeah. suggesting here is that obviously we don't lose, we don't want to lose both the e4 and the d5 pawn. Right. And now we have this very annoying threat of rook e1 uh, attacking the queen on e4. The queen on e4, despite being on the very, very central square, doesn't really have very good squares to run to. Uh, you could even envisage some scenarios where it gets caught. Uh, for instance, if we make some kind of a stupid move here, uh, you can you can already see just how fraught with danger these things yeah. are. It's it seems to be oh, sorry d7 still d7. exists. D7 still exists. But if yeah. you throw in rook c7 mm, and yeah. you know king f8, something and, like rook c7 here might yeah. be. Or bishop even even simply bishop takes c7 and then we start right. running with the d pawn. So this is potentially very very dangerous for Black. And VL has included h6. h6. And he went rook e1. Yeah, and uh, on, on the topic of how dangerous how this queen is. How is your queen trapped? Mm. And this is maybe why you should have taken on e4 on the previous move, because and this is... I, I wanted to ask you if you don't... This is no longer available. Yeah, your queen is trapped here. That's, that's pretty clear. But that variation where you went queen takes e4 just a mm -hmm. moment ago, and then you went queen d2, I'm, of course, going to play rook to d8, right? Because I want to... Mm -hmm. And I've got the d1 square covered, so no rook d1 to protect you. And I'm sitting yeah. there scratching my head. Yeah, What's and white's play? It's surprisingly quiet. White just says, yes, d5 is incredibly important, so I will, I will spend another tempo on the move rook c5 and reestablish our threat of rook e1 and bishop takes e7 next. And yeah, as we can see, on a, if, I, if I stand aside a little bit and let's dogfish talk, it's, it's still zeros, unsurprisingly, because everything is zeros these days. But black has to be precise. And I'm guessing MVL was slightly surprised by something because h6, uh, the engine clearly disagrees with this. And uh, rook fe1 you. probably has been a bit of a, a, <laughs> bit of a shock. I love rook fe1. I mean, this has rook been. E1 is a this shock. is some awesome prep by Anish Giri. Look at the clock. He's got more time than what he started with. He yeah. continues to put the pressure continues to blitz out the moves, and this is so uncomfortable for Maxime, who actually Absolutely. is one of the biggest Grunfeld experts of all times, uh, to be at 18 minutes right now uh, and handling this speed and this aggressive play with white. Uh, mm. Rookie 3, you pointed out, is the big threat on the board. The black queen would have no escape route. The bishop's attack, you don't care about that. And we've got a move on the board. He rook played rook c8, c8, which apparently is arguably a losing mistake because now white suddenly can take on e7. The point being that after rook takes e1, rook takes e1, this bishop is still not hanging because after queen e7, sorry, Check. rook takes e7, we have whoop, uh, rook c1, c8 here. And this is why we played h3 all those moves ago, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we don't get mated <laughs> on the back rank. And the bishop on f8 is completely uh, unprotectable. You're Very gone. important note here is that the bishop on a4 is so much out of the game because of the bishop, or the pawn on b5, that we can wow. never play. We can never play rook e7, e8. So, so this so is if, a big moment then, Peter. Yeah. If Anish spots bishop e7 and the tactics that ensue, it could mean game over for Maxime. It seems it seems incredibly bad. Yeah, bishop e7, and the bigger the biggest problem for for black in this position is that if you don't have a good reply immediately, the d pawn will just decide the game. Right, d6, um, d7. Yeah. Maybe he is planning to play bishop c3. I was wondering if maybe 
He thinks bishop c3 saves Man. him, but... Now, wait a minute. I got to call a timeout on this one. I wanted to take the rook. Now you want to take my rook on e1 and yeah. spend two tempi? Come on, Peter. We don't believe bishop c3. Yeah, but for, yeah, and this is the danger of playing incredibly forcing variations where your opponent knows them so much better than you do because... MVL was even following his own game. He clearly knows about this line. He's clearly happy with this line to play twice against very strong players. Uh, and then he oh. gets slightly surprised somewhere, and two moves later, he is now wow. uh, one, yeah, one this, correct move away. This yeah. is a big moment here. Mm -hmm. he, it is, Tanya, and because you said it very well just a moment ago. You said that MVL is one of the world's great Excuse me, Peter. Grunfeld, <laughs> yeah. Grunfeld players. I've been learning from him for for, for years, honestly. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, for... I have never seen Maxime Vacher Le Grave in so much trouble and so much pressure on the clock and the board in a Grunfeld before this. Exactly, and uh, you just saw Anish turn his head, go. Wait a minute! You can't do this. <laughs> I think he's he, he's already he's zoned in on Bishop he's, takes e7, and he, he's saying it's going to happen. Yes, dude. You know, Bishop e7. You're you're toast. You're done. <gasps> wow, what a shock. Um, we've got to continue our look around the board. We'll uh, let, uh, let him stew. I'd love to see if Anish finds Bishop E7 on this. Oh, I mean, this could be a decisive, decisive moment for this game. We'll definitely keep an eye on it. But you're, I mean, look, if you've already seen H3, Rook E1, you're yeah. seeing Bishop E7. You are. And we could H3. see it on his face, right? It's, oh, yeah. it's on his radar. Ooh, ooh. Uh, I'm going to jump to the game between uh, Sam and Jan. And uh, Peter, I'm just going to jump it over to you because everything looks normal except there's a black <laughs> pawn on d3. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is another one which which looked quiet for for a moment and is no longer looks quiet at all. Uh, this has been an English opening where uh, uh, Sam played uh, c4, uh, knight of six, knight c3, e5, and uh, this line I think has been popularized, or at least this approach uh, against the uh, e5, bishop b4 lines was popularized, I think, by uh, Magnus, in Magnus, particular, beating, yes. beating Fabi in one of the games of their, uh, the final day of the, the World Championship match in one of the, uh, the playoff games. Bishop takes e3, but Magnus, I think, was taking with the d pawn and then trying for this kind of a slow, grindy plan with... Uh, but b takes c3 is much more concrete, and uh, once again, it seems like both of them are quite well prepared, because... Uh, uh, they got to a quickly, they, yeah, yeah they got to a very strange looking positions incredibly quickly <laughs> which normally is a sign that they both are aiming for something like that so an immediate confrontation here in the center as you can see black prepares and immediately goes for the break with c6 and d5 uh, white uh, responds by trading everything and finally securing the king position and then knight c6 and in this position an interesting uh, kind of a skirmish begins because uh, Sam plays rook e1, and Jan responds to it with a very cute little, seemingly exactly. pawn sacrifice, which isn't a sacrifice at all, at all, because if you take, if you take on e4, you immediately lose to this very, Ooh. very cute tactic with the, uh, the skewer on the uh, on the d file, winning black quite a bit of material. So after e4, knight d4, knight d4, c d4 was played, bishop f5, uh, and. And waiting white to win a pawn, but maybe not a very not, attractive pawn. Not, not one. a very attractive pawn, yeah. You, yeah. you really dislike this for white because white ends up, yes, white has more pawns on the board, but this bishop is going to be very, very sad. And this exactly. knight on d5 is just so beautiful. I think, uh, I'm actually very surprised the engine doesn't prefer this for black. Me too. We have it. Yeah. Yes. It has been played, but I think there was a little switch up of the move order. Instead of taking on e7 directly, he decided to trade on, uh, on C8. Anish Giri going for rook takes rook, and after the recapture, he takes on E7. And Peter, what does that change? It uh, it's, still, it's still very strong, but I guess it gives Black slightly more options because in particular now, the engine suggests this move, uh, Bishop A4, D1, uh, which addresses one of the things that we were talking about earlier, yeah, the fact side. that the Bishop, bishop. on A4 just yeah. had no future. It had uh, nothing at all to, to look forward to. White is still better, but at least you now have to pay some attention to, to your own queen side. The, the engine suggestion currently is to take on a7, just allow black to take on f3 twice, and then bring the queen back. And honestly, this still looks like it probably should win for white, because we've preserved our very beautiful center. The deep one is still ready to wow. run up the board. Yep. And there aren't really any checks on the king side to speak of, so you probably actually have to trade queens here with black and go into an endgame upon down, which you 
should expect to lose, frankly, against good play. Mm -hmm. But compared to the positions he would have been getting after bishop e7 immediately, this is maybe an improvement, which tells you something about how critical uh, MVL's situation is. And yes, it felt like that was the first moment that Anish was out of his prep. Right. When he slowed down in right. a critical position, takes his time, but he didn't find the most accurate, the most precise way forward, which would have given him a much bigger advantage. Well, here's the problem. I mean, I, as I see it, at least, Anish has a choice of wins. In other words, in this position, after the move bishop d1, or even allowing the move bishop d1, what Peter said makes perfect sense. Queen takes a7, another move that just caught my eye immediately. What do I do when I'm ahead material? And I'm so impressed by how powerful this pawn is. I'm thinking I'm winning with queen d2 here, I'm winning with queen a7. Mm. So, you know, you've got your choice of wins, but I agree the immediate bishop e7 from what we saw was just far more accurate and more convincing. But maybe this is the more human approach like you're pointing out. True. You want to get rid of as many pieces without allowing those lines with the black bishop jumping on to c3, the right. defenses that we saw, and this just looks cleaner to Anish. And to my eyes, I, I got no problems here. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm ready, I'm ready in big on trouble. this one. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, we were talking about it ourselves, Peter. MVL, we never saw MVL get caught out like this in a Grunfeld. And by the way, uh, through the magic of te television, we get this rook takes c8. This was the bishop moment. takes e7. Yeah, and that was where we thought the immediate bishop e7 without the inclusion of the rook trades. That stops your bishop d1 that you're mentioning. But even so, uh, Peter, is this, uh, the engine's not that enthusiastic. Yeah, this is, this is still much better for white and uh, it seems like uh, Anish has gone for, for the move queen d2 instead of queen takes a7. Also a very understandable decision, immediately getting the queens off the board, sure. not allowing black to break up uh, the, the structure on the queen side. And honestly, it's a bit shocking that the engine doesn't start by immediately saying white is completely winning. White looks completely winning, frankly. <laughs> right. But it hinges, I think, on the fact that if you play the immediate move d5, d6, which I think you would like to play, sure. d7, now black is in time to play b5, b4 and establish some sort of a blockade. And black is still a healthy pawn down. This is not going to be fun for, for MBL no. to defend. But compared to some of the previous, position, previous positions, you can sort of envisage a way out. You can mm. see how this improves for black, which I don't think was true at all about some of the early options that Anish perhaps has, has missed. All right, so MVL down a pawn with a bishop pair, and he's got to try to hold this position, but there's action on the other boards exactly. as well. Uh, I'm just going to do a flashback, if you yes. don't mind, to uh, Fabi versus... Mm -hmm. uh, Ali Reza. Uh, Ali Reza. When we left it, we just saw the flexible treatment, h3, queen e7. Let's catch up with the players, knight c3, queen e2. And interestingly, it looks like both players want to go queen side. No, I take that back after I see the move B4, but I see that Fabi is not anxious to go kingside, and he's keeping... Sometimes your king is safest in the center, and maybe he's just waiting for the right... I mean, now he's not going to go alongside queenside castling no. anymore. That's not allowed, but we might be seeing some big Vlad's no castling chess by Fabi in this one. There we go. There we go. Um, Peter, jump in. I mean, uh, a very surprising... and. Should, dare I say it, unorthodox approach by Fabi to this Berlin position. Yeah, and I think we should welcome this with open arms because this is going to be a very sharp fight. White clearly uh, is trying to achieve something on the queen side. Mm -hmm. Alireza's response to it is basically, he says, no, I don't believe your b5 break does anything. I'm a bit shocked by the fact that uh, the reply to b5 appears to be actually taking, I think, most people in this position would just immediately, Shut it down. immediately play c65, shutting it down. but. Uh, the engine thinks black has absolutely nothing to worry about and should just take and maybe even throw in the move knight f4, ignoring the fact that the a7 pawn is hanging this check. Yeah, it's a brave new world where, you know, <laughs> engines just give up pawns uh, in every single position. But generally speaking, yeah, we're, we're here now. This is just going to be a very, very interesting fight. White is not entirely happy, I don't think, even castling kingside because... He you, did it. You, uh, you, you yeah. have to eventually, but... Uh, you're also going to be faced with, uh, even let's say after the immediate knight of four, but black is not forced to go knight of four so quickly. Mm -hmm. You can definitely try to prepare the move f7, the five. And just how uh, do these two players match up, Tanya? Let's take a look at their head-to-head -head score. 
Fabiano wow. Caruana, world number two currently with 12 wins and five losses. I wouldn't have uh, guessed that even closely. I would have thought it'd be much more Closer, balanced. right? Much yeah. more tight, but it looks like Fabi is a big favorite, at least on paper. In rapid chess. Yes. No question. Wow, 12 wins. Did you anticipate that? No, but I think it once again Peter? speaks to the, the something uh, you and I, Yasser, I think, have a very, Enjoy it very intimate much. relationship <laughs> with. You know, start playing them early. You know, start playing them when they're very young. Beat right. them when they're young. Yeah, and, right. and, and then you can have a, a good score for it is the first part of your career because exactly. you, you've accumulated some... Yeah, you feel a cushion. Belast, yeah. yeah. There, yeah. When wow. these two players play, do you also feel, Yas, that it is a clash of styles? Fabiano Caruana with his uh, classic approach of building on small strategic advantages and playing it flawlessly, and Ali Reza's aggressive approach? I do feel that. I do. I do feel that the, that the players have uh, different approaches to chess. And uh, I'm not going to call it a generational clash because, mm. you know, when we talk generational class, I, I'm talking 20 years. These two are much closer in age than that. But yeah, I, 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 Tanya, I do. I, I feel a little bit uh, the two different approaches. Two different approaches and the position that we have on the board. Who yeah. do you think it suits more? Um, it's very yeah. hard to say. I, yeah. I think maybe Ali Reza because mm. I am envisaging uh, some kind of a really sharp fight. And... As I was, the, the thing that Black wants to do the most, I think, here is to be able to play a five. Right. Exactly. But not just play a five, but be able to recapture with the pawn, pawn. Exactly. which is currently impossible because that loses a full, a full knight. So I'm um, even considering something kind of outlandish, a move like Queen e7, e8 here, mm -hmm. just to prepare a the five point. so that once the same trade happens, this queen will be connected to the knight on h5. And Weirdly, even the engine doesn't hate that move, which right. I didn't expect. I, I was very much yeah. expecting to be shouted at by, right. by, by the engine here, but it doesn't. It's a very interesting position, and a position I think that you, you want to watch when you, when you see players playing the, the Berlin anti-Berlin. Uh, you don't often get positions which should be as fun as this one. So it's that's... funny why you were talking. I was forcibly reminded of a book that I was recently re reading, Chess Odyssey, by my friend Jeremy mm. Silman. And you know, Jeremy sitting there saying, "When you want to do something, just go ahead and do it. And if you don't mind playing f5 again, sure. taking with the pawn, dropping your knight, and not forgetting about f5, f4." So you do get your piece back. <laughs> but there's a C5 square. Oh, there is a C5 square. Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. But it's an idea that you have to have in mind. Right. That it because can the work. open it's... G file is so compelling. Absolutely. Yeah. But speaking of open G files, there might be one okay. in another game because we're getting a big update. Sam Savian, another huge moment. Uh -oh. Jan Napomnishi has just made a big blunder. We didn't. A very natural looking move. Uh, and Peter, eight six was played, hitting the bishop, and you're showing the line. Uh, take it away. Oops, uh, yeah, that's that's a bit of a misclick. Uh, and honestly, it's a bit of a strange mistake for for Jan to make because uh, you this is a, a very known motif mm -hmm. which occurs in a lot of openings. Actually, the idea of first bringing the g7 pawn out, you destroy a little bit of Black's queen's uh, king side by doing uh, uh, cre creating the sacrifice. And then you take on e6, Ouch. and this forces another pawn out of the way, and this gives you this queen g6 check. Uh, this exists in the Petrovs. There's a lot of very famous positions in the Petrovs where this happens. And IQP positions in general, I think, they feature this tactic quite a bit. So for How Jan, do you finish that off before we move forward from that last position? Because I see well, white has this huge advantage. Yeah, I, I think you just, go, you just go for full material. You don't mm. look for mate specifically. You just collect everything. Eventually, you will pick up that knight because it's also hanging. And you will have uh, three, three connected yeah. pass bonds on the king side. And a continued <laughs> attack on the king side. So exactly. it's, it's not just that you will be ahead on material. You will also be still very much in the hunt for, for the black king. So yeah, that, yeah, that's just completely unplayable. And bishop h6 played and really okay. not, not the shot. I would like, whoa, Jan is actually going for this. So Jan wow. apparently... He's, he's calculated something, Peter. Knight b4 yeah. is... So he's gone knight b4 here and he somehow feels that this is playable, but I don't know. It, 
once again, very suspicious. You, you have to ask yourself how how sure you would be this is unplayable if you didn't have the engine running. Right. But honestly, I think I would be. I think I would still feel this cannot possibly work for black. I, I I'm with you 100. percent So let's say the queen stays on this diagonal, and if you pick up the rook, because you've got this bishop e4. Yeah. So. Eventually, yeah, like check on e g6 and bishop e4. And you're relying on queen to c7? Is ah, that that's the only it. way? Thank you, Tanya. Queen you're c7, on, on, yeah. yeah. I on guess queen this is c7. the point, yeah. Wow, Ooh, and we're getting a lot of massive. updates. The players are just blitzing out yeah, their moves. Yeah, so they, they, got, they got to that position. And, uh, Jan has got an expression like, okay, let's make a draw. Like, okay, this is a perpet. This is not a perpetual. No, no way. No, no. And... Uh, the most precise way of doing this, and once again, I'm wondering why it very specifically goes rook e1 with the king on g8 uh, and not with the king on h8. I'm not rook really e very sure. Rook e5 to g5? Is it Maybe it's to do with queen f5, queen, queen h7. I think I worked it out. I think okay. if, you, if you do it, uh, if with you, the if e6 you do it in this position, if, if you play rook e1 here, black will play queen f5. Gotcha. And after queen h6, black will have the move queen h7, which we don't really want to encourage. Exactly. So we do it. Uh, we do it with the king on g8, and we do it with the pawn on e6. Yeah, it's, it's, it's even better with the pawn on e6 actually. Because yeah. then we don't allow rook e8. Super instructive oh, hang on a second. stuff. Nice. So, one, he gets the final uh, piece into the attack. He yes. brings the rook from a1, takes the time out to join the party, bring all the toys to the nursery, and now there is a massive threat of the rook jumping onto the center mm. of the board on e5. Toys to the nursery? I, it's a nursery you want to be at right now. This is looking uh, like a big attack. And I, I think maybe I know what Jan potentially missed, because I think you, you ask yourself, why is queen f5 not Defending. sufficient there? And the, the reason is you realize that queen takes f2 is just one check. Mm. You don't actually have to stop it. Uh, it's just one check after which uh, after which uh, white will still be able to, to land a decisive blow on the king side. But Sam has he, gone for a different line, which also looks very attractive. E4, yeah. which was my first thought, and you said queen c7, and I thought, no, uh-oh, I yeah, overlooked that. So he actually picked up all the pawns first, right? Right. And then he played bishop e4, queen c7, and oh, in this position, he just played a two, a three, a quiet move, oh. trying to drive the knight to, to a very poor you, square. You can't allow bishop to d5 check. In other words, knight c6, queen h6 check, and bishop d5. Mm -hmm. So he's thinking, I'm going to pick up the knight. I like and it. And me too. There's yeah. no way for the knight to actually keep the d5 square under control. You pick up big material, you win the rook back, and you've got about a million pawns for a piece and an open king uh, to attack. I yeah. like the way you're thinking, Tony. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Black wow. has a way at least to maybe force the queens off here. If you start with queen g7, which looks the more natural way, this I think loses on the spot because white... Uh, Just win. And bishop d5 yeah. comes next anyway. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, Ooh. And now Jan has realized, like, wait a minute. Oh, oh comes back. Six. So Okay, that, that we know loses, but Jan apparently isn't very convinced. But yeah, Sam will definitely do this. This. And then he will pause to think. And I think your hand just makes the move rookie one. Rookie I don't one. think you can make any other move, really. You just want to. But it's uh, so oh, natural. Yeah. Maybe Jan thinks 97 will hold, because that does probably force you to cash in your chips a little bit. But this looks lost. It's terrible. Queen yeah. h7, rook Queen h7 five. probably wins. The simplest way to win here is just to give a check from e6. Got to go If F8. king e8, queen g8 is a nice little usage Obscure. of the pin, which allows you to pick up that rook. Mm -hmm. And if king f8, we do the same. Yes. It's not even difficult. No. So, yeah, it my, my pick for the entire tournament is starting, I would say, poorly. <laughs> And wasn't it Var who picked Sam as... Uh... Uh, yes, he did. Uh, we didn't get Anastasia uh, uh, pick, but uh, we'll be sure to include her. And he's, Sam is... He's doing it. He, and by the way, for me, Jan is one of those players who's incredibly fast. Yeah. He plays quickly regardless whether he's winning or even when he's losing. I, I, when I'm losing, I tend to stop. And for players, when they're winning as well, they want to be precise. And I think right. this is one of Jan's biggest strengths. And like all strengths, it can sometimes be his biggest his weakness. weakness as well, uh, where we see sometimes this rash, quick play that messes up an advantage. And I wonder if that move 8-6, allowing this entire tactics, these sequence oh, of moves, I think it was blitz out on the board. Uh, it wasn't a position that Jan wanted. 
Mm. But again, just one of those moments where he doesn't take a pause, doesn't slow down, and ends up in this. And when you're playing a rapid game and your opponent plays a move, sacrifices, gets up like we saw Sam Sevian do, mm. you know you're in big trouble. Exactly. Peter, jump in, because you've been a teammate of Jan. You know his speed, regardless of whether he's winning or losing. I wanted to say strength that... Strength and weakness. Honestly, uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek, but not very much. I wanted to say that this is not actually very fast for him. <laughs> because he is down to about 15 minutes from 25 and uh, this is not how he plays when he's playing really, really fast because we've seen him complete games, full games of chess, not just prep, full games of chess with thinking involved, almost with more time than he began with. So this has actually <laughs> featured, featured th some thinking by him, which I think is not, not the greatest sign because mm -hmm. I think this just doesn't pass the sniff test. You should no. not be going for this. No, it's clear. Uh, and uh, we, I'm, I'm very shocked that he allowed this, this combination. We haven't even seen all of the games because we've been rooted by uh, this one, by MBL, and by Fabi. So let's just jump to Ray Robson and uh, Jeffrey Zhang's game because sure. finally we've got something that's oh. well-prepared, quiet, classic. Uh, yeah. Peter, take it away. Well, this is what you are worried about when you see players aiming for, for Berlins and Petrovs. This is, uh, sorry, this is exactly the kind of a position which uh, is very, very topical uh, and not very exciting to... Uh, Comment. <laughs> to, to, because you have to really drill down to d discuss exactly why the small differences in, in peace activity matter. Because this is a, this is a Petrov which... I personally, I think it's probably not very correct, but I, I call these Bishop of Life uh, Five Lines the Chinese Petrov because I think a lot of the young Chinese players at some point switched to playing almost exclusively that against 1e4 mm -hmm. with great success. And by great success, I mean they draw everything. They every, draw everything. Draw every, so you don't win very many with black, although you do occasionally when people overpress, but, mm. uh, but you are incredibly solid. And uh, you, you get these types of uh, very slow moving uh, games where the structure is entirely symmetrical there is not going to be uh, very many weaknesses to talk of. But to begin with, white has the more active pieces, white has slightly more space, and black does need to be uh, careful not to, uh, not to uh, allow something, something dangerous to happen. But eventually pieces start coming off, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, mm -hmm. Trades are happening, and this doesn't look like it's very much for white, honestly. It looks like black is maybe one move away from playing f6, and then finally being able to start trading things along the e-file, which mm. is sort of the dream in this, uh, in this line in general. Trench warfare, but that's not happening, Tanya, in the Nepo game, we think. Uh, it's about to finish really yeah, soon. Yeah, I mean, uh, it really feels like uh, Sam may be the first uh, to win this game because now... Too late for Nepo to think? Right? I mean, he looks what, look what he's facing. And I mean, Rookie one, as you called it out, uh, yeah. joins the party. Exactly. The rook on f7, you don't need to rush with it, yes, to pick it up. No. Uh, again, uh, a rook lift, rook e4, rook over, and as Peter was mentioning, maybe, although that's looking at things from afar, maybe uh, knight e7 was Jan's go-to defense until you see this, and it's really not... I don't know if it was his go-to defense. I just think he missed this entire bishop h6 and everything to follow because it's not really something that you want to allow on the board even if you see it through. Even if you come to this point of knight e7, it's yeah. not a position that you're aiming for. Except, Tanya, we have in our database, our minds, these familiar patterns. And whenever you're playing against an isolated queen pawn position, you're always looking at these sacrifices, exactly. rook g6 and queen g6. So something that, yeah. something went wrong, uh, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm reluctant to start making excuses on players right. because, you know, in round one. But right. yeah, this is, and I, I just want to make an argument even that, okay, you played h6. You blundered upon. You'll be, you just tell yourself, I will, I will feel a bit silly, but I will just play rook a d8 here. And play. And I will continue. And honestly, the blockade in the center and the rest of our pieces are so healthy that of course, your position, you know, decreased in values because you, you blundered a pawn oh. in front of your king. But the game very much continues, like bishop g5, you play rook g7, and you start aiming for endgames. And away you go. And, and it yeah, is over. Cool. We've got a resignation. Jan throws in the towel. Wow, that happened super fast. 
And we didn't get to it, but there was a game uh, between uh, Liam and Wesley, as you were mentioning at the top of the show. Peter, uh, Wesley is fabulous in these Grand Chess Tour. He's, he's been so incredibly successful. Here he's on the outside looking in. He really needs a result, uh, both in this event as well as the Sinkville Cup. And if you had told me this came out of the Queen's Gambit accepted, I would say, yep, sure did. No, it came out of uh, Vienna. And the players have reached a position where I want to say it's dry, but there's still a lot of fight in the position. And after the move knight f3, Wesley is saying, wait a He's, minute, you played a little passively. Yeah. And it, also, yes, sir, the, the c file, there are a lot of pieces lined right? up on the c line. The rook on c8, eyeing that bishop and knight in front of the queen. The last move, a5, hints on a further pawn advance Precisely. before Tiny. kicking out this knight. I like black's position here. Exactly. It seems like Liam just allowed Wesley uh, initiative. And that's the thing, too, Peter, about these guys is their ac accuracy is, is stunning. And sometimes, especially when I'm thinking Magnus, uh, his accuracy sometimes just, like, it's, it's astounding. They, you give your opponent an initiative, these guys just run with it. Yeah, and I think Wesley is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. Wesley is, yeah. and this is a story we've, I think we've covered on, uh, on these shows earlier uh, in, in previous years, I want to say, because I haven't really covered the Grantchester this season is that Wesley is a fabulous player, but it feels like uh, he has restricted himself to this type of play where he makes very, very few mistakes. I think he's right. one of the cleanest in terms of, uh, in terms of lack of uh, outright mistakes players right. in the world. Yeah. yeah, and he wins these games where you give him a sniff, and he is just not going to let it go. He, he wins these games where like, you give him a little bit out of the opening, and then you're absolutely in a fight for your life. <laughs> uh, but when he was in, at his absolute best, let's say in like 2015, 16, 17, I want to say, he had that where period. he had this wow. absolutely free-flowing style and yeah. he, showed, uh, he showed much more of an attacking mindset, I think he was even better than now and uh, considering how good he is now, it's, I think, saying something. Yeah. And also something silly I wanted to mention because I'm a very silly person. Yeah. This is probably mathematically the shortest game in terms of names of participants. Right? I don't think you can go f f less than four letters. Yeah, at least so. Yeah, I think that, that's probably the, the, the absolute record. Yeah, right. Speaking of four-letter names, I yeah. believe Giri is in a little bit of a trouble as well. What? And uh, Peter, we what you the... said about Wesley, I think completely agree with that as well. His tenacity is amazing. His tenacity, it? the hardest player to beat on the circuit, but sometimes I think his desire to keep it solid surpasses his desire to win. Mm. Uh, and that could be the reason why we see him as not losing so many games, but also not ending up getting so many points. When we left it, we thought he was in control. Uh, we did see this move, bishop a4. We did not anticipate bishop to b4, but okay, a5, bishop takes a5, rook takes a2, still looking good. Yeah, I think maybe e6 is a mistake, honestly, because e I, I don't know if, if white has, uh, actually white does have a lot here, this is not a shocker to me. I think Anish just missed the move rook a1. I think he thought he's basically breaking through. e7, e8, yeah, re but, resign. Yeah, but now the rooks will be uh, forced, oh. forced to come off. And without that's, the rook on e1, that pawn is not quinning. Oh, that's that is, a complete and, turnaround. Yeah, and, and that, I think, I think if uh, MBL finds rook a1, and I think he will find rook a1 because he doesn't really have very much else, <laughs> right. he, will be, he will be forced, be forced to play to rook a1. Yeah. You, you just save it from here. And maybe, maybe Anish thought knight b1 is very strong, but now with the pin along the back rank, uh, the engine even suggests you can play bishop b3, which is a shocker. But <clears throat> you, you can also just go with the king towards mm. the e8 square or play bishop f6, because with that being along the back rank, right. White's attacking, attacking prospects are severely diminished. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is a huge turnaround from the position here after a5, bishop a5, rook a2, where if White just makes a very natural looking move, d5, d6, stopping d7 is only really possible by giving up a second pawn. And I'll and take yet, that and one yes, too. And yes, Black establishes some kind of a, well, like, you can't call it a blockade, but you've... It's two pawns. Yeah, but you've established some control over the, over, over the things here, but you're still... That's a way of saying you're not going to resign immediately. <laughs> you don't have yes. to resign immediately. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, 
it should be nursed to a victory. But the move E6, Rook A1, Oh my gosh, that's the cold shower, Rook A1. Huge and a bit uncharacteristic. I always feel that Anish is very good at finishing these kind of games off. A move like D6, mm -hmm. uh, and it's such a natural move. It's not even a very hard to find move. I mean, you've got, you've got two options, D6 and E6. Right, and in this particular case, it happens that your bishop, just by circumstance, is uh, covering the promotional square, D8. So you're right, Peter, you play, you play D6, you're forced to play b4, you go bishop takes b4, you go yeah, yada, 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 you get to play yeah. for a, lot, but a little while. You, you know you eventually will win this position exactly. because you are two healthy pawns yeah. up and you, you will need to blunder something very, very dramatic wow. not to win it. Rook a1, e6, big blunder, rook a1, that is... And I think it's on the board. The it Quite is, yeah. the turnaround. And for MVL, what a save. What a save. But I've seen Maxime do these uh, magical things on the board. It was at the Tata Steel Rapid, where he's down a rook against with it. Yeah. And he turns it around and wins the game. And that's not the only rook down game that I've seen Maxime turn around. And I think, Peter, you know the ones that I'm talking about. <laughs> these are the kind of positions where he's so resourceful. But again, I felt like D6, it's... it's it yeah. should not have been that. Uh, it should not have been a miss by Anish. Sorry, we're, we're we're getting so many exciting games, and I really thought that this one was going to be our marquee matchup, the game between Fabi and Ali Reza. And as you said, Peter, I mean, it's all about these attacks. I'm going to play b5. You're going to play f5, g5. Um, I agreed with you, by the way. I like that move, queen e8. Just that Ali Reza took a different approach. Mm -hmm. He put his uh, pawn on f6 first, this prep. And now he's getting ready. I was about to say, he's getting ready for his king side break. He went another way. G5. Jump in, Peter. Yeah, he, he played slightly slower. He played a very similar uh, whoops, approach, but uh, slightly slower. He didn't play queen e8 here uh, in this position. He played f6, Six rook fd1, queen f7. And I think the notable thing here to, uh, to pay attention to is... White sort of declared his intentions on the queen side here. Sure. You, you play before, you play rook b1, you say, I'm going to do something on the queen side. And then Fabi spends the next five moves shuffling mainly in the center <laughs> and on the king side, allowing black to basically achieve pretty much everything, uh, everything you want. And yes, now the pawn is on a5, but black really with the amount of pieces next to the king and very, very importantly, I think, with the queen on the seventh, seventh meaning well. that you, you, you cannot really Sack even even pieces. entertain any thoughts of these of these sacrifices because black always has queen b7 in the end yeah nice uh so fabi after some thought i assume went for a fairly fairly unhappy choice of giving up uh the remaining bishop and playing g3 d4 mm. but the thing is it's still not very clear what he's aiming for the black queen side is extremely solid it's very difficult to open anything up on the queen side and Black is one move away from, from G4 asking, yeah, asking very direct questions. There. <laughs> He's on your doorstep yeah. with the move G5, G4. And I, it's on the board. He did go for it, a very direct move. It's just so much easier to play with Black. And I want to come down to the point that you made earlier, that this feels like more of an Ali Reza position, mm -hmm. where uh, he's it's dynamics and it's just easier to build the attack, while Black's king on the queen side, extremely safe. Agreed. Uh, yeah. yeah, and Black is so solid there. And even if you... It spend a whole tempo playing a move like bishop c8 for whatever reasons you want to play bishop c8. Your king is so safe. And look at the clock, yes. Yeah, let me Two see. and a half minutes done for Fabi in a difficult position to defend. He's trying to open up the position on the queen side, but He's he just, just doesn't. AB. Yeah. Feels like he doesn't have enough resources to be able to do that. Ali Reza, a good seven minutes, so he's got enough time to really find the right way here. Uh, Interesting question, Tanya. I'll just throw that right back at you there. A, B, and he's pausing because I think a lot of people play the move A, B automatically recapturing, but would you have been attracted to undoubling your C pawns with a C7 takes B6? And the reason you say a lot of people are attracted to the A pawn taking it because you get a side pawn to the, towards the center of exactly. the board and you have this idea of moving the king one step ahead to B7 and if required, your rook from D8 can slide over to the A file and defend everything. I think both are extremely tempting option. That's I awesome. really liked uh, Peter's approach of taking it with the C pawn so that your queen is not only an attacker on the king side but also defends Defense. your king. Yeah. Uh, 
I have to say, if I had to make a split second decision, I might have been more tempted to take it with the A pawn. What about you, Yasser? I, split second decision, I'd probably have taken with the C pawn just mm. because I like the defensive uh, possibility. And again, Black's King for me, Peter, is super safe. Mm -hmm. And that open G, half open G file about to be open. I think I'm I think one happy. one reason one reason for taking with the C pawn is also like A B A B. You have opened the A file for right. white, right? So. There are some thoughts, perhaps, of playing something like queen yes. e2, rook a1, you're trying to play queen a6 and creating a mating attack. It's probably not going to be fast enough because things will be happening on the other side of the board, which is right. happening much, much quicker than anything that we can describe here. But there is definitely a temptation to go c takes b. Mm. Uh, but I can understand it. And also, as, as we were discussing, you're... It's so ingrained, I think, in, in, in chess players to capture towards the center, center yeah. that you have to have sort of life-changing reasons <laughs> not to do it. And uh, I think I think this is why he didn't even hesitate for what, for too long. What about you, Peter? Would you have captured it with a C-pawn if you have to take an instinctive decision in this? Honestly, probably not, no. I, I, mm. I saw the engine preferring C takes B6, and it, I was kind of reluctant to even put it on the board, because I, I want things compact. I want I want the proper the proper approach to structural uh, structural things is very, very... Seems Deep like in me, I think. A more human approach to take with the A pawn, but it will be interesting to see if Fabi can create some dynamics with this open A line now. And that queen on F1, it's a retreating move, but watch out because it's aiming at the other side of the board. Queen F1, eyeballing no, A6. While, we, while no. we're still here, there's there's yes. a mas massive issue with this because Black can, to... Black can even throw in bishop C4 here. I'm not a big fan of this queen yeah. F1. I think it's it's Fabi playing on two minutes. It's a very difficult position. He also doesn't really have much time to uh, to delve uh, deeply and to try to find best play. And this this just looks horrible because now you completely abandon any dreams of including your queen in the attack. Exactly. And Black just starts doubling on the G five. I wanted to ask Peter, come on, just double up. Yeah. Rook, no, it's rook, it looks G4. horrible. It looks frankly borderline lost. And wow. also let's point out the basic but important tactic. If white was to recapture on F3 with the queen, Peter, that's also disaster because now the rook jumps on to G3 and you're suddenly skewered on the third rank, right. losing material. Yeah, there goes a knight. Ouch. Mm. Um, okay, with uh, so many things going on, we're just going to jump quickly to the Ray Robson game where we saw nothing was happening for the longest time. But uh, somehow, uh, Ray has managed to sacrifice. <laughs> Ray, by the way, uh, is coming off a mixed year. He won the Czech Masters mm. with some fabulous play. We had a nice little party here to uh, celebrate his victory in St. Louis. But then a little bit disappointing in the US Championship. What's going on, Peter? Well, he is game? trying to, uh, they're both, this is move 20, the, the very, very committal decision was taken in move 26, and they, at that point, were down to, to six minutes. And Ray is sort of correctly appreciating that he is running out of time to do something on the king side. If black is allowed to play rook a8, for instance, then f7, He's f6, super solid. everything will get traded down the one open file on the board and the game will be drawn. So he goes f4 here, luring the queen in and gaining some tempi attacking it, which is honestly an interesting thing to do. And I think it hinges very much on this move queen h6 because other squares honestly look kind of dodgy to me. Uh, but the queen on h6, you can, for instance, continue by playing rook h3. Okay. And it starts looking iffy for black, right? It, you you, you start wondering. Issues. Yeah, you, you start wondering just how safe that queen on h6 <laughs> is. And let's say you make one natural looking move here. I wanted to suggest yeah, it. And you allow rook f1. And suddenly, knight f6 check, check is a threat, knight f4 four. is a threat. And if you play something like queen g5, you lose immediately to rook g3, and your g7 Done. pawn is undef in indefensible. So uh, it's an interesting idea. And the fact that Engine holds this by starting by playing knight c8, I think specifically so that you can play queen g5. And after rook g3, mm. you are no longer g7. losing the g7 pawn because the knight is protecting it. But as you can see, the engine isn't, even doesn't help, hate it all that much. It just says that, yes, black can things under, keep things under control by juggling uh, his pieces very, very accurately. But if you have to start making moves like rook h6 here, and after, let's say, knight g4, I assume the rook has to go to h4. Uh, it doesn't like you. Yeah, <laughs> you no, got you to get no. that feel going. Um, this is not easy. Not Honestly, easy. in practical terms, I very much like this decision of, of playing a 4 because it changes the nat nature of the game uh, very, very dramatically. And uh, suddenly, 
forces, uh, forces Jeffrey to uh, solve concrete decisions instead of just sort of autopiloting. Exactly. Until that moment, I think his play was uh, very easily understood right. and uh, he, he could pilot it quite comfortably. And by Nigi the way, we do had a 94 Nigi played here. Ooh, nice Not trick. a rook h3. Yeah, uh, trying to trying to land this Whoop. very beautiful tactic, but this was this will not be blundered. And in fact, the engine says after queen g5 now, black is doing quite well because you shouldn't have played knight g4. Yeah, knight g4 is not uh, is not the prescribed solution here. Even though it still looks kind of scary after rook g3, like you have to be convinced you are not getting mated after something like knight h6 check or knight gf6 check here. Yeah, and you 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 could get lost in in a Alice in Wonderland here because at first blush you're seeing all of these mm -hmm. knight jumps and you're kind of convincing yourself like I've got Absolutely. something. I will, I would be very very, very scared here with mm. black. Right. Uh, but, and in particular, they will be playing this extremely complicated position on very, very low times. So, right. Uh, this one is definitely uh, the, the one to keep an eye on because it could explode at any moment. There are certain players, by the way, I, if you're playing against a Jeffrey Zhang and you play the move F2, F4, you're trying to get Jeffrey out of his comfort zone. If Jeffrey gets into that place where he, he's going to be unaffected, you're not, you're not going to beat him. Hmm. So you want to make something double-edged and risky. And let's face it, Ray Ray's a bit of a gambler. He's, he's got that streak in him to, to go for this pawn sacrifice. And very often in these time controls, gambles like these seem to work out even better. In the rapid In blitz. the rapid, because yeah. you don't have that much time to counter it. And the point that Peter was making, I think it's really important that you just change the dynamics of the position. The position has been solid. Uh, there's an autopilot mode in which okay. the players are playing, but suddenly it's about calculation. It's about being more concrete. And uh, we see rook g3 was on the board with the big idea of the yeah. knight jumping. The queen the moves queen out of the H4. way to h4. And, and look, and now, look. And now he's gone. He's yeah, gone. One mistake and he's gone. And it's, I think it's findable as well because, yes, you don't really like trading attacking pieces, but it's a three-move calculation which is really not that difficult. What he missed, I'm is sure. Is that a queen trap? Yeah. Yes. Oof. Oh, what he missed, nasty. I'm sure, is this move rook g4. And I think you miss it not because it's difficult, but because I think... Your from brain refuses to start calculating from a trade. Right. You're worried about getting mated here. You're not worried about trapping, these, your, the, queen. The, trapping your queen and things. Yeah. So you start by calculating all of those knight h6, knight gf6 checks here, and you do need your rook on h6 to cover those squares. And you think, if my opponent has to start trading here, I'm okay. Yeah. Of course. And you kind of ignore those variations. But yeah, rook e6, there is no choice oh. you have to take with the knight. Knight h6 check, it doesn't really matter where the king goes, rook right. g4 next move. And you don't even get a rook and a knight for it. You just get a yeah. It, you you Two resign pieces here. or something. You but resign. the crazy part too is with the queen on h4, Tanya. You have it in the back of your mind. You're thinking, hey, I've got e1 covered. When the rook was on e1, there was a pair of rooks on the board. So you really do close your mind, and you're not thinking of. You're only thinking about safety of your king, not the safety yeah, I, of your I think, queen. I, I think this is how this mistakes happen. Mistake exactly. Happens, yeah. Wow. It's also adapting yourself psychologically from a very strategic a Berlin fight going into this very concrete direct play, which isn't, uh, isn't the easiest thing to no, do. And even though there were defenses, we saw an immediate collapse with Queen H4. And this is a big moment now. What I do know about Ray Robson is yes. that he is a bit of a tactical genius. Yes. He, he finds these ideas. Uh, I've seen him when it comes and to these attacking uh, positions. He it. didn't, uh, just as a commentator, uh, Gus. There you have it. He sh you were about to say one of the great Puzzle Rush players. Exactly. And he's he's got records in Puzzle Rush. So if he if you had told him... But look at the clock. I think that was a factor. He's uh, down to about a minute and finding this Rook G4. I think Rook G4, once you show it, Peter, you can't unsee it. Yeah, but yeah. to see it from afar isn't that easy. Wow. And uh, now has, has it turned completely in Jeffrey's favor? No, it's, it's a pretty balanced position, actually. Still, because, even... yeah, White still has a lot of activity on the king side. You still have to play very precisely. And the okay. engine currently is suggesting you go, go queen back. e7, and you cannot really play rook f6 because it gets stuck there. But you can just give this exchange up That's two to get rid of uh, that very, very dangerous knight on e5. And this one is coming to e4 later. This, if you pick a side here, I guess you pick black, but it's still pretty balanced. But we're being told that Fabi is in a lot of trouble. Yes, in our, he is. 
in yes, our game of the day, and yeah, it Ooh, looks. Oh, there's a when, mate in one being threatened in that last position that we, we have. Looked at, we saw Tanya with Queen F1, and we looked at takes, takes. He did play Bishop C4, by mm -hmm. the way. Did uh, uh, Ali Reza, and after doubling on the G file, well, here it comes. Rook takes F3. Uh, Bang. Which was a threat in any case. And uh, if we just do a quick action replay of the move king to h2 there, which was played against the idea of a rook takes knight, but it happened anyway because the other rook jumps into the attack here, takes nice. the knight, h3 is defended, but not anymore is. And queen f1, you don't even have the square for the queen to come into defense. No, we already uh, gave the queen the boot. Uh, a few moves back. Is this? Yeah, this is, is minus six. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, and the, the, the move that probably ends the game the fastest is the move rook h3, just creating this very, very strong idea of a four of three. By the way, I he think picks it's, the queen. Uh, you, we, we can see that the players mm -hmm. just blitzed out their last few moves there, but it looks like the queen got hacked off the board. Yeah. Alireza instead pick, goes for a very, very understandable choice as well. Just it goes rook f1 check, and then a four of three in the end there. Uh, attacking the rook on h2. If you gave white one tempo to stop to stop a four of three, maybe you could have had a game. But uh, yeah, this is going to be results coming in. By the way, we are just being told uh, Wesley lost the game at a moment when we thought Wesley was getting yeah. a bit of the upper hand. We'll have to revisit that one, but we're going to stay with Fabi and Ali Reza for now because we've got two rooks versus the queen in uh, this uh, game and. Peter? Many reasons to stay on to this one. Wow. An exciting position, a great game by Ali Reza. And Ali Reza was your pick and Fabi was mine. You're doing well on that one. Well, Tanya, oh. you know, you're going to get a participation trophy. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, our, board is, our board is somewhat behind the screen. Yes. But yeah, you can see on the screen, Black has this um, extremely safe king, uh, which is the one thing you have to pay attention to when you're playing this queen against two rooks positions. And By the way, did have... I want to tell you guys that you should play A takes B6 mm -hmm. and <laughs> have a very safe king position? How many pawns is that? Not enough. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Not enough? For, I mean, this is... <laughs> This is four pawns, but we're also getting an update that Nastya, Anastasia, our commentator in on the ground, yes, he also picked Fabi to win this one, but it doesn't look like it's going to be a great start, Nastya, for you and I, I and know. Fabi. <laughs> Correct. Uh, but how easy is this as a conversion? Queen versus two rooks? It's, it's and pretty easy. The, the difference are just four extra many, yeah. pawns. Yeah. The difference in king safety is just such that uh, once you start pushing something, things just collapse. And yeah, Lereza having done the, the needful things on in the center and on the queen side, exactly. securing the king, making sure there are no checks. He is now yeah. just threatening to play h4, h3, and so on. And there's just no stopping it because... Do you want to go b5, c4 as well? No, no, no. We, we yes. Don't. You we want, want everything. You want yes. all of it. Yes, yeah, there's the b5 a... and c4 check inclusive with the... Queen d1 check also picks up the last remaining oh, point. Oh. Oh. He didn't see it, but it's not, it's not required. It's not really a miss. Yeah, h3 calling, is coming in next. I don't know. Pawn grubbers. Uh, calling this a mistake is too but harsh. You harsh. grab a pawn to push a pawn, and that's what Ali Reza is doing now. And the rooks are tied down to defend each other. You can't even get to the h file. No. Yeah. And that's it. He wants to make a move, but Fabiano resigns. He knows there's nothing else to play for. Ali Reza takes a big win, yes. By the way, I mean, we're seeing a lot of decisive games. And what happened between Anish and MVL? Because Anish was winning and yeah. then it was and then not anymore, and then yeah. Rook A1 happened, Peter. Yeah, I think I think the, the, the whole game was decided on that choice between E6 and D6. Had he played D6, I think he would have won. But as it happened, MVL escapes, giving us our first draw of the tournament. One of the crazy games uh, of, if you had told me when we started our show and we had gotten into the show that the draw was between Anish in MDL when we knew it was over. <laughs> it's like, no, no, we, what? And Maxime, he's got to feel the relief right now. It was a game that he got stuck in the start, but then uh, managed to find the resources. There's one more game remaining. And it is between Ray Robson and Jeffrey Zhang, a very tensed position. And what's the clock situation? The player's down to under a minute. That is uh, extra in exchange here for Ray. But somehow when, um, Jeffrey gave up his exchange. He didn't get the second pawn, Peter. Mm, yeah, if we just briefly return to the position we were discussing earlier, yes. and, and then we'll just watch what happens, because that was an kind of important turning point. 
I was suggesting uh, rook takes e5 needed to be played, it wasn't. So they're basically playing this, the version of the position we were discussing, but with white having one. An extra pawn. An extra pawn. Okay. So let's just. Uh, 25 Catch seconds for white and it's so many pieces on the board and with the knights in the active position that they are it's so easy to miss a knight jump in these kind of positions exactly. and walk into a fork but as you said it is an extra exchange but I really like black's knights on the center of the board it feels like it should be enough compensation weirdly it feels still like a three result game even though <laughs> white is clearly much much better and it shouldn't be but it feels that with that knight only four which cannot be challenged by any of the white pawns uh, and as little time as they do have, it really does feel like it, it's possible to lose this with white. Maybe not with the queens off, though. And the queen trade has just been offered by, by, by Jeffrey. Jeffrey. And wow, well, 10 okay. seconds for Ray Robson. He needs to take a decision. Do you keep the queens on the board trying to create some play, or do you go into Three, an endgame? He decides to go for it. Uh, Ray, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with Ray's play, uh, yeah, try try him as a teammate because he gets into time trouble and boy, he's used to going down. I have seen him make a move with a single second on his clock here in St. Louis uh, on multiple occasions, actually. A remarkable. And the current position, how is it assessed? How do you assess it? How does the computer assess it, Peter? Well, it's still better, of course, due to the fact that he has more rooks. But I think I think it's the position board, that you can way. definitely there you can go. definitely defend because uh, that knight on e4 is very very strong. One thing I probably wouldn't play here is f6 f5 because mm. I think that gives white the e5 square for the knight. I think giving white knight d3 knight d5 is unnecessary. It doesn't spoil very many things, but I would prefer to maybe not commit to it and okay. just yet. Peter, you he said what? <laughs> Commentator's curse on, <laughs> on, on the cue. board. <laughs> but Sorry, I was going you. to say that, you know, you're talking about these extra rooks. When you've got the extra rooks on the board, you want to open up lines. Does white have to start aiming for advancing and pushing some pawns on the queen side to try to get more activity, more lines for the rook? Absolutely. Yeah, you do need to you do need to open some some files uh, some files for the rooks, uh, either with the C4 break or maybe even with the G4 break, now that there is uh, a pawn on a five for, for us to try and uh, yeah, we undermine. did. But we as did. you see, black immediately stops this by playing h5. And Ray goes h4, which does away with any breaks on the king side, I guess. So if he wants to win this game now, he will have to open up the queen side at some point. Well, again, uh, having secured or locked down, if you will, both the center and the king side uh, with this move uh, h5, it, it comes back to what you're saying, Tanya. You're going to have to play for c3, c4 yeah. and uh, to open up the lines for the rooks. Otherwise, your rooks are stuck. Or defend the c-pawn and go a4, b4, b5. It, it kind of comes to this idea of trying to open up, get as many files for the rook as possible. Otherwise, you're just not playing for a win. The knights are jumping. Does he want to get the other knight to g4? Is this some kind of a yes. maneuver where you defend the e5 square? the penetration with the white's knight, but you're also eyeing that g4 square for your own knight. I love the knight on g4. I think the knight on g4 is not only, as you said, defending e5, but it's intrusive. The white king just kind of feels like, oh, wait a minute. It's heading there, yes. And it's coming. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Jeffrey is one of those players uh, he has a way of moving that lulls you to sleep. He, he, it, it feels like he's not doing anything, and his hands kind of make this languishing kind of moves. And then suddenly you realize you've got no time on your clock. <laughs> and uh, Look at those three knights on the fourth rank. Uh, it's impressive. quite a picture that Jeffrey has created with his hand movement, as you're pointing out. Exactly. Uh, and yes, white has the extra exchange, but I'm starting to like Black's position, the extra minutes on the clock. The last move, rook h7, was a signal that maybe Jeffrey was ready to play g5 and maybe mm. h4. And Ray said, I'm not going to give you that. I went, he went rook h1, a kind of a defensive move, but uh, it, it's still about the queen side. And uh, can he play c3, c4 one day? He's got to do that. He has to find a way to advance the pawns on the queen side, create some lines for the rook. But this is prediction time. Does this end in a decisive result, or are we going to have a draw here? Just a draw. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tanya. But yeah, I do feel that uh, both players are going to play safely, accurately, and 
uh, I don't see Ray as, you know, he pushed his luck with F4. And he was almost, almost rewarded a success. But uh, no, I think he's kind of happy with the outcome. It was a good fight. And it's a good thing that right now he's not aware of the fact that he missed trapping his opponent's queen. Yes. yes. Which would have, of course, been a completely different game. Really nice idea pointed out by Peter with the rook to g4, uh, some moves back. But this is a completely different position now. And the last few moves, it feels like black has made all the progress, mm -hmm. while white still hasn't managed to find the squares for the rooks. And again, uh, if w w our understanding is correct that we're going to be playing for c4 one day and breaking on the queen side, well, no progress has been made in that direction. By the way, Peter, is that something that has plagued you in your career? It certainly has plagued me. I've made a move only to become aware of the fact after I've made the move that I've missed a golden opportunity and I kicked myself for missing yeah. You're, you're much better off never realizing it until the, game is, the game is finished. Yeah, right. and uh, the, those are the lucky ones where, you, where you, you make a mistake and then people will tell you after the game and you will feel completely rotten, but yes. it's much, much better than actually figuring it out for yourself and still having <laughs> to continue the game because uh, you, you do want to... Uh, <laughs> The self-loathing was strong with him that day, as the quote goes. Yeah, right. and, uh, <laughs> that is a feeling I'm very, very well acquainted with. Black if could go for the G5 break right now, I guess, but I think it's probably playing to lose more than playing to win. I don't know if Jeffrey feels that he is sort of confident to uh, start taking risks against 13 mm -hmm. seconds on, uh, on Ray's clock here. Tanya, mm -hmm. I've got to ask you the same question. Do you are you affected? Does it impact your mindset when you make a move? And then you're very happy with the move you made and suddenly this awareness comes over that you missed a winning moment. A hundred percent. I think every chess player has been through that. And uh, I, I completely agree that it's better to not know. No. <laughs> if you yeah. don't have any idea during the game, you know, you can keep your mind, be present in the moment, but it's right. so hard to let go of uh, what has just happened or what you've just missed. And in a format like this, where you've got another game coming up, it's probably even better to not know after the game. Right. So that you don't think about it. Uh, the moves that we're seeing been been played over the last uh, last couple of moves, mm -hmm. there are no breaks possible anymore on the, yeah, I was about to on say, the queen side. Once uh, Jeffrey played the move a4, which was met, by the way, by the move a3, which means that you're not playing b3, you're not going to get c4. There's no way this exchange is going yeah. to be impactful, and I think black has secured equality now. To me, well, Yasa, yeah, the move yes. A3 feels like a silent draw offer. He's saying, I'm on the defense now. I don't have... I kind of feel that. Yeah, I get that. And by the way, I love what Jeffrey has done. He's played Rook A8, Rook A5, and he's going to play Rook B5. And by the way, that's a, that's a tender pawn on B2. It's a soft pawn. Yeah, which requires this ugly defense. And at what point, Peter, do you start saying... Well, if you're going to give me the advantage, <laughs> I'm going to no, play. Honestly, once a four, once the sequence where black played a four and that was met by a three happened, I think yes. only black really can play for a win anymore because right. white, white is completely stuck there. There will never be anything that you can do really to improve your position unless black that does something dramatically stupid. And for black, you can play rook b3 and then try to open something up on the queen side. You can maybe try preparing the c5 break, although that is very double-edged. If you do play c5, and it doesn't come off for you immediately, that you might actually feel signal. feel bad. Yeah, yeah, signal once again that White has some winning chances. But generally, I think uh, Jeffrey will feel like he's definitely the side playing for a win here. Exactly. Yeah. By the way, knight takes e4 is a move I would embrace as black. d5 takes e4, and I'm going to reroute my knight to the d5 square. That's why we saw knight f3 by Ray. And, Okay. Are we going to see a repetition at this point? Because it also feels like black has done maximum out of the position that you can hope for. Your knights are beautifully placed in the center, the rook is on the b-file, but what's next? Mm -hmm. to, the only break that comes to mind is the one that you pointed out with c5, but that's a double-edged sword. And uh, you create open lines and a d5 weakness in that case. By the way, knight e1, I kind of like what mm -hmm. Ray did. Somehow this rook came all the way back and the knight on d3, is well placed. It it kind of releases our rooks for to do a what exactly? task. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you got me on that one. But the fact that the rook 
which was maxims, uh, max, maximized on mm. B3, has gone all the way back to A8 as an indication that a draw is getting increasingly more likely, Peter. Yeah. On the other hand, it feels like Black is really risking nothing at all in the 40-second it's now down to 20, but there was at some point maybe even a 50 second difference on the clock. Mm -hmm. Will perhaps work as a bit of an incentive for, for Jeffrey to continue, even though you're probably continuing by just shuffling and not really committing to, uh, to anything. The only thing to commit to would be something like B65, but I don't know if that does anything at all. Yeah. And with this rook moving from one side of the board to the other, uh, uh, Jeffrey's always threatening this move G5. Yes. But it has to be timed correctly. Mm -hmm. Because you're doing white a, a solid favor of opening up the H file, potentially. And yeah. I think the move rook g8 and a8 is a silent draw for yeah. with the move knight e1. But of course, Ray says, I'll play on. <laughs> knight yeah. c5, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a uh, minute. b5 played, so he defends the b pawn by moving it forward, also defending the a pawn. Rook yeah, but a. now there really aren't any rook breaks eight. left. Knight c5 and b5, and then a white goes back with the knight. And the whole point is that black doesn't have any breaks as well on the queen side anymore. Right. I was about to say, the move knight c5 did offer the potential for a knight trade there. Knight takes c5 and rook to a5. I'm a pawn grubber. I at least uh, thought about the question. 100%, but then you give this open E line for the white's rook to come into play, and right. you can grab a pawn, but what white really wants is rook activity. That That's knight right. on E4 is so much worth a pawn, more than a pawn. <laughs> oh, I forget who I'm with right now. <laughs> Need to watch my words. <laughs> uh, it's worth so much more than a pawn. Boy, I don't know. I, that's uh, maybe I should say in, what it depends which pawn really we're talking okay. about. Right. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna rephrase myself be, be, here. Be, give me a little solace <laughs> there. Okay, now, uh, Peter. I'm I'm just seeing the pay, the players kind of shuffling. They've they've kind of checked each other's uh, resumes out here pretty yeah. solidly. It, it feels like. Uh, any break here would be severely detrimental to the side yeah. making the break, apart from maybe g5. But now that the pawn on c6 is somewhat vulnerable, I think it's much harder for black to abandon the, uh, the c8 square for, for the rook. Yeah, it feels like we are now perhaps repeating. Exactly. Uh, so far, Tanya, the times have not been too much of a factor. I think Ray got under 10 seconds at one particular moment, but they're keeping a brisk pace, I'd say. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I really feel that draw would be sort of a fair outcome of this endgame play that we've been seeing by these players. Yeah. It is difficult to imagine a break. And as we mentioned earlier, Jeffrey's just maximized everything in the position. The only thing that white shouldn't do is trade on e4. <laughs> right. As you pointed out, then black just takes with a deep one and vacates that square for the knight to jump into. Exactly. So uh, these rooks are. Yeah, it felt like for a, a moment ago there was an actual repetition on offer with right. the knight before. Perhaps uh, Ray could have even claimed right. a threefold, and he goes knight c5 instead, preserving the, the illusion that something might still happen in this game, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure I believe that. The more they play, the more I feel we're going to see g5 on the board at some point. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, if there was a time for g5, I would have said... Five seconds, er, he needs to make ooh. a move. Three? Oof. And rook h1 again. Panicky. Yeah. A little panicky. And honestly, it's, it's sort of very inviting now against, against 12 seconds because there, there, might right. be some, there might be some uncomfortable decisions to be made. You, you, you start encouraging, your, if, if you're going to encourage your opponent too much and allow them to play g5, well, one, no. Doesn't do it. No. <coughs> Uh, I think it wasn't working for a very precise, specific reason, and I think I <coughs> Jeffrey. Did. I think if you play g5, takes takes knight d7. Check was very annoying. That mm. was the one. Yeah, okay. and then if the king goes to e6, you have rook takes e4, and that position might end up being not that great for for black. Gotcha. That was just on my analysis board, everybody. I'm going to uh, refresh my board and come back to the live position. And it feels like that could be a bit of a repetition with rook h1 now. We've seen back. it a few times, yeah. What are the players even playing for right now? It's so hard to tell because they're not repeating the moves. They are shuffling around. Oh, this, is, this is an interesting point, by the way. 92 check has been played, as we can see on the screen, not on the live board. Right. And 
if, if the king goes forward, g5 check might be very strong. And if king g2, even here, I thought g5 may have been playable, but... King g2, g5. He sharks yeah. from it, yeah, and goes back to c4. And again, uh, that sudden attack on the g3 pawn does look inviting. But I think you said it very well, Peter, that the player who... Um, it's a blockade. The, the, the player who lifts the blockade, who who makes the uh, the break. Yeah, it's the one in the receiving end. Yeah, he ends up uh, getting injured by making the break. So they're just keeping, they're keeping the status quo here with knight f4 and king f3, oh, rook h3. Oof, that's not that a square. That is not a square, I, yeah. would, have, I would have guessed. It's rook h3. Oh. Yeah, what is it doing there? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. That... Maybe that's the ultimate troll, that I can put my rook on h3 and you still can't do anything. You start yeah. to think about knight b2 and knight takes c3 because it's sort of like... Oh, so he wants, the, he wants the king on... He wanted the king on c1, maybe. So he, he protected the g3 spawn with the rook. In order and he to wanted go. to start running with the king towards c1, c2. But, but I think then king that, e1, knight f3 is there. Yeah, yeah, it didn't quite work out for him, yeah. One, another seemingly draw offer is on the board now. Once again. Yeah, and rook h3 is... Comes back. I think yeah. the, the ultimate mysterious rook move. <laughs> is very rook much in contention H3. for one of the more mysterious rook moves in, in chess history. Right. And again, I, 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 it always tickles my funny bone whenever I think about this. I make a move like rook h3, and I explain to Bent Larson that the idea was to be able to play king to f1 to e1 to c1. I'm making this compelling argument. He looks at me and he says, yeah, sir? Nobody believes you. <laughs> <laughs> Just immediately shuts me down. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody believes you. <laughs> I'm also not believing in Black's chances currently. Right. It looks really nice, and well, uh, he's not a repetition. He might have been on time, though, because... Yeah, he's playing Ray, on Ray keeps on leaving himself like three, two seconds. Yeah. Uh, habitually. By the way, a big shout-out to both. Lajos Portish and uh, Bent Larson. Bent no longer with us, but Lajos still happily kicking in Budapest as those two uh, great legends uh, join in the World Chess Hall of Fame uh, being inducted last night. Mm. Very nice occasion, uh, uh, along with Susan Polgar, our bell ringer of the, yes. of the round. Absolutely, and we're seeing uh, the a shuffle repetition. around to continue. And this might just be the end of it now. Well, I think the players actually have to say, with my move, oh, he's, 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 eight, I am he's claiming, claiming, I he's claiming yeah. a draw. He's claiming. Uh, he's saying, and it's a, it's a kind of a risky claim because I don't think you can actually keep track of how many times or not. <laughs> but yeah, but it kind of gives them the chance to maybe take a breather. And... Yeah, you get your opponent a minute. Mm. Big deal. I mean, yeah, that's exactly. the penalty if but your claim is disallowed. The amount of times you've seen this position feels like a, like a reasonable guess. It's yeah. got a good shot and oh. that's it. Whoa. Handshakes. He got it right. You got yeah. it right. Very impressed, honestly, because I don't think I would have been able to confidently state that I've seen this three times before. Me either. Uh, not with confidence, but that does but sum up uh, two draws, three decisive games, and a couple of these decisive games I did not expect. Could you t show me where Wesley and yeah. Liam, we that, didn't get a uh, chance to see that. What happened? Yeah, that went down, down, downhill very, very quickly for, for Wesley. We left it not here exactly, we but We just saw the move A5. Here. We saw the move yeah, A5 and somewhere we thought, here. okay, you know, Wesley is getting something. Yeah, and he played before and then took with the bishop, which I think is logical. I don't think he absolutely needed already to commit to before, but it's a logical decision, 95. Uh, somewhere here, I thought this is a very balanced position, and Black should maybe even be slightly better with the knight coming to d6. But okay. takes takes knight d2, and huh? I assume something is wrong with the move move knight d6, which I think I would have made without thinking even. Right. But it's not suggested by the engine either, and Wesley played queen b6. The knight came back to f3, which is arguably the maybe a draw offer. Yeah. Draw offer. Ah, and then he did play knight d6. Next move, knight d6, knight e4. Yeah, I think maybe he went for a little bit too much. I think if the knights come off here, it should be very, very close to equality. But okay. instead, he played queen g6, allowed knight c5, knight d7. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, I'm beginning to feel a little bit... Uh, yeah. Whoops. Uh, 
how do I get, how did I get, how did I get here? And pitch, how do I pitch your menu? There yeah. you go. Bravo. Hang on. Yeah. We will, we will get to where we need to get to eventually. Hey, it's day one. We're working out all the kinks. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then somehow the Jeep on just, just ran right. from, from here. And but with, here are our standings. Yes, uh, yes. Tanya. What a round one. We've had three decisive games, two draws, and this is where we stand. Ali Reza with a fantastic win over Fabiano Caruana. He did it with the black pieces. Yes, uh, he did. With two points uh, for a win, along with Liam and Sam Savian. We had two draws, which put Maxime, Anish, Jeffrey and Ray Robson with one point. And at the bottom of the board, after round one, the first round loss, Fabi, Yan and Wesley. Wow, three big heavy hitters there. At the bottom of the table goes to show you how strong is our event. As we get ready for a break, we uh, check in with our friends at Q Boutique and see what they have. Well, this is St. Louis Chess Club. It's a puffy vest. Gear up in the newest apparel from the St. Louis Chess Club with the officially branded puffy vest. Features the Chess Club signature logo across the left breast pocket, 100% polyester. Stay warm, in style, available at qboutiquestl.com. And as we go on our break, Anastasia caught up with Jeffrey Zhang. Hope you like her interview. Uh, to start. So welcome to Grand Chess Tour, Jeffrey. It's not your first tournament uh, in Grand Chess Tour that you are participating. You were here last year. Uh, do you think somehow it helps you, the fact that you have played this already and you feel more confident this year? Oh, for sure, because it's very intimidating playing with these guys. So to get that experience makes it um, more comfortable and I think this is my third time, so hopefully third time's the charm. Yeah, you just actually come in from Grand Swiss uh, tournament, which was in Isle of Man, and um, how can you assess your participation there? Uh, how was the tournament for you? It was a very nice uh, venue, but unfortunately my play was not so nice. Um, but it's still a very good experience. What did go wrong? <laughs> Uh, I think at the beginning I made a few too many draws and then started to become a bit frustrating um, and then sort of took too many risks later on. Um, are you a professional chess player, right? I mean, these days. And um, can you tell us a little bit how the life of a professional chess player looks like? What is your routine? What are you doing every day? How many hours per day do you prepare for the games? Yeah, so I think on... On average, it's about four to six hours for me. Uh, that's how much I work. And for this event, I mainly did some general preparation. So got some some of the openings that I plan to play in order and some middle games and end games as well. Yeah, but in general, I mean, you wake up uh, and you start uh, studying chess immediately, or let's say, what, what is the best uh, schedule you can have as a professional player? Uh, do you work with a coach? Uh, no coach at the moment, but yeah, okay, I guess I wake up and usually I do some physical exercise first in the morning just to wake up a bit. And then, then I get into some chess and it's sort of, uh, you know, work on chess, take a break and maybe eat something, then exercise some more and then go back to chess. Yeah. Uh, what are your other interests, interests, hobbies? I'm a big sports fan, so I play a lot of sports. I watch a lot of sports. What are your short term and the long term goals uh, in your chess career? Uh, short term, probably returning to 2700 would be my first step. Um, right now I dropped quite a bit, so just to get back on track there and long term, I think we'll see. Right now I'm just playing uh, to enjoy and hopefully if I can climb the ranks, that'd be nice. Yeah, and uh, actually I noticed in the video you sent us uh, before the chess tournament, I've noticed uh, lots of books on the background. <laughs> and I was wondering if you have read all of them or some of them and what, what is your favorite? Yeah, I can't say that that was my uh, room. I was actually filming it uh, in my parents' room. So my dad is a very big reader. I also have a big bookshelf, but I don't read quite as many books. I would say um, one of my favorite books that I read, though, is the is a classic uh, Animal Farm. So this is one of my favorites. Um, um, who are some of your chess idols and uh, how they influenced your chess career and your approach to the game? 
Um, I have a lot of chess idols. I think an underrated one for me, like one that doesn't get um, said enough, I think, is Vladimir Kramnik. I really enjoyed his his games. Um, when I was just before Grandmaster, I studied a lot of games, and that catapulted me from, let's say, 2450 to 2650. So I would definitely mention him as one of the players that uh, made an impact. Yeah, you also you are so lucky to work uh, personally with uh, Gary Kasparov, the world champion. You attended this uh, school for young talents and uh, in St. Louis Club. It was also organized here. Um, so, what was um, this, this unique experience you had, um, you know, working with Gary? Yeah, it was truly really amazing just to get a chance to um, be around him in person. And yeah, we worked many years. I think maybe six or seven years together. Um, I could show him my games and he would comment on them. Yeah, it was really, really nice and I think a lot of players uh, benefited greatly from that experience. Thank you so much and all the best of luck for you in the tournament. Thank you. The 2023 Grand Chess Tour reaches its epic conclusion with its fifth world-class event, the 2023 Sinkfield Cup. It's back to classical chess with front runners settling in for the final push to the finish line. However, two of America's finest stand in their way. Joining the fray is wild cards who will try to cash in on the opportunity while making things as difficult as possible for hopeful tour players. Who can win the illustrious cup? And will it be enough for them to emerge as the 2023 Grand Chess Tour champion? Follow the St. Louis Chess Club's Twitch and YouTube channels to tune into live coverage of the 2023 Sinkfield Cup, November 21st to December 1st to find out. Hello, I'm Women's Grandmaster Brigham Tokharjanova. I will be creating content for Grand Chess Tour. Follow us on social media and catch more behind the scenes content. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. championships, as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. The World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. Enjoy a shopping experience like no other. Make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org education. Hello, I am... Welcome back everyone. Round two of game one is about to start and what a start we've had. Three Indeed. decisive games, fireworks on the board and this is where we stand going into game two. Ali Reza, Liam, Sam Savian scoring a first round victory, convincing games throughout. Yes. Maxime, Anish, Jeffrey and Ray Robson, their games ended in a draw while Fabi, Jan and Wesley are looking to score their first points. Heavy hitters at the bottom there but tell us about the pairings for this round too. 
and we will see the action that's about to come up as Wesley So pay, plays against Sam Sevian. Wesley had a good game in game one, but it all ended very abruptly from him. He lost. He's got to bring that form back. Yan Napamnashi plays Anish Kiri. Right. Uh, it's Jeffrey Zhang against Ali Reza Furusha. Ali Reza looks like he's really in form and in shape. Uh, Robson against Liam and Maxime Vachier Le Graf plays Fabiano Caruana. Action has started. Exactly. And Peter, uh, we're actually coming in a little bit late. I see a dozen moves in the game between MVL and Fabi, but what caught your attention? There's a, a bunch of open games, uh, the E4, E5 games on, uh, on the boards there, which I think is always a welcome sign because those tend to be uh, quite, uh, quite fighting. And another are goes in similar to that game between uh, 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 Liam and, and Wesley in round one in the game between uh, Jeffrey Shong and uh, Ali Reza. Uh, a, 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 a sort of quiet looking Italian there between, in a game between Robson and uh, uh, Liam. Uh, an interesting and very fast paced in terms of moves made by, mm -hmm. by minutes spent <laughs> game between uh, Jan Nepomniche and Anish Giri. And uh, in, in Wesley against uh, Sam Sevian, arguably maybe the sharpest position potentially. Uh, we see so far because these lines where white plays uh, bishop g5 early, uh, they tend to, they t they tend to be. How do I how do I always get that? What did you? I did something very stupid. We, and, yeah. We've got five <laughs> very exciting matchups, and before we deep dive into it, yes, I want to ask you which one stands out to you. Which one? Uh, is the... I I thought the the game between MVL and Fabi was fascinating because of this particular move order. Oh, so we get this. I mean, come on, the Rui Lopez. It's the single most oldest, most uh, I, what are you talking about? I haven't seen this position before ever. Uh, ever. H2, <laughs> H3. And suddenly, you know, you get bishop e6. And this is like an old move that somehow got lost in fashion, Peter. But they used to play it ages and ages ago. And I think everybody forgot how to get an advantage <laughs> against it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it makes a, a great deal of sense to just wheel something like this out every now and again because people will just be so confused. Like, because nobody has seen this in 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 decades. Right. And, uh, it's not great. Uh, you you have to start by saying that objectively, it's maybe not the the funnest position you can get right. uh, with black out of the opening. Even though, as you can see now, it, uh, it it's perfectly playable and it doesn't seem to be all that bad. Right. But uh, I think the main value in playing something like bishop b6 Surprise. Is, is you do it once. In that one game, your opponent will really have very, very little clue <laughs> what he's supposed to do against it. And then you don't repeat it for five years. Because and then everybody yeah. will prepare. And just as everybody thinks, okay, this will never happen again, you do it again. <laughs> right. Uh, that's that's, that's the strat, I think. Yeah. There you go. I'm also I extremely surprised that Fabi hasn't gone for his uh, archangels in this, uh, mm. in this opening. It's a course that he's just come out with. Exactly. A very extensive course. Uh, but he decides not to start with the move bishop to c5. Right, which uh, is the archangel variation. You can go with b5 say. and then bishop c5 or start with bishop c5. This is what his course is on, but he chooses another approach. Decides exactly. to go for bishop hey, to e7. Minute. And probably he's got to champion his cause, you know? Right, exactly. I mean, it, it, it's a bad sign <laughs> when you're the author of a course and then you don't pick up uh, the line you're championing. Peter, what do you think? Do the top players, uh, the very best in the world, do they actually study the courses that their colleagues come out with just to get an insight into? I think into it? it was a shock to me when, when I realized that very, very strong players actually are aware of what I'm saying in my courses. And, yes. Uh, uh, and it also creates this weird dynamic where I know I trusted what I said in my Grunfeld course. I, I know that like, there are mistakes there. It's impossible to record them, this amount of material without any mistakes sure. at all. But even judging by feedback, there hasn't been any real glaring, horrible, horrible blunders in there. There have been stuff missed, but it's... So it's not that you you lied and you're never playing it because you know that you lied and things aren't true. Right. But you still don't want to give this huge target field to prepare for uh, mm. for, for you. So it's, it's a kind of a weird mixture, in particular for somebody like me who... It's my main opening. Like for, for, right. for Fabian not to play the Archangels, I think, is, is easier than for me to just suddenly stop playing the Grunfeld altogether. So right. It's, it's understandable that he doesn't really want to give people uh, uh, the, the, the opportunity.
uh, to target him. Uh, but as we uh, go through the MBL and we are, have caught up with the players, you know, somehow Black's kind of landed on his feet here. I don't see too much going on for white. Black is going to play knight d7, and if you told me this was a Sicilian defense, I'd say, okay. And if black ever were to play knight d7, and maybe on a good day get in the move d5, that's it. Any opening advantage? It's a far Forget away about green. It. Yeah, it's gone. It, absolutely. I, I think it's all about this d5 square that you're pointing out. In these structures, if black gets a successful break on d5, you've done really good and white has to do everything to fight that. One of the ways to fight it is to get rid of the knight on f6. So what white would have really wanted to do is go bishop g5, g5. grab that knight which controls the d5 square, but that's been stopped by Fabi. Uh, before it even got started, you know. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. What, what is it? It's sort of like good players solve problems, great players avoid them altogether. Oh, nice. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, but h6, I like it. Uh, no advantage. And let's just take a, a gander, the lifetime uh, advantage, uh, li lifetime score between uh, these two players. Head to head, here we go. Oh, oh wow, they've played against each other a bunch of times, even in rapid chess. Uh, and, and I wouldn't have guessed this either. And 22 to 12, that's a decisive two to one. Advantage for MVL. Use advantage to MVL wow. in their head to head. But Maxime, he's also the former World Blitz champion. Uh, yes. So he's quite the beast to face in these formats. We saw the big save he had in round one against Anish as well. Finds those resources with little time on the clock. And this time it feels as if Fabi's the one who's managed to get a bit ahead uh, on that 17th piece, which is a clock in yes. chess. As uh, we uh, look at this, again, I think that Fabi is doing fine. Uh, take it away, Peter. Where do you see advantages? Uh, I don't see it in the MVL game. How is Nepo and Anish Giri, two uh, Let's big, take a look. big players? Uh, Let's take a look. And yeah, this one is is a quieter, uh, quieter uh, affair, yeah. affair in, in an Italian where, uh, once again, we see the the very, very heavily discussed Gioco Piano. And Jan goes for this a4, a5 advance, which is a4 has become a very, very standard thing to, to do in all of these types of positions. a4 followed by the immediate a5, I think less so. Uh, and uh, Anish responds by very concretely, he says, now you've given me a target, I will use this opportunity to just offload, some, offload some pieces off the board. And then some normal development happened. And this, this is a very clever thing by Anish there. Uh, White, you know, claimed some space advantage on the queen side by establishing a beachhead on uh, on a5, and it gets immediately challenged. Uh, and once uh, White commits to b4 as well, Black is now ready to uh, sort of fight chain against chain. White has this very, very beautiful long pawn chain, but so is Black. And I think Black should just be uh, reasonably comfortable. Maybe it's a little bit, as you can see uh, on the screen here, a little bit preferable for White due to uh, the slightly more space on the board, but it shouldn't be anything dramatic, I wouldn't think. Tanya, I have to laugh at this. I yeah, mean, I know when why. I grew up with the Joko piano, I was playing C3, B4, A4. I wasn't playing A4, A5 in order to play C3, B4. Uh, very unusual approach, but, but balanced. Uh, very it was balanced, balanced, but yeah. yes, when you said I'm going to laugh at this, I thought it was going to be your question about, wait a second, you're saying it's all balanced, but there's a pawn well, that, the, and there is that a pawn. black can actually win in this position directly. Uh, yeah, but e5 takes d4, c, c takes. What's and, going on here? Well, I've got this queen b3, knight c4 kind of Well, currently of a5 is hanging, so what, Two you, pawns? what you start with actually mm. is, is you play a5, a6, making sure that the, this There's pawn no, on b4 cannot be connected to it's isolated, uh, yeah. Yeah, any other pieces. And then you pick it up by playing either queen b3 or perhaps queen uh, if bishop b6. Right. We can start by queen a4 and then d4, d5 will come. Uh, so this is a very committal choice and I'm not sure it's such a great choice for black to be honest. Mm -hmm. Once you realize a5, a6 exists, because without I think the move a5, a6, Black would snap at this because mm -hmm. uh, you just you, you won a pawn on the queen side. You are threatening to take the second one. If a b six queen b six happens, Black is instantly and you're okay. doing. And even, Anish even this apparently is quite good it. for White somehow. But and he spots it. He says uh, a six, not allowing any of that. Keeps the tension as is with this uh, very unusual pawn structure on the board and makes the move queen to c seven. 
I was about to say, are we playing queen to e7 or queen mm. to c7? And I thought it was commentator's choice. And I wasn't sure. I think Why, considering wh that white maybe, if, if we talk about threats here for white, the move knight c4 is maybe is the one thing. Threat. Yeah, the one thing that looks like a threat. Right. And it obviously attacks the pawn on d6. But if you move, if you put your queen on e7, yes. you can make an argument that b6 is also maybe a bit vulnerable after knight ah. c4. And you, you have to invest some, uh, some thought into how you're protecting it. Because I think, once again, maybe it doesn't work, but I spotted this very nice little tactic here with knight takes d6 and then d takes e5. And suddenly you can see that oh. with so many pieces hanging, uh, black actually does lose material. Try to finish the line, Peter. Kind of you got a, I, I think we should finish that line because black can actually trade the queen. But it finishes with the rook jumping in and the bishop on d7 is hanging. Yeah, the bishop on d7 really is hanging, nice. your, your right. knight is hanging, and there's no way to, to connect anything. So you are in a, in a lot of trouble here for I'll black. lose material. Yeah, so queen c7 uh, preferred, if you play knight c4 here... You're not it, hitting anything. Yeah, you're not hitting anything. I mean, knight takes d6 might actually still be a threat, but you, compared to the previous line, your b6 pawn is not hanging, giving you a tempo to do something productive with your life, yeah. Bishop e6, something. Yeah. A move, a, a move, move of some description, yeah. Right, bishop uh, e4. Which is why uh, Jan for now prefers not to commit to knight c4, either goes queen b3. It's, it's going to be a very interesting positional struggle where uh, concrete calculations are not really, they come in sometimes, but generally people will be fighting uh, you know, on more conceptual ground, you know. Where do you put your pieces? Which pieces you want to trade and so on? I want to say that uh, for me, Nepo has played quickly, as you mentioned earlier in round one. I mean, he's played entire games with extra moves on, on his clock, but yeah, he's only used two and a half minutes to get himself, you know, deep into this uh, theoretical dispute, I should say. And so, probably not how much anymore. Is, I, mean, I think they're on their how own. How much by is now. prep? You think? Bishop before check. I think Bishop before check okay. probably was noted as an option, but wasn't paid too much attention to because it's not going to be a refutation of anything. It's just no. a game, and right. and these days I think, uh, at, at particular at the level that we are watching uh, in this tournament, these are all elite players. Uh, the evaluation that is just I'm going to get the game here. It will not be a forced draw, which is great. Is perfectly acceptable for most people. I gotcha. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that's that's how it happened. All right, let's go around the horn and just take a look. Uh, we're going to check in on the game between Wesley So and Sam Sevian. Sam uh, very impressively defeated uh, twice challenger uh, uh, Yam. Yes, Bishop eight six. Yes, and Rook E6 and Queen G6. And it was a splat. And uh, he's up against Wesley, who actually lost his first round. And this looks like a scotch. No, it's not a scotch. Excuse me. So this is... Uh, well, hold on. I think this the, is the archangel. Yes. Wait a minute. Not, not really. I think I think it's <laughs> the more, classical. More, more of a. Mola? But when White plays five d three, I think White is just saying you might play the open Spanish, mm. and I don't want you to. Right. <laughs> yes. I, I think I think this is how we get there. And then yes, it's uh, archangel's key in 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 spirit. But the the important distinction is that White, I think generally would like to play d3 on the next move, mm -hmm. wait for black to develop the bishop on e7, and then play d3, but that allows the open, and people often uh, do this specifically against players who might play the open. Okay, and... and yeah, if we quickly get to uh, where they got to, uh, and bishop g5 and... Uh, for me, this move d3, d4, it's a is, bit of a surprise. It's unusual, yeah. yeah. Uh, in particular, when it's connected so clearly with a loss of tempo, because we've just played d3, right. and then we play d4 in the next move. But they do this sometimes. And what I wanted to say is this this reminds me very uh, dramatically of uh, the, the one moment in the World Cup where Magnus almost went home. Vincent. The, the white game against Vincent Keimer, which had this structure. I even scrolled through the game a little bit thinking maybe they're actually repeating the, the game between Magnus right. and Vincent and have only just departed it. But no, it was similar, but not this move order. Uh, but yeah, this is the uh, the moment where once Vincent didn't find that Knight combo, takes yeah, yeah. which I think would have effectively knocked Magnus out of the tournament, you felt yeah. that now that that hap hasn't happened, Magnus probably is winning the tournament now. <laughs> Some because, destiny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he generally doesn't give people too many chances to 
uh, to do well against him in knockout events. Exactly. Um, I noticed that uh, after the move queen d3, or maybe even mm -hmm. before the move queen d3, uh, your uh, gains disappeared. So mm -hmm. we're yeah, on it's novel, been, novel it's territory. It's been very new. Uh, I think this is still... No, actually, maybe it's up to here. Yeah, up to up to bishop h forty six. You even you even get some some games. very strong games. There was some game by uh, by Arkady Nadic uh, going further down, but then I think it disappeared. Yeah. So this is all kind of reasonably down. uncharted territory. And how are they doing, Peter, in terms of evaluation? The engine gives White a slight plus, but I don't think it's much, uh, and. Uh, I think normally it should be it should be around equal. I, I've already started looking uh, at uh, this tactic, but currently it doesn't work because queen takes g7 exists. I'm pretty sure is mm -hmm. also bishop g8 d8 c7 wins. But even even this is very strong. But you can start in the current position by castling, and then bishop uh, c3. Which might be which a side would you like to castle? Here? Queen side. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think the 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 attractive the attractive ambitious option here is to castle queen side. But the issue is, I think after bishop, bishop takes c3, c3, you take you will have to take with the pawn. Ooh, because queen c3 runs into yeah, like knight takes because, pawn. Because yes. this this now should work. Uh, question uh, mark. Question mark. Yeah. Favorably. Yeah. For yes, because you take on c3 and you hit the rook on d1. That's yeah. a. Difference. It's still it's still sort of playable for white, but you're not going to be. Uh, Happen. Like there will be some compensation for the exchange because you will pick up the pawn on d6. But obviously nobody does this yeah. to play for a win. It's just, it's yeah. just that you're not lost, which is right. a good thing, but not it's a great a thing. thing. <laughs> right. So you will have to take with the pawn, and having castled queen side, having to immediately recapture with the pawn uh, on c3 is not a, a particularly attractive proposition. Although it's not unplayable, and if that forces white to castle king side, then uh, the position is quite balanced, and you can also still go for this this line as well. But at least your king is safer on yeah. the king side. Well, Absolutely. as a commentator, I would love to see queen side castling. It just means more fun for us. But probably if you're playing, uh, queen side castling could be extremely dangerous in this position. Maybe we'll see fun. how this one develops. Yes, and I see another game has got your attention. Exactly. Well, I mean, I told you uh, prior to the start of the tournament that Ali Reza was going to win the event. So let's see how our tournament winner is doing. <laughs> uh, queen a4 check, knight c6, e3. And uh, Jeffrey is uh, playing, I want to say, an incredibly fashionable line that somehow Bishop D2 uh, and these Rigozans, I don't know how it became so popular, but I'm seeing Wesley So and some really th strong, strong theoretical players playing like this. And it's like a slow play, Peter, but it's all about just trying to get a playable position. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird kind of a dance uh, in particular right. if you play queen a4 and then you don't play knight e5 immediately and allow black to castle safely. Uh, then you, you, you get to this stage of the game. It doesn't happen every time and I think in the game between uh, Leigh and Wesley uh, it actually became very concrete quite quickly. But what we're watching here is another thing that happens quite a bit in this line. where Shuffling. <laughs> now there is this weird sequence where Everything is sort of revolving around black wanting to take on c4, mm -hmm. but wanting to do it in such a way that white will have to spend two tempi to recapture. Okay. And white also has a bunch of waiting moves before white decides to go bishop b2 or bishop d3. So black goes bishop f8, we play rook d1, black goes h a6, we play bishop d2 c1, because why not? Because yeah. we have so much time. But coaches around the world right now are having heart attacks <laughs> because they've been teaching children for generations to develop your pieces, get your king into safety. Don't and move the same piece twice in the opening. Thank you. Oh, you went to school. I'm impressed on you. And you're playing rook d1 and bishop back to c1. These coaches are saying... Uh, it's, still, it's still understandable because, yeah. once again, we're expecting dc4 to happen eventually, and then having the rook on d1, having that rook on Useful. d1 already control the d-file with not without the bishop on d2 getting in the way. I think makes perfect sense. And also, Peter, very often in these positions where white really wants this bishop is on the b2 square that in is some middle very games. Fair, yeah. So very once fair. you've kept it back on c1, taken out your rook, you're already eyeing b4, bishop b2 long term. You're trying to convince the kids of the world to move their pieces three times. First put your yes. bishop on d2, <laughs> then put it back on c1, and then put it to its rightful square b2. 
Tanya. Chess has changed. Uh, the computer is Your new chess oh. course is going to be fabulous, I can tell you. Yeah. Okay, Bishop E2 now, at last. And now we come to an interesting spot because okay. Bishop E2 happened, DC4, Queen C4, and a very concrete response here by Lereza. He goes B7, B5, which looks like a blunder uh, of a full piece, but it actually is just a draw offer. Because if you take on C6, we'll play Bishop D7, Queen B7. We'll play rook b8, whoops, not queen b6, of course, but queen a6, rook a8. And white could pretend and, I don't know, take on a8, take on b5, but that probably is trying to lose mm -hmm. more than trying to win. So what the game actually ends with is, a repetition. is this repetition. So uh, for oh. Jeffrey here, it's a pretty clear-cut choice. You can play queen to any square. You can go, uh, probably d3 is the most natural, maybe you can make some argument for b3. But and after, then the game will continue. Or you take on c6 and you say, I've won. I, I, have to, run one I, I have to tell you guys, I've played enough simultaneouses in my life um. that when my opponent plays the move b5, I would say to my Would opponent, you like it back? Yeah. Would you, please, you're just blundering. <laughs> <laughs> <your name. laughs> would you like it back? <laughs> Wrong. This is A extremely concrete though, right? Because if you go back to d3, he might even be thinking about going b4. All those bishop moves mm -hmm. that you were talking about, yeah, sir, mm -hmm. that white has made, uh, you still haven't castle. Your king is in That's the center. Right. Or, right. or e5 even. Yeah. Or e5. b4, e5, two very tempting options. If you go back with the queen to b3, at some point you've also got knight to a5, bishop b7 ideas jumping in. Uh, and I'm just wondering if the fact that Jeffrey has slowed down, does he feel that perhaps taking a repetition is a safe bailout here? I don't think he's better if he doesn't. So the question is how, how ambitious he feels very early in the exactly. tournament. He's yeah. playing against somebody who will... Who just on, beat Fabi. Yeah, on, on very, very little current evidence, but on like lifetime evidence, who will be a, one of the favorites of the event. Mm. Uh, he's had a very solid game in round one. And I think if, if he felt he has a decent shot of an advantage, if he doesn't take on six, mm -hmm. he would continue. I think he's generally a very ambitious young man. But if you're continuing just to continue, against Alireza, and Alireza is playing quite quickly, clearly knows what he's doing here. Uh, I'd like to see that because I honestly I feel that for, for like the experience of playing as many games against Alireza as, as possible uh, exactly. is nice. going to stand you in very good stead eventually. Exactly. Mm. But from a purely chess point of view, I don't think he can be faulted here by taking on c6 and mm -hmm. saying, okay, let's play one more game and uh, prepare for day two. What yes. would you do? I was actually going to throw the ball to you as the body <laughs> language first. expert in I the house. Was yes. First. You look at Jeffrey right now. Yeah. Does he want to continue this game or is he going to grab on C6? I think you take on C6 unless your preparation is such that you, you, you have worked out that Queen D3, the retreats, Queen D3, Queen B3 give you something concrete advantage. But I don't see it. I really don't. I mean, if you go queen d3 and black gets an e5, I'm not enthusiastic. No. I'm, and I'm, honestly, if, if we continue this line a bit further, let's say sure. we take on e5 and then all yeah, the trades happen. take on happen. d3. I guess yeah. I take with the rook. What am I whichever, whichever one you choose. Yeah. Knight takes. 95, 95, rook e5, and we stop there and we discuss this position for a second. I think this endgame is Excellent. potentially better for black. Correct. If anyone is better mm. here long term, it's black. Yeah. So he's, th this is what I mean. He's taking too much time. He's going to grab the knight. If you want to continue playing, you make this decision within the first minute or two. You don't spend that much time here. One of my favorite stories, I was playing against John Fedorowicz, and it's one of those moments where I make a draw offer, and John thinks for 15 minutes. So I think he's not going to take the draw. But then he thinks for 30 minutes. Now I'm absolutely <laughs> certain he's going to take the draw. Then he thinks for 45 and when he doesn't take the draw offer, I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I wow. mean, your, your, your window of acceptance, uh, Peter, uh, gets Did narrowed. you flag him eventually? Yeah, I won you. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you took 45 minutes. It was like the greatest draw offer of all time. Yeah. He froze him in a deer. Uh, you, you take enough time in rapid, 10 mm -hmm. minutes, think. You yeah, it's, at some point it becomes say... completely impractical to continue as well. And, Precisely. Uh, that was my point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, at a certain moment, you're going to take on C6 just because you're down. Yeah. And uh, as a, as a well-established 
unofficial member of the Chicken Chess Club. I, I, also, <laughs> want to, chess club. I also want to point out that it's also a trick people use to make sure that they accept the draw offer, right? Because it's to take some time. You, you think you might actually have to continue, but you also know that if you give yourself thoughts for, like, if you think for enough time that you don't have much time left, you will be able to tell yourself, I couldn't continue, I left myself. Fully justified. Yeah, I left myself 10 minutes for 15 moves. There is no way I can continue. For that's, a, that's a really important point, especially in this position, because the game has just started right now. True. Uh, queen to b3 or d3, and things just begin to happen. You need that time on the clock. So the more he thinks now, less time than Ali Reza on the board. Uh, it looks like Jeffrey is eventually going to decide to take that knight on yeah, c6 and, and walk we into watching, the repetition. While we were watching the, the board view, Ali Reza was just he was the picture of somebody who knows what's going to happen and it's just like oh. just take on c6 already <laughs> yeah, so yeah. With this. you've taken five minutes yeah, already like you this. take seven now yeah, you're gonna take the draw come on he knows uh here at uh, webster university uh coach liam has uh, he definitely knows. yeah he knows <laughs> we're, we're gonna see a draw coach liam of uh, webster university uh got a win in round one and so he's sporting uh, a tie for first. Uh, let's just jump into his position with Ray Robson. And, you know, the position that the players have achieved, I just want to say it has to be a theoretical draw, yeah. uh, duel, a theoretical yeah, duel. I, I think that's fair. Uh, jump in and tell me what the players are doing and what grandmaster games are they following peter because yeah, plenty, i don't know what's yeah, going on plenty if we if we start for, for from move seven here and this is a very kind of a classical uh, joko piano uh, joko yeah. piano where black i mean we were taught to play a6 on bishop a7 but more and more these days you just play bishop b6 with the intention of playing knight e6 and then knight e7 and then c6 right. and this is what happens here h3 black reroutes uh reroutes the, the knight very over classical to g6. yeah and once white goes bishop b3, preparing to go knight b2 and consolidate completely, black immediately hits, uh, hits back in the center, trying to sort of resolve all the issues we have here by playing d6, d5. Okay. And this is a very typical thing that they do in these structures, but it normally doesn't lead to anything but equality. And black is shooting for equality and not more. But here, after a sequence of seemingly very logical play, black... Uh, you know, white took uh, a pawn and a knight, black took a pawn and a knight, white took on g7, and black played rook e8, and suddenly you realize that this is not so comfortable for white. You, right. you have to take some maybe unpleasant decisions because the pawn on g7 is there, but it's not really it's not doing checkmate. very much. But black has much more pieces aimed at the white king mm -hmm. than, than white has. So allowing f takes g2 is not going to be very much fun. And eventually, uh, what Ray ended up doing is he took on g6. Here he had the option of including the move, let's say bishop takes bishop takes h7. Sorry about that. How did I do that? You're doing good. Yeah, and then rook takes d1, which maybe was better than what he did. Uh, but he went for something which I think is very ambitious, but probably not that great. Instead of bishop h7, he took on d1 first, and after hg, he made this move g2, g4, mm. which is a way to preserve his kingside structure. Mm. To a degree. Mm, but maybe some and danger. Then, and then he wants to dig out this pawn on f3. I assume he just wants to play knight bg2 almost immediately, whatever black does in response. But this is a very high risk strategy because obviously your king side is going to be quite vulnerable. And as you can see, the engine is also not uh, in love with it. Not enthusiastic, right? King takes I g7, think the issue rook might h8. Be something, something that he may have missed is That's this idea of very rook direct. h8. Yeah. Or maybe even stronger is to Include. start by taking and then playing rook h8. And this entire complex on, on the king side for white is, is crumbling because you, you can't really... You would like to play king h2 here, but that Bishop really compounds, compounds your problems. Is it, is it yeah, no, that's embarrassing. Uh, Tanya, I have to admit, when I see king g7 and rook h8, I want nothing, nothing to do with this as white because I'm seeing... Uh, and I don't even want to play bishop takes b6 because I'm helping my opponent. To open up that a line for the other rook, uh, the side pawn comes to the center of the board. And I notice like... the clock here. He's under three minutes. Ray is, Ray is in big wow. trouble. He has to sort out the problems on the board and he has to do them really quickly. While for black, the moves just flow, right? 
Rook and to h8 is coming in, and we do have a draw. As we were predicting, Jeffrey Zhang decided to go for the repetition. But just to finish your thought, what you just were saying about Ray, once again, three minutes? Under three minutes. And a bad position. With the white position. pieces, you haven't yet finished your development on the queen side. This is a disaster. This is yeah. an absolute disaster for Ray. Uh, to be worse with white after 18 moves and with three minutes on the clock. And I think he had to make the move that he did with the king stepping forward because otherwise you don't have enough time once the rook lands on the h file because of the pin on h3, then bishop g4 would have been a threat. So king h2 played. His idea is to get the king to g3. The big question is, is black in time with penetrating the rook to the second rank? Yeah, that's a question. It deserves a very good answer. Uh, I'm not sure that Ray will have a good answer. By the way, the move f5 also... Uh, becomes attractive. Uh, rookie two. He's reaching F5. out for it and he plays it. Yeah, uh, rookie two looks very, very logical. Of course. If two is being hit and uh, the, the, as is the, <clears throat> on you, the queen side, I think Ray is intending to play 92. Uh, not in king g3? Okay, no, but I think, I think 92 is, is right, better. Fine. Using the fact that if you take on f2, now king g3 actually equalizes because uh, the rook cannot really stay on the second. We will take on f3. Gotcha. Whichever way the rook goes, and this this looks just to be very, very level. So instead of rook takes f2, it's much stronger just to include one more piece in the game, play bishop b6. Okay. King g3 seems logical. And for instance, you can play rook d8, forcing white to take on f3, not with the king, but with the knight. And now we take on d1, we take on b2. And, and we're better. It's very clear that white is uh, fighting for a draw here. You maybe make a draw if you play very, very oh, precisely. It's a struggle, no? Look at the pawn structure. But, and it's yeah, it's, it's going to be. 20 versus 2 on the clock. It's going to be very, very unfun for, for Ray here. Unfun. And that, that is <laughs> not even considering how far behind he is on the clock, where he, he has two minutes against 21, and it's only uh, going to, I for, think, worsen. For Liam, this is absolutely a dream come true. true. Right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's like his wow. his kind of position as well. It's and strategic. You're playing for two results, it feels like. Uh, no complications. You're up on the clock. And Robson with no ray of light in his one. Exactly. And uh, with the double points for winning in the Rapids that you get, uh, Liam will just be uh, in cruise mode. Uh, let's go to the game of MVL and uh, Fabi and catch up on these two players. We left it around the part of H6. And our thinking was very straightforward. Uh, it was about the D5 square. And whoever best controlled D5, and once Fabi got in the move D6, D5, uh, his troubles were more or less behind him, or not, not, not entirely. I not think that, entirely. that that is still a, a very fair assessment of what's going on. But with, with White having the more active rook and also with the pawn on a6 having to be constantly watched, you still, I think, pick White here, even mm -hmm. though if you imagine the same position, but with, let's say, the rook on d7, if we go all the way to the current position here, if you imagine this rook and this rook being gone off the board and the black king on a6, Wow. Black is black is very serious. Yeah, yeah, black is uh, much better and probably uh, has significant winning chances. And if you imagine all four rooks coming off the board, it might just be dead lost. For <laughs> right. Uh, so the, the evaluation here is changeable, definitely. Black can improve, and black could at some point be very, very comfortable. But for now, I think the bishop is trying to come out to e3. Mm -hmm. The reason white made this slightly awkward looking move g3 is that he didn't like to. Think Encourage about where F4. to put it after yeah. four. Yeah, putting it on a7 is not really uh, such a dream. Bishop c5 is playable, but he just decided to try to stop a four altogether. And black can deal with this in a variety of ways. You can just ignore it. I assume rook e7 is playable. It's and... not. It's not the most glamorous move in the world, but it's playable. Or you can continue insisting that a four is something you want to do. You can play g5. I don't. Right. Think, I don't think it's illogical to play g5 here. Hmm. So interesting. End game, but reasonably balanced, I would say. Fair assessment. All right, uh, continuing our uh, look around. Uh, where did I miss it? Uh, there it is. It's uh, uh, Anish and Jan. When we left it, we had this queen c7 on the board, right? Boy, the players, I forget that in rapids, they play <laughs> rapidly. B6, B5. Uh, before we get any deeper, uh, Tanya, uh, b6, b5, first move come to your mind? 
Do you like that move? I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. It's clear that he wants to put the c5 pawn onto c4. Right. And kill that light squared bishop on f1. If you f1. could get that, it's justified. But you are... Oh, I was about to say, you are encouraging b4 takes c5, b takes c... I thought he was going to play... Let me just put this on the board. bc, bc, a6. We are talking about iso artificially isolating. Remember when we allowed the pawn to come to b4 and you played a6? Now... It's a little bit artificial. I that don't know. said, yes, yeah. if white gets, if black gets c4 in this position, that a6 pawn, which looks really beautiful, can also be a weakness in many of the positions. Eventually, it could Fair. become a target here. Like, let's say we go rook b8, rook b6. I, I can see that. Spoken in one voice there, yeah. <laughs> uh, and there was, I, I want to show sure, one specific please. position here uh, because I think Jan's reaction to b5 was very, very interesting and probably very good. He took on c5 and played c3, c4. And, and this is where. Uh, it seems like what we're trying to do here is just to trade everything off, but in fact, it's quite uncomfortable for black because if you take c takes b4, why just goes to, going to take c takes b5 and this is probably a goner, like this pawn doesn't survive and right. this looks like it might just be lost. And if you take this way, your issue is you will not be able to recapture with c takes b4 because there is a pin. And if you play rook c8, why it goes b5 and once again, you can't Engine trade says it's playable, but for, 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 for my, to my human eye, this looks very, very dangerous, and there's also the move rook e c1, which might be even stronger. Right. So uh, Anish played rook b8, Jan played rook e c1, bishop b6, and here there was a very cute moment where Jan played something which I quite like from an aesthetic point of view. I think it's a very interesting idea, and he, it might even pay off for him eventually. But he missed a very beautiful idea here, because he could have played queen a3, which I assume he declined because of cb4, queen takes b4, and b takes c4. However, however, specifically after queen a3, and it has to be on this square and no other square, after c takes b4, you take here, you go c takes b5, and you defend and, the rook yeah, with yeah. the queen. <laughs> yeah, queen takes c1 would have won a full rook, rook if you had to recapture this way. If your queen was yeah. in, yeah. But of course you don't because you can take with the queen. You can take with this side. So that was an option That's which I think was quite cute. strong. And if she takes before, if we dislike she takes before, we end up having maybe to make this move. But then white recaptures on c5, and it seems like the pawn on c4 is going to get picked up next move. I'm charmed. Yeah, and then, That's and then it's a free roll. It's, it's not as bad as all that. Black can play rook fc8, and actually maybe with precise play it doesn't lose, but it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Borderline, for sure. Yeah. Queen instead, a3. Instead, Jan went for a very interesting idea. He just gave up a full, reasonably healthy pawn on the queen side, to do this to the black structure. Okay. And this is now a very long-term compensation for, for the pawn given up. I'm a pawn grubber, but I like the compensation. Yeah, it's, it's definitely enough. The question is whether it's more than enough. Yeah. Right. And a lot of moves were made here, so let's just briefly show uh, we'll catch the up current with the position. Yeah. yeah. So Jan triples up uh, on, on the C file here, and hang on a second. Yeah. Why do I? It seems like something something quite bad happened here because it seems it, like big we, progress yeah, for black. We, we were enjoying this for white, and then it seems, seems like there was a miscalculation. So this was still fine. Oops. How do I? No, <laughs> no. Exit. Where? Oh. <laughs> no, I, I think I think you'll have to do it from your side. I'll tell you. Okay. I'll tell you. Right. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll jump to my board, and you, you tell jumped. me where you want me to go. Peter, we just had this position, yeah. you tripled so, up. So takes, takes happened on b1. Yes. Uh, knight a3, rook b3. Yes. And here, I think knight b5 maybe was still fine, but queen e1, or queen d2 is the move that he played. I think he just missed c4. He missed c4. Yeah, I think c5, c4 was missed. And the point is that you can't take with the rook because the knight on b5 is hanging, and if you take with uh, the... Bishop, what's the tactic there? Queen, queen c5, c5 check, check probably works. Queen c5 check, so queen f2 runs into rook b1. Mm -hmm. Bishop f1, queen takes b5. Queen takes knight. Oh, yeah. that is nasty. That is very, very nasty <laughs> indeed. Uh, because yeah. you have to play bishop to f1, and that walks into a self pin. So the move c4. Oh, nice. Very nicely found by here. Anish. And, and another oh, move sorry. that I want to point, point out, which yes, was very please. impressive by Anish, was this knight retreat to e8. 
And the whole idea behind 98 was to stop the queen from coming on to c7 mm -hmm. to trade because it's very important for black to keep that queen defending that a7 and e6 weakness. So 98, a really nice prophylactic move there by Anish Giri. Yeah, just to keep the c7 square protected. Absolutely. I mean, you've got a pawn on a6 and it's blockaded. But if you ever extract <laughs> that a7 pawn off the board, it's, it's, game over. it's game over. So 98 necessary and queen d2 overlooking c4. I like this. Ouch. Uh, is this the current position? It is, yeah. And Jan is now faced with a very, very difficult choice, as you can see. You can play bishop takes c4 and just give up those two pieces for, for the rook and end up with uh, <clears throat> a position which is clearly better for black, but also... Uh, let's say, like you mean, king maybe h maybe defeat, yeah, king, king h1, and then just take on b5 after rook b5. Right, and uh, so you get two knights. But you're also yeah. losing the a6 pawn more That's or less straight away because queen f1 mate is a bit of a threat. Bigger right? threat, so, yeah. Awkward. Yeah, it's a it's a yeah. tough choice. But the, the issue yeah. is, <clears throat> if you don't do that, if you let's say retreat with the knight back to c3, which is maybe the the only yeah, on the board, yeah. Black will play knight d6. As, uh, as advertised. Yeah, yeah, and now you're sort of worse everywhere. Your bishop on f1 has lost touch with the pawn on a6. Black pawn on c5 progressed a very, very important one step further to c4 and yeah. is well protected there. And even your king arguably is less safe than the black king because you very much kind of dislike having played it's, up to f3. I, I don't disagree with anything, every, anything you've said, uh, Peter, I, and I don't mean to be disagreeable, but why doesn't he include queen c5 check? Because it, I think he values like, this like, not being an enemy. Like, I think he doesn't want to play queen, allow queen f2. Yeah. yeah, well, king h1, knight d6 has got to be considered an improvement, right? Yeah, that's right? an improvement. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's queen f2 specifically. Yeah. But you it, want to play queen d4, I guess. Yeah. That was the intention. But queen f2, queen d4, perhaps you can go knight e2 and force the queen to actually trade on f2 and then c4 is attacked. Mm. Yeah. I think he wants to Fair. keep the queens on the board and he... So something like this and... Takes, takes... 96, and you have to start thinking about rook to rook b6, though. Yeah, rook b6. b6. Yeah. Okay, but he did. He he kept the queens on the board, rightfully mm -hmm. or wrongfully. I'm not sure. Knight d6, and we're up to date. Are we up to date? We are. Yeah. We are. And keeping the queens on the board, another idea can be to go c7, get that queen to b6, because as we've been talking about this a6 pawn, which can be a strength in a lot of position, has suddenly become a bit of a target with that f1 bishop losing connection uh, with that move c4. Fair. Absolutely. By the way, I've always felt uh, that Jan is one of those, I want to say, streaky players. Mm -hmm. He gets on a rampage, you're in trouble. He can, he can walk away with the tournament. Equally, he can go the other way and, you know, just gift points away. It feels like he's losing a bit of control here, Yeah, Peter. Today, today will not be uh, his brightest. He will, he will need to kind of stop the bleeding in round three because this one looks like it's headed the same way the first one has gone. Uh, it will be very, very yeah. difficult to hold this position because... And uh, now, yeah, knight a4, it did take under control to b6 square, but Peter, as you were pointing out, that now this position gets dangerous because there's a c6 square, which would hit the a6 pawn and the knight on a4. Exactly, yeah. the queen's helping black. And eventually the knight on g6, which hasn't really been doing very much for quite some time, will start coming in via 4, g3, and so on. And, oh, yeah. and yeah, it's just going to go downhill from here. It, it already feels like it's barely defensible, if, if, if at all defensible. Here goes queen f2, which is a clever move, trying to... Let's um, see how these two match up in their head-to-head -head lifetime score in Rapid, of course. And there we have it. Wow, wow. they have played against each other. Well, almost, I'm trying to do the mental map, but it feels like almost 100 times in, in yeah. Rapid play. I was about we to say, they can do a trilogy of books on their <laughs> Rapid chess uh, Our best games. games. And I bet you they've been fabulous. By the way, 24 wins there for Jan. We talked about Anish being a very solid player. You beat Anish Giri 24 games. I don't care whether it's in yeah. Blitz or Rapid. That's I'm still impressive. more impress impressed by the volume than anything yeah. else. That's 82 games. And, yeah, <laughs> oh, that that's... was better mental math than mine. <laughs> 82 is, games. That is a that's lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> that is a lot of games. 24 wins to Yana Pamnashi, but it looks like Anish is a step uh, closer to trying to level that score with this game, no? Gap. Yeah. Uh, but this move, Queen F2, was actually, yeah, this is, was a very decent move. It's uh, Knight C5. Knight C5, or even 
even maybe Queen C5 on a very, very good day. Right. Knight C5 specifically, but it feels like Knight F4 is very strong now, uh, including your last game, your last piece, which wasn't really uh, doing that much. Participating. In the game. Just, yeah. Just trying to go Knight F4, Knight D3, and further. And after G3, do you jump onto D3? And yeah, trade? we just go Knight D3, take with the rook, and it seems like it's just mm. bad for White, or right. at least that's what the engine is suggesting. And by the way, uh, <laughs> not surprisingly, Ray, uh, who was down on time, has been playing on his increment almost throughout, Tanya. Last time we checked, it was 20 minutes to Liam and 2 minutes to Ray Robson, and he's been playing the last few moves with just, ten, with just seconds on his clock. And uh, what's the position? How, well, is that a pawn down for White? Yeah, yeah we, we thought it was very, very difficult to hold. And that's still the case, uh, Peter. Still the case, but he's defending really, really well. In particular, if you consider how how little time he's had to to find good solutions. Uh, but machine suggests this is holdable. Machine suggests this is uh, within within the the parameters for White to make a draw. And how confounding is that? Because yeah. I was about to say, don't we have the connected pass pawns? From a human perspective, you look at this and it feels like it should be a loss. That bishop on c6, right? it feels like a monster bishop. You've got these two connected pass pawns. Uh, it's not going to be easy to hold this position. And I'm just wondering why White is not doesn't have a bigger advantage than what the en the black doesn't have a bigger advantage than, than what the, the engine shows. I guess it's because we've got King F4, Knight F5 as counterplay against the black king, and maybe maybe even on a good day H6 uh, could be so something like King F4. He needs to make a move. Yes, and he's he played it. Five seconds. He played King F4. You know. <laughs> I sometimes really, yeah. I just like, it's one of those, you put your hand on your face and you say, I can't see, I don't want to look at Ray's, Ray's clock. King f4. Uh, Apparently a mistake, but also a move I probably would have made myself and you, I would agree entirely with what you were saying. And, and what the engine was suggesting instead, which apparently was completely equalizing, is I think just unplayable in a real game. And that was? Uh, the engine was suggesting to play rook e5, provoke b6, and then put it back on e7. Oh, be serious. Yeah, nobody nobody does that. Exactly. It's just, no. And the idea is that the bishop would then be vulnerable mm -hmm. to yeah. a rook As you, you, you were correctly pointing out that this bishop on b6 is a pride and joy of black's position, right. so solid on, on that c6 square. Never Undermining it and then attacking it was very strong. Well, and now after king f6 followed by rook h1, black is uh, going to have back very, in business, huh? very good winning chances, in particular against eight seconds, seven, six. Uh, he has to play and he five, decides four. to put the rook on c7, so at least stopping the b pawn from moving forward. And is he counting on the knight jumping to g4 and playing h6 next? Yes. Probably, yeah. But rook h1 is very strong. Unfortunately for him, you can actually just put the rook behind, allow the pawn to get to h6. Let's say you go knight g4 check, we go king e6. White goes h6, but there's no threat, and black can start running uh, his own passers. Just go c4 here, and suddenly with the knight not on e3, mm -hmm. c4, c3, c2, c1 is a very, very <laughs> legitimate <laughs> problem. <laughs> it's it an issue, huh? Yeah, it happens very fast. It happens much faster than you would have expected. Yeah, not to suggest that f7, f5 might also mm -hmm. just kind of tease the knight. Uh, things are looking very bad for Ray as he, uh, well, he's playing on increment, so it's not a surprise. And that's the reason you wanted to provoke, or at least the engine wanted to provoke the b-pawn to move to b6, because exactly. that bishop on c6 stops any uh, lateral defense from c7, stopping, preventing that c5-pawn from moving forward. Might just be as simple as pushing it uh, once the knight from e3 moves away. By the way, we have c5, c4 immediately, uh, not including the move rook h1, and I just saw that Ray slapped the clock. With one second. One second. I've, I've, I've witnessed this too often in my life. Uh, one second on the clock, and we're going to see that in... Uh, that is also, also very, very strong, actually, what, uh, what Liam has done uh, there. And yeah, h7 by the way, played and... I so don't, H7, we can just go Rook H1 and pick it up. I was about to say, uh, a moment ago, we were getting the Rook behind the pawn with Rook H1. Now that the pawn has made it all the way to C3, this looks like it's lights out, Rook H1. and I want to see that one second, and through the magic of television, Tanya... Let's do an action replay. Look, and there are three, three two, two, and with a second on the clock. <laughs> and one second on the clock. Oh. oh, he made it easily. E oh, easily. He, he, he probably had like half a second, maybe even seven tenths of a second there. 
Spoken like a true TGT connoisseur. You could see him pressing the button as the as the digit was changing from two to one. So yeah, well, I think by his standards, he made uh, it very, it very, very quick. Comfy. comfy, comfy. But it doesn't help the position. No, it doesn't. Unfortunately for him, as uh, we do have an update on the position, Rook came to H1. Knight dropped back to E3. I think he just took the pawn and mm -hmm. allowed king e3? Yes. So are we up to date? Yes, after yeah. king e3. And now you can play king e5 and... Uh, That's a nice move. Yeah, and I think king d3 runs into check and f5, which is probably very, very strong. Well, indeed. Uh, yeah. But if you don't have king d3, you really have no sensible moves here at all. So, Two yeah. pawns down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's a Johnny Ball game. Uh, what do you got uh, for us in the... Uh, Anish uh, Giri position? Uh, it's become a bit less clear actually. I think Jan is now uh, in, in decent drawing chances territory because there was a point after Queen f2, neither four was very strong, but Anish went with Queen a5 and Rook b1, which is also quite strong. But in this position, the engine was suggesting uh, quite drastic measures. It was suggesting you just give up your, your pride and joy, your pawn on c4 for peace activity. And it was suggesting that after this move, rook b1a1, the threat of rook a2 is so strong wow. that it starts giving up material. It starts playing rook takes d4, and you even have a choice of which material you want to pick up <laughs> because rook a2 also exists. Right. But instead, Anish went with knight f8, a kind of a passive move, giving white time to, to play king g2. And now, uh, this He's is just, an improvement. Oh, massive improvement. Yeah, this is still maybe not very pleasant to play on low time, but Jan is not really... This is a difference between, let's say, what Jan is doing here and what Ray has been doing. Because exactly. Jan, Jan also had a very troublesome position with white, but he always kept the clock under control. And this is obviously just so much easier to play with a very Absolutely. poor knight on the face, safe, safe king on g2 now for white. You are a pawn down, but you, I think you are kind of taking yourself to make a draw here. Exactly. I, I, I would uh, But betting my, on yourself to yeah. make a draw. Uh, Reminds me very of... Highly. Anisha's first game against Maxime Vachier Le Grau. Completely in control, uh, advantage from the beginning, but then one in accuracy, and your opponent is back in the game. Rook A1. Yeah. And I think it comes down to that uh, Anish characteristic, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Peter, of trying to keep things under control too much sometimes. This mm. move, Knight F8, it felt like that. Yeah. It was too cautious. I think also, if, if we once again, if we return to this spot, you feel that your position is so good that the thought of giving white anything, the thought of like parting with your wonderful passer on c4 Why? is just so so upsetting that I recognize this this desire to not give any counterplay at all and try to win sort of on autopilot, try to win without really calculating any variations mm -hmm. anymore. It often actually lets you down very, uh, mm. very strongly because you, you do at some point need to go in, need to commit to uh, finding the finishing blow. Right. Yeah. And just to remind everybody, as we're in round two, what the standings were following round one. Tanya, do the honors. And this is where we are. We're going to have a lot of switch-ups after <laughs> round two, as Ali Reza has already finished his game with a draw, but he started round two with a win. So, uh, start with a round one well, win at win. two points, along with Liam and Sam in top three position. And then from fourth to eighth, we've got Maxime, Anish, Jeffrey and Ray. And of course, the players are still fighting it out. And anything can happen. And we saw Jan Nepomnishi is back in his game against Anish. So he yeah, might be able to hold this one. But the heavy hitters there at the bottom, I just uh, drew, pulled up the game between MVL and Fabi because it seems to me that uh, MVL, from the position where we left it, which was right, right about here, G3, mm -hmm. it seems to me that MVL has done everything perfectly like he's improved like if you look at this position where you're going to see the rook on a1 included the bishop and the king and black has basically done nothing okay so we're going to see that in the next few little while that white has really improved everything right here the bishop went from c1 to c5 the, the rooks have been doubled the king has pro come up and i think MVL has really improved his position dramatically. Well, the bishops, my first take. Bishops have been traded off, and uh, it still feels like things are under control, but White's rook activity, you can tell, is so much more. And if White is able to actually double up on the seventh rank and create some uh, 
threats along it. But what Fabi is perhaps relying on is the move rook to e7. Right. You want to try to trade off at least one pair of rooks here as black? Mm. I don't know, Peter. This sure feels like uh, Fabi just let his opponent achieve too much. Yeah, it feels like this is the absolute best uh, position you maybe could have had right from know. the previous one that we discussed a dream you you still you still have to find a way to win this it might still be holdable just because of just how solid it is for black and just how difficult it is to make progress i assume progress is connected with playing b3 and c4 right without that you don't really generate anything he starts by playing rook d5 which is a bit of a well, curious move. Maybe he is actually just preparing for rook e7, making it slightly less comfortable for black to play rook e7 because he will not be able to take with the king. Very nice, With the yeah. five being uh, being on praise. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a prophylactic move there, rook to d5, and then we could see it followed up with b3, c4, or maybe even rook a7 at some uh, moment. But if you don't mind me being a little bit of a devil's advocate here, and, you know, I like what you were saying uh, there, Tanya, you want to double up the rooks on the seventh rank. This is a massive maybe winning threat. And if you play rook e7, and if I just, I mean, I go ahead and force this rook ending. I thought we'd take with the king, perhaps. Okay, you, if you will. Yeah, that, that That's absolutely fine. And if I go rook here, yeah, and we you go, go g6. g6, and I go king d4. Yeah, the big question is, what what is this pawn ending like? Exactly, that was my yeah. question for you, Peter. Uh, I I would need to think about it. Um, I'm not you've sure. You've got 12, and also, sec, 13, yeah. 10. And also, in this particular <laughs> position, maybe three Rook holds. Rook d6, king c5 looks very scary, no? It does, yeah, e it does look like it might three be. Three holds, okay. E3, e3 followed might... by rook e4, check rook g4, might generate just enough activity for, for black to, to escape. Yeah. Okay. Because that's another thing that you, you know about Fair. these endgames. You very often lose them if you play passively but you do hold them by and we have a lot of action that's let happened. me refresh my board because you're absolutely right a lot of action and after the move rook d5 i think fabi was uh smelling the bacon and it was cooking and it was his bacon and he played the move g5 and we do have hg king takes g5 on the board and a few moves hg king takes and rook f7 you have to go rook e5 Rook e5? Okay. Or I'm not sure. Oh, not sure what's going on here. Uh, I'm well, with you on this one. Well, Black is in trouble. The question is sure. whether it's already too far gone or you can still maybe defend if you play really, really well. So Rook f7 played, by the way. The, yeah. no, rook e5, the engine for some reason also includes rook g7 check here. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to say that after. Yeah. If Dro you, well, drives the king back and then goes rook g7, and it really hates the black position now. This really, is really, really hates it. Well, well, this is where Tanya was saying if you could double the rooks on the seventh rank. And now, it's, just, ev yeah. it's gorgeous. And, and every and king pawn ending will be lost now, right? That's the point. So you then you get go to go B3 stuff. and C4, and all the king and pawn end games are lost. So what we're talking about is go ahead and trade the rooks. We're checking on F4, and, and then just go. You've got king F4, but you've got B3 and C4. Yes, coming in next. And it's easy. By the way, Fabi has made the move rook to E5, so we might be seeing this happen. There's a check on the board on G7. Yep. And king f6 is a uh, force. And for Fabi, this would be a terrible start. I mean, my goodness, it couldn't get worse. Back-to-back uh, -back oh, losses. Oh, yeah? yeah. Yeah. And uh, Maxime, rook d7 looks like the natural move you want to make. Well, uh, right now... Right now he hasn't king, played. Ooh. King h6. Ooh. Interesting. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> Unbelievably, we have just been told that Ray, who we know has had no time, uh, but somehow he's still miraculously in it and may have escaped against Liam. Uh, whoa. Uh, wow. How does that happen? Where because, did the seat on go? Like, right? Like, we left it right about here where we were picking up the H pawn and we thought, King E5, let's go. And somehow, Okay, Liam thought, I've got two, I'm two pawns up, I must be winning, right? And he probably is right, but... We played the last about 20 moves. With no time. With no time, on, on literally two or three seconds on the clock left. It's, and he's managed to survive this. It's so frustrating. You play a guy, a player, who with no time, and then they never blunder. 
<laughs> and it's just infuriating. I mean, it's yeah. like, yeah, 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 it's, it's not even difficult anymore because the pawn f5 gets picked up next. You can't keep the rook on the f file. Oh, rook f4. Rook f4, king e3. Rook go king e3. And yeah, it's, it's not oh, even no. tricky anymore. It's, oh. it's, it's fairly straightforward. Oh, oh, this has got to be heartbreak for Liam. He had it in the bag. I mean, that bishop on c6, the pawn's just moving forward. The only way that c-pawn could have disappeared was becoming a queen. Yeah. But that did not happen, and now it just looks like this is going to end in the next few... Yeah, and the, the, the very critical moment, I think we can pinpoint specifically where it all went wrong for, uh, for Liam. Uh, this position that, that I have on the screen here. Uh, so far, so good. And I think he made a very understandable move here because your bishop is hanging, so why not give a check in the center of the board? But that actually allowed white some semblance yeah. of stability after king e3 with uh, rook c5 or rook e8 check coming in. If instead of that move, black goes, let's say, rook a2, uh, you, you, do have to be, you do have to be certain that this endgame is winning, but I think you are fairly certain after king right. e4 because uh, yes. with the king cut off from below, those yes. are reasonably well known to be completely lost. What exactly. white wants is king on f1 in these positions, yeah. Yeah. but well, you're, you're not, never you're, getting there. You're not there. getting there. Not getting and there. after rook a2, you also create a third of rook a3 check. And very, very importantly, with the bishop steal on c6, the rook on c8 is completely cut off from play. So white has to make some very, very uncomfortable moves just to continue the game. Like maybe you can, you have to play king c3, but now I can just go f5, f4, and white still has totally, no checks. Totally different. Yeah, and you just get completely run over. And once he played bishop before, this is not a draw yet, but this is where it started looking like it could be a draw at some point because it's a huge improvement for white to be able to to start giving checks, start attacking, attacking and pawns and pushing. Uh, yeah, uh, this is this is still around. this is still probably winning with precise play, but you do have to play yeah. precisely. And rookie one check is just a massive, massive mistake. A blunder. And wow. Now it's a draw, yeah. Very resourceful stuff here. Wow. By Ray Robson playing on seconds, and this one. Uh, Nice yeah, it does forward. continue. Okay. But you just have the beep on now. Yeah, no, he, I like... think he actually played a 5 of 4 here, judging uh -huh. by what I see yes. on our screen. He went for this as Ooh. his best chance of winning the game, which is a bit surprising because it really doesn't look like it will win. Yeah. And, king, and king c5. So white is eventually going to give up the knight for the beep on, and the white king will yeah. snap up the f pawn. This will finish Draw. very soon. And that's it. He's going to take on b5, put the king on f3, snap up the f4 pawn. Huge save for uh, Ray. And Big one. And also, the handshakes. Yep. And we see a smile of relief there. From Ray, Ray Robson. And Ray's a... Liam's not going to be smiling. And, and Anish, with a shake of his head, is not going to be smiling. Exactly. As, uh, again, we're seeing uh, Jan, well... I, something, he, he's very, very fortunate to save this yeah, uh, game, uh, that's Peter. For sure. uh, let's jump back to the game of MVL because that move, King H6, was a real surprise move for me. And it didn't really change matters because after King H6, immediately uh, we saw Rook D5 to D7 and uh, oh. MVL has doubled his rooks on the seventh rank, and he's got... Uh... This is actually very cute, because King h6 was losing, but he was losing for a very specific reason, which wasn't spotted. By the players. Uh, and now the game, the game uh, continues and might even not be so easy to win anymore for, uh, for MVL. Where was the win? After King h6, you can take on e5 and then go King f4. Ooh. And everything collapses. So, uh, maybe even not shockingly. I wanted to say shockingly, but maybe there is no particular shock in and that either. Rook d5. Rook a7, I guess, and just we, we start collecting everything uh, because you're you're just sort of one tempo short from being mm. able to play rook d2 and not lose the entire <laughs> king side and queen yeah. side. Yeah. Bo and both both sides. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what we do have is a position where. Uh, it, it feels like white should be winning, but maybe it's not as easy anymore. Uh, H4. Actually, no. H4 is very strong, and Machine is not saying uh, Fabi escaped. No. So it's a pawn sacrifice, and you bring your rook to attack the H pawn. He does it, uh, recaptures, and now there are always these threats of pushing the F pawn forward. I apologize. I'm just going to uh, refresh my board as we have two games remaining. MVL, Wesley So. MVL is trying three to lose. Draws. I, don't, I don't know if he will, if he will mm -hmm. succeed, but he's kind of trying to lose here. MVL's trying to lose? <laughs> well, 
Not really. I mean, he's trying. But to, he's working. Yeah, he's working towards. <laughs> towards yeah. the wall F4 here. is on the board, and yeah. the pawns are pushing. And with two rooks remaining, this is danger zone for White. Yeah, if you drop, if you drop a king back to e2, Black just goes rook h2, and if you take on a6, right? I wouldn't be shocked if this was already, like, significantly dangerous territory. Yeah, it says minus four. Wow. <laughs> E4, E3. Yeah. E4, E3 coming in. And hello, the king, the king hello. Is, the king is so weak. And also, let's see, if you play king E1, maybe even king G4, F3 is coming in. So. Right. Uh, yeah. And if, no if this happens, on the third rank. If this happens, you can still save the game here if you, if you stop yourself just in time and not take on A6. But all of his previous play was, was to take, to take on A6. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's, gone, he's gone king D4, by gone the way. He's gone king D4. He's gone king D4. And now after king F5, once again, the, the engine suggests you are struggling to make a draw. And why, is it, why does it not work for, work for Black to go for the direct line with E3 anymore? What happens after E3? How do you react? I think we just take and go King D3. So you trade and there's a check and you just come back with your king and after... And now I, I have frontal checks as well. Like I have Rook G1, Rook F1 to, to fall, back, uh, fall back on if I need to. So this feels like it should be holding. Even though it's quite scary, as I just realized, rook h2 creates a threat of mate in one. That's a mate in one, rook d2. <laughs> yeah. But but you can actually uh, you can actually go... Rook g1, like, king h6? Yeah. Can I hide on h6? If, even this, you can, you can even go king f6 and rook f2, but after rook g1, for some reason, the engine says this is not enough. Wow. But this is turned around. Who thought that this position, Fabi's going to be the one who'll be pushing now? Exactly, exactly. Well, like uh, Peter said, uh, MVL is working hard. <laughs> to not only throw away an advantage, but a very uh, yeah, big throw. Yeah, Wesley. And, uh, we, we see Wesley and, and uh, Sam uh, that... finish their game. Wesley at some point was... Four draws. Uh, That's four draws in this match. Uh, that's surprising. But uh, let's stay with this for just a moment. Yeah. MVL, uh, so... A moment you 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 were the move to play for a win here is king of five. Yeah, I wanted to ask you how am I playing for a win then? Yeah, the move to play for a win is king of five, and if the captures on a six happen, well, this is where you get. Yeah, we play rook h one once again. This is a very worrisome. Very well, and, maybe losing. Yeah, and you you no. have to go uh -huh. in for something like this, and you're really not sure that like e three probably already wins you a rook. Oh right. My gosh. I would assume that e three takes and both. F takes and F3, probably pick you, pick you up with a rook. rook. Yeah. But it's just not going to be enough because rook A8. And then I will even drive your king a bit further away. Right. And then eventually I will go rook E8, take on E1, take on E5, E5 and I will have enough. But close, close. This is, this is very, very, <laughs> uh, you know, well, difficult and territory already. time, Tanya. What's the clocks? It is getting very tricky for Maxime, who has to defend this with 20 seconds. Fabiano did go for the idea of getting the king to join those two pawns from advancing. It's looking very scary. Ooh, look at that check using the pin on the f4 pawn. Picks up the rook. The f3 pawn will give a check moving forward. This is probably lost. Ooh. This looks lost to me. It does. I mean, wait a minute. Fabi's king is in perfect position to escort the pawn up the board. And what's this? King so do you come G2 back with your two I was rook thinking, e5? Oh, you, oh, sorry. Do you go rook h6 trying to drive the white king further away with a check on the d line? That looks very strong. Actually, that looks yeah. very that strong. That looks very very good. The Might I, not be the only solution, but feels like the cleanest solution. Yeah, you just want that uh, rook, rook h6, six, rook d6, or rook h8, rook d8 with a similar idea. But I want to keep that a6 pawn defended just in case. Yeah, you're. You, you've won my heart. <laughs> Keep the a6 pawn defended, but at the same time, just as you're saying, drive the white king away from the promotion square so that you, you're going to pick up the rook for sure. But, you know, Peter, this just feels like there, there, there ought to be something super simple, like rook g4. Rook h3, yeah. Uh, king g2. And, and you say it, and Sorry. it's on the board. Rook g4 is the move of choice. And apparently this threw away the win. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> after rook, rook f6, h3 also after rook f6, the... this is somehow no, no longer winning. Amazing. And he played quickly b3. And, and now he's lost again. Now Fabi is reaching for his king as he's ready just to play king g2 because and f2. Because that was the idea. You wanted to build idea. a bridge of rook g4 stopping any checks on the g line and he does it. f2 is coming. It's all about the race, right? Is white in time with c4? This was a mistake and it's a draw. Oh my gosh. Whoa. I, I, like, I'm, I'm just, actually, no, no. I'm much reconsidered and is, so is now winning again. Yeah. You have to go rook g3? 
I know. Rook G3 I was maybe was cleaner, I, I, but... I, I like your Rook G6 idea, Tricky. certainly. Yeah, you can still drop it back to G6 after, after King E3. Very nice. Yeah. Or G8. So you can't take the done. pawn because you of the check and you lose the Rook. Exactly. And now he's played C4, has MVL, but comes check, and this pawn is going to make a, a queen and force the Rook to give itself up. But this should be straightforward, right, Peter? Just uh, F2? Rook G8 was much weaker than Rook G6. <laughs> wow. Are we splitting hairs or...? No, we are just... The difference between winning and losing, apparently. Really? Which I don't understand and wouldn't oh. even attempt to explain, but... Uh, Thank Rook goodness. G6 was winning and Rook G8 somehow is isn't. Well, you said it, Tanya, that uh, when you have had that opportunity to play rook h6 and just defend the pawn, keep it nicely tucked away, and somehow that's making a huge difference. By the way, c5, a very committal move on the board. Um, the first thing I want to ask is what happens if black gives a check on d8? You go Perfect. to the c file, I'm guessing, because king e3, king e1 looks Over, lost. Over, completely, uh, completely winning. So king... He gives a check from e2 instead? Rook e2 and king d1. How is he moving that king from f1 <laughs> to a queen that f2 pawn? Exactly, exactly. Um, mm. Am I playing rook to e3 with the intention of just taking a pawn? Uh, no. I, the, c6, the, c7, I put c6, my pawn on yeah. c7. Finally, by the way, he has put his rook on the sixth rank. And it had to be done, right? Yes, because if you allow the white pawn to get to c7, c7, you can't improve your position. Exactly. But at the same time, now he doesn't have the move rook d6 check to liberate his king. Rook e2. Uh, Peter, is this Yeah, I some think uh, we probably don't have drawn? enough time to actually delve into this, but I, I think I... I sort of figured out what was happening there. It's happened. C6 played. He doesn't care about the B3 pawn. He just wanted on C7 so that you make sure that Black's rook is tied down to the defense of yeah. the C pawn. And that is exactly what he's done. I think this he's is now a very trivial draw as well mm. because Black really has no progress to make and you can just shuffle on probably the D1, D2 squares. And uh, Whoa. Although if I've been, with the king on D1, Black could consider playing A5, B takes A5, B4. Maybe what you actually do is you play rook along the, like rook f7 here. And, and if the king comes out, you start giving checks and... Uh, eventually driving it and back maybe, to f1. Yeah, and that maybe is a draw. And the reason, Peter, you're saying that is because if the king is on d1, once you sacrifice the a pawn on a5, which is the only winning idea that black has mm -hmm. to try to push the b pawn, yeah, is I, that I, b1 is a check. Yeah, I don't, I don't like the idea of b1 lending with check. I mean, it worries me. I don't know if that's enough to win, but it definitely worries me quite a bit. And yeah, as you can see, he's reaching for the rook. He doesn't like allowing that either. Wow. You that's know. really and nice full board awareness there. And, and, and now I think the, the winning attempt for black will, will be something like getting the king over to e4 and then actually swapping the c7 pawn for the f2 pawn and trying to win the b4 pawn somehow, but it's probably not realistic. Yep, rook g7. I'm just going to refresh my board every while. Don't get... Angry rook g7. So the king comes out, and yeah. we're going to see a bunch of checks. Yeah, and Fabi can choose where to aim aim that king, but the logical play seems seems to be to go to to e4, but he doesn't believe that is winning, so he goes to f1 for now. Or he's just repeating to get those extra seconds on the clock. That too. Because it feels like the only winning try. You give up the f2 pawn, you right. pick up the c7 pawn, and right. try to win on the queen side. Exactly. But I do believe with the king on d2. It's uh, too close. Trivial yeah. is strong, but yeah, I think it it's should be uh, way Yeah, And rook well c4, within. I think he's preparing for those eventualities, I guess. Is the but right. now rook to g7. Yeah, but now after rook to g7, you have to... More or uh, less go back to c6. Oh, you actually have no legal moves. Yeah, rook, yeah. Six, <laughs> rook 6 might be the only, <laughs> the only move there that, that makes any sense whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah, just rook g7. One of the things that has absolutely impressed me about this generation of players is that technically, even when they have less time, they play very well. But in Oops. this particular ending, Peter, we saw some major mistakes that I don't normally see at this level. Yeah, but, but they are tricky. In particular, maybe earlier it was more or less straightforward, but specifically, the, specifically the difference. Yeah. Uh, 
claim and yeah, the it claim, was upheld. The claim was correct and, and right. the game uh, is, is and ended in a draw. So if we talk about this position where, where he's, gone rook, H6. he's gone rook g8 and that apparently leads to a draw and rook g6 wins, I think the difference is very specifically, uh, let me just find my place here because it's... Uh, You've got it. Uh, it's very tricky. Hang on. So if we go rook g6 here, just to yes. find it here. So if, if, if white does, hang on a second, if white... If white does the same, you play c4, yeah. machine gives a check from e6, machine trades on c4. Interesting. Uh, goes f2, rook g7, king f1. And this is winning somehow because you're sort of just in time. Rook ending. <laughs> yeah, because you, you, you're, you're not going to be fast enough, as I understand it, to deal with the combined threats of like rook d6 and then king e1, or maybe even rook e2 check followed by king e1. So you have to go c5 in this position, yeah, right? Yeah, let's say we go c5 and... Come on, Peter, Eventually. you can do it. <laughs> yeah, and then check. King you e1. cannot go forward because king e1 wins on the spot, so you have to go back, and then rook e4. And this just doesn't work out for you move by move. It, it still looks like it might be a draw, but it just isn't. You just wow. have, to, you have to accept it isn't, I guess, is, is the way to describe it. And the difference, and, and I couldn't understand why this wasn't winning in the game as well after rook right. e8. So I checked. Uh, and we, we get to the same... Hang on a second... Uh, with yeah. the traded pawns. Yeah, on. hang on. Let me let me let me find it. So this is the game position, King D2, and uh, F2 was played in the game, allowing White to play C5. So what happens if we take on C4 and we say, but what's the difference? Yes. Why is this a draw? The draw is because now we can play Rook G6, and after Rook E2 check, there is <laughs> this resource. Whoa! And Rook A1 check and picking up the queen, which and doesn't got exist in the other position. This is just <laughs> because insane. the rook was on the sixth, and we couldn't play Rook G6. Right. Oh my god. But I mean, good luck spotting this on the. Yeah, minute. with seconds. <laughs> and Come on, with what seconds. a run! And, and, and this also, was an incredible I, I, I want to ending. say, I want to say that when when you get there, yeah. when you get there, and you're deciding between Rook G6 and Rook G8, I think from a tidiness point of view. You want it as far away as possible. You, I think you are taught to go as far away as possible sure. so that it never hangs. You know, the, the, right, the, there's no tempo. Yeah, putting, putting distance between, uh, the, between king and the, the opposing, uh, opposing pieces and your rook. Mm. So I think your hand actually plays rook g8 here. And that Thank throws you, away Peter. a win. Yeah. Thank wow. you, Peter. Tanya, as we get ready for break, just tell us our standings. Nothing changed, actually. Because we had five uh, draw. draws and a fighting, fighting draws. Peaceful ends, but the games were anything but peaceful. And there uh, we stand uh, with Ali Reza, Liam Le, Sams. Everyone just gets one point after the draw. The exactly. standings don't change, which means that we still have three players at the top of the leaderboard going into the final. Rapid round of the day. We see Ali Reza, Liam and Sam with three points. They've got to be feeling good. And what a save there by Maxime Vachier Le Graf. Incredible fighting chess. And we will be back with more fighting chess in just a few. Don't go anywhere. The final round of the day is coming up. In 2019, the Missouri Bicentennial Commission, along with Governor Mike Parson, approved the building of a life-size chessboard to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the state of Missouri. Dr. Jeannie Sinkfield, a lifelong patron of scouting and Great Rivers Council Board member, proposed that the project be built as an Eagle Scout project. Jeannie invited 16-year-old Andrew Dowden of Troop 6 Jefferson City to take on this incredibly important project. My name is Andrew Dowden, and I belong to Troop 6 in Jefferson City, Missouri. So my troop, um, we were down camping down at the Sing Fields, and Jeannie came down and asked, you know, is anyone close to getting their eagle or needing a project? Uh, she had this idea of the Eagle Scout Project chessboard, and she wanted somebody to kind of work with her to see what we could come up with. At the time, I kind of had a project in line, but when she brought up this idea, obviously I, I wanted to choose it because it was a lot better idea than what I had started. Prior to this project, uh, I did not really know anything about chess. Once I got into this project, I downloaded an app on my phone and started playing chess, and I took the uh, chess merit badge down at Scout Camp. This was a bicentennial chess board for the historical 
Society of Missouri. There were a lot of people that helped me with this project because whenever I got the pictures from the historical society to engrave onto the granite, I wasn't very familiar with the technology needed to engrave on there, so I needed some assistance with that and learning how to do it. And after all that, I'm pretty sure I know how to do it now. So to engrave those edge pieces, I went down to the Lake of the Ozarks Scout Reservation and we used the epilogue laser, me and Thomas Yang did. I wasn't really expecting it to end out this big, but as we, me and Jeannie were working, um, it just got, kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger, which I didn't have a problem with. I thought, you know, I can take on a little bit more and a little bit more, and um, it ended out to be a really, really cool project. So we had a ribbon cutting of the chessboard and there were a whole bunch of people there including the governor, um, the St. Louis Chess Club, the World Chess Hall of Fame, the State Historical Society, which all helped out during this entire project. Um, Jeannie was there. I had to give a little speech that I didn't really know I had to do, but that kind of has taught me a little bit about speaking too, so I think that has helped me too. This project, um, it's made me real proud that everyone is enjoying it. Like I, every time I go down there, somebody's playing um, and then they're taking care of it, which really makes me proud because me sinking all that time and everyone else that's helped me sinking in all that time, I like to see people use it, but I also like to see people appreciate it. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. championships as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, and so much more. Visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. The World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. Enjoy a shopping experience like no other. Make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org education. The St. Louis Chess Club is the premier chess facility in the United States and is among the best in the world. Thanks to co-founders Dr. Jeannie Cairn Sinkfield and Rex Sinkfield, the St. Louis Chess Club is a nonprofit organization committed to promoting the game of chess locally and internationally. We bring the educational benefits of chess to thousands of students across the St. Louis area, promoting cognitive development, critical thinking, concentration, and analytical skills. The St. Louis Chess Club welcomes chess lovers of any age and skill level to come and enjoy the game of chess. We also promote chess at the highest levels, hosting all levels of the U.S. Championships and the American Cup, as well as high-profile tournaments that attract the world's best players, including the prestigious Sinkfield Cup, Cairns Cup, and many more. All tournaments can be streamed via our YouTube and Twitch channels that also include over 2,000 chess lectures for anyone to enjoy. Become a member and enjoy perks such as free classes and lectures, weekly tournaments, merchandise discounts, and so much more. 
visit stlouischessclub.org to claim your membership today. The World Chess Hall of Fame, located in the heart of St. Louis's historic Central West End. Want to know why chess has intrigued people around the world for nearly 1,500 years? Stop by and learn about the impact of chess from our three floors showcasing the art, culture, and history of the game. Landmarked by the world's largest chess piece sitting outside our front door, the World Chess Hall of Fame has something for everyone to enjoy, including various exhibitions, monthly concerts, and much more. Whether you are a beginner or a professional, there is something for everyone to learn here at the World Chess Hall of Fame. Enjoy free admission to our rotating exhibitions in our galleries and sign up for chess events, family-friendly programming, and art classes. And don't forget to stop by our award-winning gift shop, Q Boutique, and shop a wide selection of chess-related merchandise. For more information on current exhibits, please visit worldchesshof.org. St. Louis, the chess capital of the United States, boasts the world-class St. Louis Chess Club and the World Chess Hall of Fame. It also plays host to an award-winning shop dedicated to chess merchandise, all occasion gifts, and plenty more. At Q Boutique, you can shop both in-store and online for chess merchandise, autograph collectibles, chess campus souvenirs, and much, much more. From quirky greeting cards to luxury chess sets, there is something for everyone at Q Boutique. And all purchases go right to benefiting new exhibitions and programs at the World Chess Hall of Fame, dedicated to exploring chess and its immense impact on art and culture. Located on the first floor of the World Chess Hall of Fame, enjoy a shopping experience like no other and become everyone's favorite gift giver. If you can shop in store, make sure to check out QBoutiqueSTL.com for a wide variety of gifts for everyone to enjoy. The St. Louis Chess Club Scholastic Program brings the educational value of chess to kids and schools across the St. Louis area. Active in over 100 schools throughout the St. Louis city and county, the St. Louis Chess Club has been able to reach over 85,000 students in both in-school and after-school programs. We created the Select Chess Training Program and the Junior Select Chess Training Program in order to elevate the skill level in students across the St. Louis area. These students receive professional training from Grandmaster Veruja Nakobian. Other programs include Chess Cops, a partnership with the St. Louis Police Department, looking to improve relationships between at-risk kids and police officers in the St. Louis area, with over 600 students playing chess over the board since 2019. The St. Louis Chess Club has also created a chess merit badge for the Scouts BSA, quickly becoming one of the most popular badges, with more than 250,000 Scouts earning the badge since 2011. Students of chess can also pick up a copy of Read and Write Chess. Thanks to club co-founder Dr. Jeannie Karen Sinkfield, anyone can learn how to understand chess notation in no time. We view chess as a valuable educational tool. Learn more about our scholastic programming by visiting stlouischessclub.org slash education. Welcome back everyone as we're about to kick off the final uh, round three of the day. We've had a spectacular fighting chess, lots of turnarounds, lots of hits and misses and let's take a look at our standings going into this uh, game three and uh, we've got at the top of the leaderboard with three points Ali Reza, Liam and Sam. Then at two points uh, we've got four players Maxime, Anish, Jeffrey and Ray Robson at the bottom of the board but with quite a save there Fabi and Jan surviving the positions Remarkable. that they had. Remarkable and the fact that Fabi nearly turned oh. at a completely round is shocking. Tell us about the pairings for this third and final round of the day. Let's take a look. And speaking of Fabi and Jan, <laughs> they do face each other. So that's uh, going to be a big one for these two players looking at climbing up on that leaderboard. We've got Ali Reza against Maxime. Anish Giri plays Wesley. So it is another All-American face-off with Sam against Ray Robson. And Liam plays Jeffrey Jean. Let's jump into the game of Fabi versus Nepo because I'm looking at this position. And we're seeing the four knights English and move E2, E4. Um, 
there was a time where literally everybody and his brother played G3, and that was the end of the story. Then E3 became popular. Then, crazily enough, D3 became popular, A3. And there was a moment that nobody played E4, and now it's become one of the go-to moves. Peter, this is I would argue that this amazing. is maybe the, the, second, the second most it's popular, popular move after G3. G, yeah, G3 still stays number one, but E4 is a very, very topical line. And Black has a choice here between playing bishop C5 and bishop B4. Bishop B4 chosen by, uh, by Fabi here. I'm pretty sure he played both a bunch of times, and also I think with both colors. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they will know this quite well. Uh, D3, D6. And the strategic fight here is... The reason I think why nobody used to play four in the in the olden days is you you seem to have completely abandoned control over the, the D4, D4 square, square and you yeah. would have been, you know, chewed out by your coach. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. You know, like what are you doing? Like yeah. why why is this your position by move seven? But it turns out you can sort of play around it. You can sort of ignore that this is happening and uh, gain space on the queen side. In some cases, also gain some space on the king side. And uh, uh, this is a kind of a debated position, which is surprisingly sharp in some cases. Uh, the I, obvious questions, excuse me for asking the obvious ones. You played knight c3 to a4 to hunt down this bishop on b6. And then didn't take it. And yet. then you and didn't, then didn't take, it. take it. It's one of those, the threat is stronger than the execution, <laughs> you know, things. Which... What a bailout! <laughs> Can you believe that, Tanya? You used that line on me, I can't believe it. <laughs> had, to, had to be done. Come you know. on, yeah, so you have had to, to understand. Be done once. Uh, yeah, the, and this is now a, a really weird type of position where uh, black importantly created some space for the bishop to retreat, so white can no longer comfortably uh, hunt it down with knight c3, knight e2, because it will run away all the way to, to, a7. to a7. And white also has uh, a bit of an issue with choosing, uh, not where, white can't really castle queenside anymore with the rook already on the one, but when to castle kingside, because I think if you do it in certain spots, black could decide that the appearance of the king on g1 is just a signal to start running the pawns down the board, keeping perhaps your king in the center, not even castling queen side, just keeping the king on e8, wow. where it's quite safe because it's going to be very, very difficult for white to open things up in the center. So this is actually, I, I very much like that we have this on the board because I think this promises to be a very interesting uh, strategic fight. Thank you, Peter. And uh, uh, let's take a look at their head-to-head -head matchups. Uh, how do they stack up, uh, Tanya? Oh, wow, another quite a lopsided head-to-head -head that Truly. is with eight wins to 18 losses. Wow. wow. So, Jan Napomnishi. 27 draws. They have played each, they've measured each other often, but I didn't realize that Fabi suffers uh, badly. Yeah, with 18 losses there. So, wow. trying to level this one up. And uh, we see a lot of retreats have happened. The bishop from d4 has gone back to a7. Fabi develops the bishop to g5. Right. Just uh, So there's a threat the on knight. the board. Yeah, tickling that knight. And uh, I think we saw queen e6. Yeah, just... queen e6 played. The question is, how do we react to knight d5 now? That's the... Knight e8? Yeah, but then why didn't why you play knight e8 on the previous move? Yeah. Right. Good like, question. I think knight e8 loses material now. Ooh. Bishop g4? Correct. Where am I going with my queen? Only square to Only G6? square. And now both bishop, both bishop e7 and knight e7 just win oh. the exchange, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a so, nasty trick. That yeah, I'm, I'm not... I mean, he, he, he must have something uh, after knight d5, but I'm not quite sure why... You would play queen e6 and encourage I mean, it, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm very confused because... Sorry, I'm just going to uh, refresh my board. And it's he on the board, 95 on the board. And now Jan slows down and starts thinking. Do you think it's one of Plus those three, by the way. classic Jan moments where he rushes with queen to e6 and then you just realize you're in big trouble? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think you're right. I'm, apparently, I mean, apparently bishop whoops. a7 was already a mistake. We were, we were okay after castles. Bishop a7 is not very precise here, unsurprisingly, because it allows bishop g5. So this already is quite quite problematic for Black because you, you would like maybe to play knight e8, but maybe the reason he didn't do it is because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't like that either. Right. <laughs> Very that's, understandably. But now he's just dead lost because c7 is also hanging. Right. There's just no... Yeah, he's gone knight e8, but because now bishop g4, yeah, he will, he will just play a position down a full exchange. Yeah, uh, because there's nothing for, else. And there's nothing the opening. You're really not seeing any compensation for that exchange. It's all happened as uh, we were pointing out. Bishop g4, queen g6 on the board, and a pleasant choice here. 
Fourth, Abby, does it make a difference whether you start with bishop e7 or knight e7, or is there a preference here? Well, amazingly, you can even go bishop d2, apparently. And there's no defense against bishop f5. And b5 is a threat as well. Yeah, so so the engine goes f5, bishop f5, queen f7, and yeah, you, you, you know what this position is. Ooh. You, you don't need to. Awful. Play, you don't need to bishop debate d2, it very hard. I, mean, is, I feel bishop e7 or knight e7 is just so much more human in that position. Yeah. Instead of bishop to d2. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what's Fabi's choice. Peter, your sensitivity with the yeah. board, somehow, I mean, it doesn't... Uh, doesn't, doesn't inspire much confidence, control, considering uh, we, we have two weeks ahead of us. Well, with yeah, me, you're going to get With me this failing, failing to click on, on things. But. I, you know, I, it, it's amazing to think that these players who are so incredibly well prepared. We talk about challenger Napo, who's been in two world championship yeah. matches. He's easily one of the most prepared prep players in the world. And he's lost after a dozen moves. I mean, come on. That's and it's just not only crazy... this game, right, Yasa? Yeah. If you just look at the full day he's had, he goes 8-6 against Sam Savian, walking into that whole tactical skirmish that loses on the spot in right. game one. Right. Game two, he barely survived against Anish after a very difficult position. Exactly. Um, if I could guess, a hazard a guess, I'd say jet lag. Uh, you talk about all the All-American Derby, uh, but uh, the the challenge to see who's the who's the number one French player is uh, in full swing right now, yes. as we have Ali the Reza French versus number one against yes. the French number two. Exactly, and let's see what we have. We have one of these Maroxi bind positions with B5 and D5. And Very exciting stuff going on here, everybody. While these Anya. two are Debating. are friends, and you know they play for the same team, but I also feel that when they get on the board, Maxime was French number one for the longest time. Exactly. Until Ali Reza came into the exactly. picture. Exactly. I, I think there's a lot to prove when they play against each other, and they take that in a very competitive way. Exactly. I mean, I, you, you said it very well. They are definitely friends off the board, rivals on the board, and they want to be the best chess players they can be. And sometimes you just, it, it's nice to have a rival that's pushing you, right? I mean, Muhammad Ali had Joe Frazier. Yeah. And without Joe Frazier, there would have been no Muhammad Ali. And sometimes you need that kind of rival. What, what do we have in the head-to-head? -head? Um, now that's the balance. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's the first head-to-head -head that we've seen all day. I that's guessed. pretty much balanced with seven wins to Ali Reza, the six losses. So a really losses. close fight we can expect between these two speed chess specialists. Absolutely. But at the same time, we have a very exciting position on the board, unless it's all theory, Peter. I was trying to remember, there was a recent game which Jan Nipomnishi played in the uh, Levit of Chess Week tournament in Amsterdam, which, which was Recently very, very similar to that, yeah. I think with Black against Wesley, so, which ended in a draw, but Jan was busted for about a couple of moves. He told me afterwards, I didn't notice, but he told me that he mixed up the move order and was busted. But I think judging, I, I couldn't really do any kind of an in-depth dive, but... Judging by the very cursory uh, investigation I did while you were, you were speaking, this appears to be the right move order mm -hmm. and black should be holding. And this is a very sharp position because I think what white would like to get here is something along the lines of takes, 95, 95, queen d5, we take on a6, we go queen e2. Yes, there is some Volga slash Benko type compensation, but, but you a are a pawn up. Yeah. The problem with that is that if you go e to d5, you instantly lose to rook takes c3, Followed by ninety five, followed by ninety three, followed, followed by, by ninety four, yeah, and that opens up the diagonal for the bishop, and everything just collapses. This is just a dead loss position, as you can see by the evaluation, which means that if you want to try to get that position, you can't start with the capture with the pawn. You have to start with the knight capture. Okay, and then once again, you're not getting it because I will be taking on b five and not d five here, and the pawn on d five is weak. It probably gets picked up reasonably quickly. So black gets enough count to play here as well. And also importantly, if you play f3, f4 here, which for a second I thought was very logical. Exactly. If, if the knight goes e5. somewhere, we go e5, we probably just win. But the knight goes nowhere. Right. Rook takes c3 is a killer. That's uh, very good. Yeah, white has to take the rook. We take on e4. We go knight g4. And we're very proud. Yeah, and we are a full exchange down, but look at those beautiful, beautiful oh, horses. Exactly. And that really nice bishop on g7. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that's a guided missile. Uh, so we like that. 
uh, where was the novelty? Because somehow your games disappeared. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not it's not very clear exactly when. Yeah, no, it's still. Hang on, this can't really be. This is. Uh, uh, maybe you did, yeah, you just ah, uh, oh, you turned off the uh, opening book or something. And another update that Fabi yes. did go for the move bishop to e7. So uh, we left it uh, in that moment. We felt Yana Pamna she has made a big mistake out of the opening, and it looks like Fabi just going to be up an extra exchange. Definitely, and you're just seeing. Uh, <laughs> I want to say Jan looking at the board, and he's wondering. You know, how did I? How do, why did I wake up this morning? <laughs> something, something was in the breakfast, the coffee. It, it's all gone wrong here in day one for uh, Jan. Let's jump to the game between Anish and Wesley So. Uh, the two players are playing a very theoretical dispute. And I know that this is, for some reason, this particular variation, this whole line, I've really associated with Wesley. Yes. Like he has been cutting edge for some time. But I did want to point out that, you know, if you showed this position to a puzzle rush moment, I don't know how many people would find the move bishop a6. What do you think about that time? It's a really nice move. <laughs> and uh, Anish really showing that he's tactically fully aware right now. And that's actually a really beautiful way to defend our bishop in some ways from exactly. e2, right? Get out of the way and at least mess, spoil the guy's pawn structure if you take. If I, you take, then you're super happy because you take on b4 and then the a file's opened up and everything's fallen into place because you're threatening rook to a6, the knight goes to c2, but the c5 square is attacked and maybe we can just quickly show that line that after knight c2, if you pick up on a6, you can't still pick up on, you can start with a check, but just to show the idea that knight before runs into bishop c5 check. Anyway. Yes. I, yeah. I hate to slightly rain on your parade here, yeah, but this is all bishop. still very much the and, and, oh, Of course and, it is. And, and, <laughs> off the, uh, yeah, and uh, lots of games too, I imagine, right? Yeah, high profile games as well. Uh, Ivan Salgado Lopez uh, against Wei Yi, way back in 2014 as well. So this is not even, this knew might this a stuff. stroke of genius by Anish <laughs> yeah. Giri, it's yeah. something he's aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it just once again showcases that he's incredibly well booked yeah. up and uh, knows stuff. Right. Which is something playing what feels like to be the entire, by the way. I, players play the Joko piano for ages and it's like nobody aspires to play D3, D4 anymore, Peter. I don't think that's entirely true. I think uh, we've already seen in this tournament a couple of games where this uh, this but this early, played. I meant to say, well, you know, you haven't played knight to g3 yet. You know what that I is mean. that is fair. But even, even so far, even in the first three rounds, this is, I think, the second occasion where this happened because there was also this game that Ray should have lost to Le Quang where he had uh, this setup with a, with a knight steal back on b1. On, on b1. b1. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, nice even here, d6 d5 is something I would definitely consider. I'm not sure if it's the best move. It's the move that the engine suggests. D6 d5. Yeah, people also could just you could. There's nothing particularly wrong with just playing, let's say, bishop d7 here. And great, you've uh, got your and, pawn. And continuing development, but the the most way concrete. Yeah, the the way to make the most progress towards. Definite equality would be to uh, mean d4 with d5, and uh, seems like it's working. I guess after he takes d5, we take with the queen. We're not that worried about bishop b3 because we can just drop back to d6. There's never any knight g5. We already played h6. Right. Doesn't even look like it's you know that scary. Unfazed, yeah. Knight a3. Knight a3. We take on d4. Knight, knight b5. We, I guess we take on e1. And yeah, machine goes queen d7 and says this is really not that bad. That's looks annoying. A bit, <laughs> looks a bit worrisome, but... We yeah. do have, by the way, bishop d7, mm. but the move d5, yeah, that 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 looked very, very forcing and uh, clear. Uh, bishop d7, a4, are we still in known territory then? There's still some games, yeah. Actually, Jeffrey? Jeffrey had it with black. I was wondering if that was relevant, but... They might know, but uh, he, he wasn't playing anyone who is playing this game. So Eight that's still a game played in 2021, which uh, Jeffrey Shong was actually beaten by uh, John Burke. All right. Uh, one of our uh, leaders, tournament co-leaders, Liam, he is up against uh, Jeffrey Shong. And let's see what they have played. Oh, an old favorite of mine. Mm. And uh, mine. Uh, yeah. And mine, yeah. Jack King, Jack. 
I was very proud of myself. Uh, I had the occasion to, to try and play from the white side. I kind of welcomed it, but uh, it's not, it doesn't refute the, no. the, the, the black, uh, the black uh, option, but it's very, very playable. The idea of playing h4 and then playing d3 and then in some cases playing h5 and in some places mm. playing quieter is, is definitely very sound and, and black does need to know what, they were, what they're doing. Knight c6, d3, knight d4, played knight b5. We're actually still following one of my games against MVL. Actually, two of my games against MVL is... <laughs> How did you do now that uh, you mentioned I think I drew one and I lost one. And the one I lost, <laughs> I had a very good position in. But... Uh, that is so annoying. Yeah, You're preparing for a particular player. You get the position you want. Yeah, that's one of the worst feelings in the and world. And then you lose your prep. Yeah, and that was all in, in the World Cups 2017, 2019. So there were stakes were reasonably high as well. So yeah, right. th those are not very pleasant memories. Uh, but well, our I'm game glad here, we brought him up. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Our game here continued before and night B5. This is, uh, I, have, I haven't played that. And... Yeah, white will eventually, uh, with the king on g1, the king will uh, either get out, or white could also, I assume, go for some kind of a rook lift with rook h3, mm -hmm. right. and the king can just stay on g1. h5 continues being uh, sort of very much on the menu, but it seems like, after a very logical bishop d6, black isn't really doing all that poorly. Right. I would still probably take white here, just because I sort of like this general structure, well, you know, play rook h3 here, but... Apparently a huge mistake, and after queen c7, I already failed to equalize. So. <laughs> Don't hate that. There we go. Nice. Okay, well, we'll leave uh, uh, Liam and uh, Jeffrey to work. What game didn't we take a look at, Tanya? Well, there's a lot of action along all of the games. Uh, just a quick update that Fabi does have an extra exchange. That's going to go on for a while. Uh, should okay. we go back to... Well, let's just take a look at... Because it, kind of seems a little bit grotty. We left it here. And, you know, if I'm going to win an exchange, I'm going to include a trade of pieces because the, the closer I get to an ending, the happier I am. So a 97 check would have been my choice. And that's, a, that's good traditional chess wisdom that still right. stands, right? If you're up material, you want to try and trade off as many pieces on the sure. way. And in fact, as the game did continue, that knight which wasn't traded off, has become a piece that gives black counterplay against that exchange. Well, the knight is sitting in the middle of the board, knight to d4, bishop, he took the rook, and again, well... This is now actually quite unclear, because uh, right. the, the white, white has the advantage still, because of course, of course he, has, he has more rooks, but you have to play very, very precisely, because what happened was black established this fantastic knight on d4. Thank you. Yeah. White now has this really, really poor bishop on h3, which yeah. does absolutely nothing. And also the pawn on c5 is now vulnerable, clear. very vulnerable. And the engine goes king h1 with a very specific plan of meeting bishop takes c5 with queen c1. And this is why we played king h1, to stop knight e2 check oh. from being a fork. And that wins back some material because e5 is very vulnerable. If you take rook fc1, you can't really... You can't really protect the e5 pawn, uh, pawn comfortably because it, you just don't have the pieces for it and, and things okay. start falling. Well, the engine goes h6 and uh, says white is better, but considering it was, it was screaming <laughs> white is winning five moves ago, right. this is a massive, massive improvement in, uh, in Jan's fortunes. You can definitely imagine him not losing this position at all. So, yeah, Fabi, Fabi maybe thought the game was just over. When he got right. here, he thought, okay... Uh, my opponent is really having a horrible, horrible day, and I should just. Well, isn't Fabi on a roller, an emotional roller coaster as well? Because he just had this game where MBL, where he looked like he was dead to the wind, turned around completely, was maybe winning, then made a draw from maybe a winning position. And Tanya, now, you know, he's taken a, a completely winning position. It's been an absolutely up and down day for <laughs> Fabi, and it's clear these are like first first day jitters that we're seeing by the very best in the world. And you're right, you know, you win an exchange in less than what 15 moves out of the opening. You pretty much think you're going to have the point really soon. Right. And Sign now you've got some. Sheet. You've got some questions to answer. Uh, Fabi firstly needs to find this idea that Peter pointed out King of getting H1. that queen to c1. Not the easiest idea to spot. No, I wouldn't say so. And by the way, he didn't spot it. He didn't play king h1. He did play instead knight to d6, which visually looks very impactful because you do hit want on to uh, uh, capture this pawn 
on uh, B7. But then you start to think about it, Tanya, you know, that night on B7 might be like one of the worst places on the board. It's gone too far? No way yeah, home? Like, okay, so I take, I'm assuming you want to take with the rook. But with the no, rook, you that, can take on D6 yeah, with that, the bishop that doesn't and work defend at all. the that, rook. So you have to you take have to, with the knight. And now, you know, like if I had my pawn on A5 and my bishop on B4, you would be crying, right? Well, we, yeah. just, we just start by taking on A3. And yeah. Why and, am I even worse with, like, I understand I'm probably maybe even well, sl slightly worse still, but... We're going to see this happen, by the way. Yeah, because this knight is on B7. And I, was it Alexei Shirov versus Gary Kasparov? Yeah. Which was this it, it but was, that knight was significantly more miserable than... than <laughs> yes, <this>. exactly, <laughs> exactly. But... Did that make a searing impression on your oh, mind yeah. as well? Oh, yeah. That yeah. was that was one of the all-time amazing. Mm. Yeah, uh, the knight on b7. I what's the engine of Val? Machine still says it's significantly better for white. You go king because h1, of king h1, king h1, again. g3, f4, and eventually I guess that knight gets rerouted Back to a5, c4. a5, c4. Yeah, and c4 wow. would be a good square for it. Okay, well, we'll keep that in mind. Again, we're going to go to the all French Derby here and we'll see how uh, Ferruja handled this move d5. Well, guess what? He said, I'm going to bail out. I'm not going to play f4. I'm not going to take on d5. I'm not going to take on a6. I'm going to play knight c6. And after the trade, trade e5. You hit the knight, only square, because knight h5, g4 was a bit of a. Could be, but there's e5 hanging. But you really want your knight on the edge of yeah, the board. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say knight. I'll probably just end up F4. playing f4 and just yeah. saying, uh, I'm not sure you're happy about this guy. Not at all. Queen takes d5 also on tap. He did play, by the way, uh, knight back to e8, f4, knight to c7. That's all. We caught up with the players. Uh, somehow I thought there was more moves. Rook c1 and uh, early takes. I mean, in a sense, if you play the move e6, you've got a French defense position without the light squared bishop and you're happy. On the other hand, you know, maybe the d4 square can be uh, very useful for white. Uh, what's your early take? Would you prefer white or black? I think I would prefer white, but I also feel that black has solved a lot of problems here already. Right. I want to play e6, I want to get that knight to b5, offer a knight trade, I want to try and get rid of the knights if I can, open up the a line if you take on b5. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to jump to d4 right. very easily without any trades. Okay. And it just feels like it should be in balance right now. Okay, fair. Uh, I'm not sure who I'd prefer. Uh, Peter, jump in. Uh, just. Just your preference, not necessarily think, the engines uh, Val, which is, like, as you see, triple all, all, Yeah, all, over the years, I've, I've preferred these types of positions for white, where you have the, the, the potential of uh, playing along the C-file. End games are probably better for you because you have a chance of creating an outside passer. Mm -hmm. But I think it's quite concrete. I think, apart from just saying, okay, I can play 76 at some point and play a French, you can also just play for the F7, F6 break mm. and say, I, I don't need to just assume this is the structure for the next 20 moves. Mm. I can just start digging uh, more or less immediately. Rook d8 also creates an annoying threat of d5, d4. Let's knight say they go knight e2, and we can, machine suggests just very simply putting knight on e6 and just playing f6 next move pretty much. I like mm. it. And says, uh, I don't want to wait, I don't want to even discuss those end games that I just mentioned a bit earlier. No end games for you. Let's play a concrete game where I will start immediately challenging your, uh, your central structure. And, Seems okay for black, but still you have to be careful, of course, because I think statically uh, this has the potential of being a bit dangerous for, for black if... Uh, if you're not... Uh, yeah, if counterplay F6. doesn't arrive in time, I think you, you could uh, struggle a bit. Again, I want to go uh, to the game of Sam and Ray Robson. When we left it, we did, we did see that move A to A4. Not an intuitively obvious move, by the way. Uh, for white, you've just you've, you've got the central pawn duo, and you would think that the first thing you want to do is get developed. You know, knight a3, bishop e3. Sorry, Tanya, please. Yeah, no, I was just about to say on eight, on your uh, remark about the move a4. I kind of 
play these positions a little bit with black, and I really like to create some chances on the queen side with the move b5 at some point. As black. As black. I want to get b5, I want to get a4, or b5, b4, and I think the move a4 really stops that play. You're also so not... you're crying when he I, a4. I'm happy with a4, is all I'm saying, and I think oh. that knight on b1, I was just about to say, it becomes a lot flexible where you want to take out to, and we see some moves have happened, some trades have happened, and that's the drawback of the move a4, as you were saying, mm -hmm. that it gives black the square of b4 to jump in with the knight. Exactly. We have a nice and balanced position, what uh, Peter would say. A good fight on the board, three results. Black has the two bishops, white has the center. I'm not sure that bishop h3 is necessarily a threat, but, you know, it's, it's a It's in the air. Yeah. It's in it, the air. It You've got to watch out. Yeah, it exists. I'd probably, as white here, I'd be inclined to play a move like bishop f4. My bishop on d2 just feels like it's in the way of the rooks and I'm just searching for a plan thereafter. So we'll keep an eye on that mm -hmm. and uh, turn matters over to Peter. Yeah, this is a, I'm very happy you said that because... What, and you turn matters over to <laughs> Peter? <laughs> yeah, uh, because, no, the, the, the point about the bishop on the four, because to my eyes, it was a very striking decision here by, uh, by Sam not to play bishop four, because it seems like c6 is, is very specifically inviting us to play bishop four. But d5, e5, and I guess uh, something about the calculations of, of the move knight e4 make it better for white to have the bishop on d2 rather than on f4. I'm not entirely sure why that is. Wow. Uh, let's try and compare. If black does the same here, come on. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Just not going to happen for me today. Okay. Wow. So in this position, after knight e4, the big difference is bishop takes a5 wins. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, wins if, he actually, the... if he actually played bishop d2 because he saw this, mm -hmm. then I, am just... going to be, I am going to be in Applause. eternal. So queen a5, you want to go knight f6. Yeah. Yes. This is super nice. And Ju you don't just have to queen explain, takes knight. Just to explain to the viewers, normally the tactic here that makes this whole line unplayable for black is the immediate knight f6 check, seemingly winning the piece, yeah. but black responds by queen putting piece. more pieces on prez and defending the bishop on f5, and if you take the queen, it, it's just a trade leading to a very unclear endgame. Right. So we're luring the queen away first by playing bishop takes a5, and if the queen goes away from the control of the f6 square, this actually does win. The black That's position is tactic. just completely destroyed, and you, you can more or less resign here. This is a very, very beautiful tactic, and if, yeah. if it actually is the reason he played bishop d2 over bishop f4 here, you, you have to take your hat off to, mm. to Sam. Yeah. Very nice. Bishop e6, rook a d1, queen d7, uh, all on the board, and... We haven't seen bishop f4 yet. But not yet, no. Interesting that the engine just says triple zeros. Mm. Our predecessors really had a very strong belief, both in the two bishops, as well as the central pawn duo. And I think the central pawn duo is lessened in terms of advantage that we used to think, but the two bishops remain. Mm. Two bishops I was going to remain. ask you because I am very much sort of in both of those camps uh, yeah. very strongly. Like I, I absolutely adore playing with the bishop pair, but also as somebody who's played a lot of uh, Rui Lopez in my life, I think I would be quite happy with white here, mm -hmm. despite not having the two bishops because I really like the situation the where I have e4, d4, and the knights on the two good squares already. Right. Uh, so I was going to ask you, yes, sir, like. Without looking at the yes. habitual zero 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 right. on the screen, let's say thirty years ago, which Slightly side do you take? Slightly better for white with the bishop on f four. Yeah, I I, I would prefer, mm. uh, even though I do respect the two bishops, I like the central pawn duo. I'm I'm amazed as a Grunfeld player, and you've been playing against d four and e four your entire life. Yeah. You're used to seeing them on those squares. Tanya, way in here. What do you like, the central pawn duo over the two bishops, or would I you do like the bishop pair, and I play these yeah. positions with black, and I find them quite dynamic to play with, and it's. Uh, uh, it's a game for three results, right. and I think both sides have their trumps, but I like the bishop there, and it's an open position. Sure. And once white does advance with the central pawns, it opens up even more, giving a lot of chances. And that move a4 did create a weakness on b3 at some point for the right. bishops bishop to come in. Lovely. So I'm team uh, bishop pair. Team pan. bishop pair. Okay, very cool. We will continue our march, and then we're going to go to 
Fabi and Jan's position because when we left it, there was this night on B7, and I have to tell you, that was really spoiling the party. Uh, G2, G3 is how Fabi continued the game. Queen E7, and okay, obviously you're, you're threatening to pick it up this bishop, uh, pardon me, this knight, and... So Queen A4 hits the bishop on A3, so you can't immediately take the knight. And I was going to say already, I'm feeling so good about this. I mean, even if I did fall for rook takes b7 and allow you to trade and take the bishop, I'm looking at this knight and I'm going, I've got really great compensation. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that's, not, that's a stallion right there. That's yeah. It, not a pony. It's not a horse. <laughs> it's a stallion. And we're up to date. And I'm sure, you know, the engine once again loves the material, but... I don't know. From the practical point of view, yeah, it still loves the material. Well, I mean, it, it, it is a full exchange, and also right. that that knight on b7 that was, was worrying not. Us. It's back on a good square. Yeah. There's right. really no. I was good being point. being a hopeless romantic that I am. I was kind of wondering if I can do something stupid like this, but the answer is just no. Queen c8 is winning. I assume bishop g2 is also winning, although less cleanly. Mm -hmm. And if there is no immediate counterplay on the queen side, on the king side, and they have to do something like knight f6 and allow white to consolidate. Mm -hmm. It's still not going to be uh, easy to win uh, at all for, for Fabi because that knight on d4 is a very, very strong piece. And uh, the, the weakness on a6 got picked up, but the second one on c6 is well protected. The black king is very safe on g7. But Jan did something wrong here, Peter, because I'm looking at the position after 20, uh, what is it, uh, 26 uh, g3, mm -hmm. g3, and I'm thinking, okay, I've got a pawn, I've got my knight stallion, on d4, uh, shouldn't I be playing like c5 and bishop b4? Yeah. And how, it, is it really that bad? No, I, I also think that it really wasn't necessary to just give up on a6, uh, right. so uh, I think maybe he underestimated queen a4. I think what happened there is he thought queen e7 forces the knight to go away, and then he will establish the kind of a position that we were kind of aiming for, right? We, yes, exactly. We, we wanted, That's exactly well, not what a5 wanted. here because I blundered the point, right. but instead of a5, rook we, a8 or something. We do some, we do something sensible, you know, like rook b5 followed there you by go. a5. Exactly. And yeah, uh, shockingly, even this apparently is somehow better for white, which I just don't believe, honestly. Like, I, I would be. I would feel that I'm very much in the game here as black. Me too. Very, very confused by how much it loves the, the white position here. But I think I, he may have misjudged queen a4. And of mm. course he would prefer the a-pawn was still on the board. Mm. Yeah, and w well, once I see queen takes a6, I just feel like white's advantage ha has clarified. Of course. Uh, let's yeah. put it that way. Of course. Yeah. And again, I want to go to uh, our tournament leader, Liam, uh, co-tournament leader, Jeffrey Zhang, because, well, some very uh, peculiar things have happened. Uh, e5, uh, rook h3, the move that uh, Peter liked. Uh, you got uh, uh, a rover, rook up and over. Uh, queen d2, f5. My goodness, I would not have reached for the f pawn. What do you think about that? f5, en passant, b3, Castles, h5, I don't know, f5, that's it's peculiar. Yeah. But it does give you counterplay as well along the f line. Your queen on d4 now after the castle, uh, after black's castle, you are eyeing uh, the f line and the f2 pawn. Okay. It, it's a double-edged move, but I kind of liked it. Yeah, but you've left behind this guy. A long-term weakness. Queen he trades, and I think he wants to put the bishop on d4. Oh, definitely. He vacated the d4 square for the bishop. Yeah, it, it, definitely. I think that, uh, okay, so let, let's just go concretely. Rook, I'm assuming. Let's Queen give a check. One. Let's get out of dodge. And can you go bishop e5 here? Or bishop d4, one of the two. Yeah, bishop e5, let's go with um, bishop It's e5. a more forcing move, at least. Yeah, I agree. Bishop e5 is far more forcing. Yeah, yeah. Not comfortable to move. Yeah. I, I was just I was just thinking that we would be able to play queen and he's played rook c2. We might be we might have that on the board actually. Queen a1 has been played and rook c1 would only be a repetition except except 
in the Soviet school of chess, you always repeated once just to oh. show who uh, was in the driver's seat. Who was the seat. boss? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask so <laughs> what price they just repeat here, because I, honestly, it doesn't feel to me like white is better. No. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's not illogical to just play rook c1, rook c2, but both of these guys are. We've seen Jeffrey play on for, some for time, quite some time in, with in the Ray previous Robson, round. And, for example. Uh, yeah. Oh, but yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. already been a couple of repetitions, and I don't know if he plays king h2 having Rook c1 is just drawn the spot, yeah? That's the yeah. third time. I think, I think that will be the third time. So now is the, the, now moment. Is the moment for him to, uh, to make a decision. But that's Do the thing, still... right? Decision with king h2, is it really a big decision to play on? Because it's hard to see the advantage that white really has after you've I traded bishops. I don't see a big advantage. Is it still in your DNA to repeat the position and to show who's boss? I don't do it that often. I do it, I've become very, very nervous in time troubles as, mm. as the years gone by. Like I, I used to be completely fine being short on time and right. I no longer am. I really hate it. And also the definition of what is being short, short on time, time changed <laughs> drastically. <laughs> From two minutes, which was luxury, yeah. to two minutes, which is now panic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> five for ten now throws me into, you know, cold Frenzy, sweats. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, really wasn't the case when I was a kid. Uh, but as we see, uh, these, guys are, these guys are very, on. very ambitious and, and play on. And they have indeed played on with the move Queen C1. How about you, Ta Tanya? You, uh, let's repeat once, let's repeat twice. Let me t show you, it's my choice. I think that's a really professional way to approach the position and mm. I, I often see the top guys do that. Right. But for me personally, if I've decided that I want to play on, I try not to repeat unless there's a plus 10, plus 5, I need those extra seconds. Right. Because if I do repeat, I find myself Falling into doubting. the trap. Yes, I find myself thinking that do I want to take a draw? Mm. Do I want to be allowed? Do I really believe in this position? Good point. So I think if I want to play on, I take that decision instantly mm. uh, rather than repeat and take it. So but I also feel it's more So uh, sows a little seed of doubt. Uh, I'm not sure. I, for me, it does. Right. But I think I've seen a lot of players for whom it's no doubt at all. They just mm. repeat and then change. Right. They still have a single track mind. But uh, it's a personal choice, right? Mm. What about you, Yasser? Would you... It was the Soviets, man. Yeah. We grew up, uh, they were the best players in the world. So we copied them and we would repeat once and then twice and three times. <laughs> I was going to say that there's, there's also the, the actual correct correct school of thought, which just says repeat three times, <laughs> go home, right. know, have a, have a warm a bath. Good dinner, and yeah, and on, on that note, yes. uh, uh, Sam did something which is quite striking. He played 92 here, which makes sense positionally, but really doesn't make sense tactically. Oh, what's going on here? Knight takes e4, queen takes e4, bishop, bishop c4. c4. And things are, the knight on e2. things are going from bad to worse, and he's gone bishop takes a5 instead, sort of understandably. And uh, Ray went in with bishop h3, queen h3, which... Told you, Yasa, that's in the air. Bishop h3 is in the air. What, what somewhat, just happened? <laughs> somewhat sadly here, because I, I really like this idea, and I probably would have convinced myself to do it as well. It's not... Winning. Great, or at least not the best play. No. Something very simple like bishop f5 yeah. here would have given black a very, very big advantage. I was about to say, didn't you just trade your a5 pawn for the e4 pawn? That's a great deal for yeah. black. You don't have to go bishop h3. And it's, but, but this is still, I understand the, the, the impulse to do this because it looks very, very scary. The white's position looks scattered and un, rook e6, rook g6. Un, uncoordinated. Yeah, and uh, knight g3 played. Knight the G3. engine was suggesting uh, rook d3 first was stronger for some mm. reason. But even knight g3 is playable. I think this is maybe the issue, and this is what Ray like may have misunderstood. Queen that, g2. Yeah, this includes the queen in the defense. And you oh, start liking oh. white even because, Bishop. after all, it is a, it is a piece. Bishop D, no, the bishop on A5 defends E1, mm -hmm. One. so bishop D4 check is not good. No, not, not working there. No. no, because the E8 rook is hanging in those lines, mm -hmm. and you can you really find a way to keep the queens on the board after queen G3, queen G2, maybe go queen to F, but it doesn't really help it. This looks By like it's stopped the attack. By the way, we do have knight takes G3 yeah. on the board. And here, board. already knight takes G3 maybe, maybe wasn't the greatest decision. Uh, Either. And the engine suggests you can just play d6, d5, because you can also include this idea of going bishop b8 mm. somewhere. And this knight on e4 is annoying enough that you don't have to 
immediately go after additional material. You want rook a6, rook a8, bishop b8. Clear. If, let's say, if rook d3 happens, you can even play queen g4 first, and then, let's say, rook e6, rook a8. This was the way to continue. Having played bishop takes h3, which is, once again, a very understandable decision, a decision I quite like in spirit, but mm -hmm. maybe not the best move because the very simple move, bishop f5, was stronger. And now we're here. See, no, we're not here yet. Yeah, he's still thinking after fg. So uh, the knights but, have been traded. And... Yeah, it's, it's going to work out for Sam because this position is now quite simple to play for white. You want right. to play queen g2, you want to drop the bishop back to c3 so that it never hangs. Right. And... And you have to be careful as black that your bishop on a7 mm -hmm. doesn't it remains a spectator out of the game for a long while. Absolutely. Oh my. But I, I'm really stunned by the by the decision to play bishop h3 and not bishop f5. Yeah. I would have been patting myself on the back for a job well done, giving up my a5 pawn for that central e4 pawn. And you said it. You like the two bishops. I like the center pawn duo. That was a big pawn for black to pick up on it e4, was. and you can just continue playing that position, but bishop h3, and he played it so fast as well. It was, the, the temptation was too great, and uh, I think he sh it was ill-considered that, uh, he, you know, he thought there was some knockout blow. I mean, he missed something because bishop f5 is otherwise so compelling, and they've reached a position now with queen on g2, and I think the, the situation has suddenly become much easier for Sam to play. If I'm in white shoes, I know what I'm doing my next few moves. I'm playing bishop c3, and I'm trying to trade rooks, and hey, I'm, I'm a piece up. And it's a big question for Ray, right? Does he trade queens, or does he fall back with the queen to f4? I would hate to trade queens Yeah, in you really shoes. don't want to. Yeah. I really don't, because the problem, as I see it, is You've got three connected pass pawns, but they take quite a lot of time to become factors in the position. Whereas, you know, I'm going to play bishop c3 and maybe d5 and b4, b5. So I would want to keep the queens on the board with queen f4. He does it, and it makes a lot of sense. At the same time, I, I, I am recognizing that it's... I mean, I'm even looking at bishop, bishop d2. Eight. Do you have time to pick up d4? I'm not sure. Let's it's say I go. So it's playing with fire, no? Well, I've got h6 in my yes. sights. Yes. So you go queen f6. Just a second. I'm trying to figure out where <laughs> I should go with my king. If I go to f1, you go to f6, and I take. Wow. Oh, and this. Take, move the bishop. And. Do you take or do you move the bishop? Sorry. Complicated position and we know. and By we are way, getting we some results here. It this does end with a draw between the French number one and the French number two that ended peacefully. And it's been a good day for Ali Reza. It has. It has been a, a, a been nice uh, work. Uh, for MVL, a little bit of a roller coaster ride for him as uh, they're getting settled in. Uh, what do you have for us in the Fabi versus Nepo match? Jan will survive, seemingly. Mm. Uh, we left it somewhere around here, and uh, uh, Fabi went for, for a plan that I didn't quite expect. He uh, spent some time preparing this tactical idea that you will see in a moment. Jan played very logically, because the king on h1 might be a target with knight on d4 being as strong as it is. So playing h5, h4 is perfectly logical, and yeah, Fabi... Uh, found this uh, nice looking shot 95, but what it does is it trades some pieces off, which is what you like, but it also creates this glaring weakness on f2, which you can definitely counterplay against. Pin point, yeah. And if you play queen b2 here, which seems logical, but can just play queen f6, and uh, you don't really want to even consider playing f2, f3, you might actually end, yeah, end up getting mated. King to uh, g1. Yeah, so this, yeah, yeah, and if you have to start playing positions like this, you kind of know you're not winning them, it's just. Yeah. This is a monster, monster oh, counterpoint. Queen h5, queen h2. Queen g5, queen h2. Yeah, yeah this, this starts looking kind of scary. I'm going to have to play bishop to the degree h3. That, to the degree that the machine actually plays d4 here. Wow. Bishop takes d4, queen e2 to do the same thing but with a tempo. Okay. But then black can just uh, liquidate into this endgame, which is very, very comfortably drawn. Mm. 
mm. uh, three against one on one side with, uh, with an extra bishop is not going to be... And then enough. after you take on g3, do you trade on e4 or you push yeah, that pawn yeah, to yeah. d4? No, you no. Do you want to trade you, as many you, pawns you, as possible? Yeah, yes. you, you, you take, the, take as much of the board as possible. Yeah, exactly. And, and you are very, very comfortable that this will be enough now. Easy draw. Uh, queen b2, queen f6 chosen by, by Fabi. And yeah, this is now an interesting turning point because... Yeah. Uh, that d4, queen e2, that might have been the time to pull the ripcord because yeah. this could go I wrong. Think, I think I agree, yeah. Like, I'm just curious, is it, F already, is it already bad for white if we go f3, f3 93? 93. Yeah, you already start. And indeed. you start seeing h takes g3. And, and then queen g5. On h5 <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. bishop on c5. Well, it's opposite color bishop complex, right? Yeah. That black bishop is, you can't challenge it. You can't fight it. And it's exactly. quite a monster. Yeah, the machine, exactly. the machine says it's still a draw, but the way it makes that draw is this move. <laughs> Which uh, isn't the first instinct, exactly. No. Yeah, I, can't, I can't make it, apparently, but... But you give up uh, the rook for the knight, yeah. and then you hold the opposite color bishop. But that's also probably going to be a little bit of a struggle, no? Black's the one who's still calling the shots with the attack against White's king. I'm actually somewhat surprised it's this equal, this position. Like, how is that equal? Yeah. It looks to me like it should be made. But apparently it isn't. Yeah, I don't know what's happening here. Why isn't it making moves? Okay, just click on h2. Yes. And now g3. No, <laughs> h2. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why isn't queen g5 winning here? King I'm h2, very bishop h3. I guess, yeah. But you lose f3 as well, right? What? I'll go queen h5 and queen f3? You're or right. you don't care? No, I do care. <laughs> I care more about... Peter's handling of <laughs> no, this is going to be a, this is going to be a whole a whole subplot for the next <laughs> meme for the next uh, week and a half. Yeah, yeah. Well. I think it's just white, just unconvinced and unwilling to play this position. That's what's happening right now. Right. Well, and it's I the know. machine trying to tell Peter, like, come on, you don't want to play that. This is not what we want. That's not what you want. Let's discuss you something more exciting. <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Uh, let's do that as we leave that game. And I'm going to go over to Anish. And Wesley, so even though we haven't seen much, that game is looks to be headed to a draw with the bishops mm. of opposite color, regardless of the fact that black, pardon me, white has an extra pawn on g6. Uh, perfectly, perfectly safe. That was also a kind of a revelation for me was, uh, again, these bishops of opposite color positions where the bishop could hold two connected pass pawns comfortably. Like, it's not even close. No. Like, wow, that was really shocking. It's, it's, so, it's so easy. This is a, a single pawn. Yes, which should be much easier. There you need to know a few places to, uh, to be able to keep your bishop and king at the right spot. Right. But here, that's not even a question. And not these even. positions are so complicated. And a lot of us think that if it's opposite color bishop, it should just end in a draw. But very often, if you've got more pieces on the board, and that's what it comes to, is piece activity. Like the position that we saw in Yan's game. If it's about attack, opposite color bishops can be so dangerous because it doesn't have a challenger. Exactly, with the queens or other pieces on the board. Not but this so is this not case. it. This is not it. Uh, I'm going to go to the game of Ray Robson because I think that Sam is beginning oh. to take over. After queen f4, king h1, that's a very crafty little move by Sam. As he's setting up ideas of bishop d2, he's also, excuse me, that could be a half-open g-file that's very useful. And look at what he's done. I think he's made some marvelous progress here. Um, now, having said that, uh, without the ability to play knight g4, I, what have I accomplished? And what's next? Because black wants to come in oh, with rook to e2. Of course. I, I, I need to play for uh, rook to h3. And I think that's an important point, because now if you go rook e2, you're just in time getting the move that you want. Rook e2... Should I be playing queen h3 or should I be playing queen rook h3? h3? Queen g6. And knight g4. See, if, oh, excuse me, queen e4 check came out of nowhere. Well, we do have rook d3 on the board. Ooh. They may be following... What the, about rook h3? Rook h3, all right. And as uh, we analyze this, we're going to interrupt ourselves to jump to studio with Anastasia and a special guest. Take it away, Anastasia. 
Thank you, Yasser. And here I'm really with a special guest. Alireza Firuja is here with us. Welcome, Alireza. Alireza is the winner of the previous St. Louis Rapid and Blitz event. How do you feel yourself here today? We have changed the playing venue and we play today in the Hall of Fame. How did it go? Yeah, the set of, the feeling of the playing hall is the same. I feel like we changed the playing hall, but uh, the feeling of the chessboard and everything is the same. So it's not a big change, but... Yeah, and I feel happy with my play. I think it was a decent day. I could have maybe pushed last game more, but other than that, it was a good day. I think especially I had two blacks. So. Yeah, yeah, you start with two black pieces and yeah. uh, your victory against Fabi, I think it was really amazing. Yeah. I mean, this um, opposite castling, yes, position, maybe you can show a little bit yeah, what was very, happening there. It's very typical that after h3, White cannot castle short, mm -hmm. so it's very safe to castle long. And um, So you felt that your attack will be faster? Right. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And probably here he has to just go for an equal position with knight c4, takes, takes, and bishop c5, and it's very equal. But uh, he, want, he was ambitious here. Mm -hmm. And... Decided to go yeah. for this for this position, right. yeah. And uh, but I'm always faster because I have two bishops and knight h12, knight f4 is really quick. He has to push here, but it takes a lot of time. So you like your position here? Yeah, yeah. I I knew the position, so it's very typical. And it was it was a very t like it was a very easy game actually because my moves were very straightforward. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was t taking his time to make some mess, like some complication, but it's not easy because you're getting made. Yeah, you're just, I don't know, yeah, nothing yeah. is happening on the queen right, side, yeah, right? It, mm -hmm. it feels like always you have some AB, sacrifice the bishop, but queen is always ah, protected. So, yeah, I mean, b6 could look right. weak, but it's right. not, yeah? So, here he has to give up his second bishop, and then, uh, yeah, this is, I'm attacking for free, I'm not even sacrificing anything, so... Um, yeah, it's slowly, slowly here, just, it was very this easy game, Did, Could you expect it, expect it, you know, in the first yeah. round against Fabi to yeah, win yeah. with black pieces um, like that? I beat Fabi in this Berlin line three, four times, actually, with black. Really? Yeah, in candidates also. I don't know why he goes against it, always this against me, but... He feels like he's, he always has chance, but I think it's not going we have well some questions him. to Fabio to ask <laughs> later, yes. But yeah, I mean, it went smoothly for you. The, next, the second game finished in a draw, right, against uh, Jeffrey Jong, mm -hmm. and um, there was some repetition. Right. You had black pieces, and then, okay, the last round, you play against your compatriot, Maxim Vasily Graf, mm -hmm. and um, with white pieces finally. Yeah. What do you think you, you had you had some chance? Oh, you decided to avoid open uh, Sicilian, right? right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Maxine is very well prepared. So, and I have a good score in the tournament, so I didn't need to uh, yeah. risk like, or something. Risk yes. so much. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I decided to choose a very solid line. But um, this is a very old theory, actually. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't remember what, was the, what were the details, but I think... Yes, maybe it was perfect game. But or, yeah, it's, it seemed like actually a computer is happy with both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's say, was there any moment in this game you felt that you could um, have something? I felt like, but this is theory probably, it's, it's stupid to say, I felt like here I have a good chance, but I felt here we could try some other moves, but the pieces got exchanged. Yeah, and yeah, at the yeah. end it was just actually, I mean, so yeah. many trades followed up. Yeah. Alirza, yeah. such a great start for you. I mean, do you feel really good, I mean, to be here, yeah. to come back? Yeah, it feels really great. Uh, the, everything is perfect. The playing hall, they really managed to make it professional. So, um, until here, <laughs> I'm very happy, but we'll see how we'll go. Yeah, exactly. All the best of luck for you. Thank and we're going back to the studio. Thank you, Anastasia. Thank you, uh, Ali Reza. As again, he comes back to St. Louis. This has got to be his favorite city. Uh, what happened last year, winning the Blitz, winning the St. Phil Cup, winning, winning the Grandchester. I mean, it was just a magical, magical moment. What's going on uh, between Sam and Ray Robson? I keep flip-flopping in my mind. I, at, at first I thought Sam might have been doing something, but mm, no, no, no. Ray is taking over here, That's as you what, can see. Yeah. Uh, the line we were discussing uh, came on the board and Queen H3 was actually stronger than Rook H3. Right. Rook H3 was played, but it turned out that 
the trade of this many pieces actually favors black quite a bit. I think maybe now Sam uh, didn't realize he will not be able to take on h6 here because after mm. king g6, uh, followed by rook h8, he just loses that piece. And uh, Oops. Uh, knight had to go to e5 and also this very precise move c6, c5. Seems like we're opening up opening up this bishop on c3 for some a discovered check activities. But, yeah. but the fact that bishop takes c5 check is a check, yeah. changes the relation quite a bit here. So what we have on the board here is uh, is this position where Four pawns. Uh, very nice blockade on the d3 square, finally a very nice square for this knight. Potentially some passer on the queen side if white gets there, but four pawns running <laughs> yeah. on the king side is a much more immediate uh, Issues. You know, <laughs> issue to address. Uh, when you see the move f5, f4, and rook e3, and then you see five connected fast pawns, yeah. you start to think, wait a minute. Something's and, gone and, wrong. Something's gone wrong. Something's gone wrong. Yeah. And it was about these pawns, right? That right. you got these extra pawns, but they weren't moving. But right. now they're, they've got they're the there. mobility, they're there. The G pawn, if that finds itself G4, F3 coming in, you go king F5, you go G4, and it looks like it could be very, very dangerous. Maybe just simply losing. Rook E6, King F5, and escort yeah, the pawns. H5, H4, H5, King H5, F5. Yeah, just, just continue uh, Pushing going, going in, yeah. And, he hits the uh, D5 pawn. Okay. I think also maybe he wants to play Rook B3. I think yes. it's more even about mm. counterplay, yeah. creating some work for this Rook on H3 because uh, it was very much Wholeheartedly stuck. agreed. Yeah. Whole, yeah. This is still very sharp. It could, like, if Black spends too much time trying not to lose anything it's in the center. It's easy to spoil it, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think you have to play very energetically, as, as you can see here on our screen. The main line of the machine now is just giving up on d5, and then, yeah, will I or will I not be able to make the move bishop b8 is the big question here. And the answer is? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it also gives up the pawn on, come on, <laughs> let me make a move. No? Move? No. <laughs> now instantly, maybe yeah. it was played. Uh, no, it was not played. No. Uh, and then it gives up on b7 as well, just as to well. continue pushing uh, pushing on the king side. So the right way to approach this for uh, for a would be to go completely all in on cr making on as the, much progress on the king side as possible. You yeah. don't. And he played rook e5 instead, which is what I mean. It's very easy to. Ah, decide to, to I don't it. I don't have to I don't have to rush things I don't have to give up any of my you know he'll got gains I, I yeah. want to preserve everything I'll, I'll but it's not yeah, as fast is such rook. a human move you just defend the d5 pawn but not until you see rook b3 and knight to d3 that or also a5 a6 actually tactically there, there might be an idea here of playing a5 then mm. playing a6 and trying to get this four oh. to six going. So this is nice. There might also be tactical issues with uh, with what we're okay, doing here. Okay, that's a surprise idea. And it's on the board. Has he played a5? Did he find this? Rook e5? I'm, I'm very confused because Let it me. says he played rook e7, and I don't really, like, why would you? He actually did play rook e7. He played this. rook e5. A5, rook e7. And then came this very nice move a5 with, with uh, evil intentions of a6 and knight c6. In rook e7. This is very, very confusing because so we are... We, now you lose the pawn with the tempo. With the, yeah, I'm not sure what he's intending to do here. Is he intending to play rook e5 here or... Rook to d7? I don't know. <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm... He's played rook b3, by the way. He said... Uh, also, also makes perfect sense, I think. Yeah. The other move that actually funnily crossed my mind was if we wanted to play a6, maybe the rook on a3... Yeah. Uh, this and, is getting... Uh, let's just check in with uh, Liam, with, yes, who, that's another by the way, one. is Ooh. coming into this round tied for first, and he's taken over completely. I mean, that's two extra pawns, extremely Whoa. active rooks, and Black's king in a bit of a kill zone there. Oh, definitely. This has gone uh, south in a huge way. Liam mm. completely winning, I would say, after this move, bishop to d4. And, and we've bishop got a and result. And resignation. Wow, done deal as Liam. On fire. Yeah, Webster University. Two and a half out of three, well, five out of six. And arguably he should be disappointed. <laughs> right. Because he had a completely winning position in round two that he didn't win. Yeah, exactly. Let's jump uh, into studio with Anastasia and a special guest. 
Yeah, we have really special guests. We have Anish Giri with us. I mean, Anish, hello, welcome to the studio. And it's really nice to see you here again. Uh, but I felt today that it was a day of missed opportunities for you. I'm, every, every game I was checking, you had really good chances. Let's start from the beginning. Let's go through all the games very quickly. I mean, uh, it's also a day of missed opportunities for my opponent because every round they're facing me, which is an opportunity, <laughs> and which they, which they kept missing. So it's all relative, I think. But uh, uh, of course, I had some uh, good, uh, good chances. First game, of course, I was... Uh, Completely winning at one point. I mean, the opening he fell into my trap. Yeah. Uh, okay. Just yesterday, I realized that h6 is also very likely here mm -hmm. instead of oh, this. Just it nice just yeah. instead of uh, queen takes e4, which is the main move, then where it's sort of equal with accurate play. But after h6, you, it feels it's smart to nice. include. Yeah, but there is this rookie one. A rookie one move I like so much. Yeah, you know, now you nice. cannot take on g5. Yes, and yeah. it took me some time to realize it. Yes, it's trap. Yeah, but I knew that. I was expecting some queen a3. I thought it was not so. I mean, I knew computer gives like. A, Rook is three, yeah, right? Yeah, no, this is just over. So yes. I, I thought computer gives this like mm -hmm. um, some big plus. Oh, well, let's go. Mm -hmm. Big plus. Um, but I, I mean, I was not sure during the game like how bad it is. I don't know why he didn't play queen a3. He played rook c8, but I could take on e7 also. Maybe mm -hmm. it was better. I missed bishop d1. And here I kind of, uh, to my surprise, I mean, here I thought he's completely lost. But after bishop d1, to my surprise, it was not so simple. The end game also shouldn't have been so easy if he had played bishop of 8 here. And actually, it might still be within for him, because the thing is that he sort of has to control my pawns. So here, the problem was that I started getting obsessed about this idea of promoting my pawns. Of course, and I can understand why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you um, really want. No, he to missed be bishop there. before. The uh, trick is that after rook a two, I've got. Um... Oh, I already missed uh, rook a one here because I have d six and e six. E six I don't have because they take rook a one. So I miss this rook a one thing everywhere. D six here also wins. And after a5, okay, he's desperate. I mean, he missed bishop before. Now bishop of 8, there is also d6. It's mm -hmm. just d7. It's seven. Just, uh, so he missed this, and um, here, I mean, I just, uh, I just prom I mean, I go d6. I'm going d7, so he'll go before. And okay, of course, I understand this position is completely winning for me. But uh, I started to think, like, um, you know, it, it will maybe take a while to convert. I was thinking maybe he'll put the bishop... Here, I have to... 94 is maybe not so easy, I have to defend this, and then he will attack my bishop. I mean, I am so completely kind of winning, of course. In, okay, mm -hmm. it's, it cannot be blockade, but yeah. it's just, it will take some time. So, mm -hmm. I thought maybe... Uh, of course, I understand I'm winning, and I would normally take this without thinking, but suddenly I thought, okay, maybe I just can put him away with e6. And my logic was that uh, he sort of has to go before, because I thought e7 is queening. And I missed rook a1 everywhere. And here... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just thought, okay, I have this position versus the one versus this position. And like this is maybe even more winning. I missed rook a1 everywhere, so I thought that he has to, I don't know, a threatening, like, so I thought he might go rook, rook b2 or something. Then I think I have rook e4, that's what I was thinking. And then I will go e7, rook f4, rook f8, like, just, I'm just queen my pawn, so I thought, okay, this is winning. And then and I realized... rook a1, yes. Yeah, yeah when, I, when I make this move, like, with my hand, like, I sort of feel like, I, I see this bishop on g7, like, I open this diagonal, it feels kind of wrong, you know, like, the, yeah. the, the pawn is sort of opening, and then I said, like, yeah, but this is kind of long diagonal. And rook a1, of course, is... I mean, rook a1, it's everywhere, uh, the problem. So I missed this move, like, and when he played it, it's over. So it was just, like, one move. I mean, I'm just winning with d6. I don't yeah, know Yeah, exactly. I That's what I felt also, yes, that you were so winning in this game. And round two, I mean, against Nepo, this crazy game as well. Yeah, that one was always less uh, one-sided, because um, at one point... Okay, I um, Let's mixed up. check this critical moment. I think he, I asked him after the game if he missed this c4, and he said, of course I missed it. So let's, let's maybe show this ah, moment yeah. also. No, but there were many moments. I mean, yeah. okay, I there sort were, of... Yes. I sort of... Uh, b6 is not from... Not from this... Uh, not from this fairy tale. It's mm -hmm. not something, something else. Um, so I don't know. b6 is the wasted, wasted move. So now when I go b5... Uh, He's just uh, in time to take and c4. And I have this one trick in the game where uh, knight g5, bc, yeah, that now I mm -hmm. have this b2 in the end. So this may be what he missed from afar. Like this is like one trick that I have. Yeah. So the whole thing works yeah. out. So we have to move a little bit faster. I mean, it's, no, I don't think yeah. we have any rush. Uh, so yes. he's got <laughs> <laughs> no, you could go queen a3, which is very, very nice because if cb, he has got cb. And that's quite nice. So he also had missed some opportunities to be yeah. fair. Let's and show blunder, this C4, yeah? C4, yes. This was a critical moment. I think after that, you are absolutely winning in this game. Yeah, I mean, I'm winning, but not with the clock that I have. I think I had at that point, uh, it says four minutes. I felt like I had 10 seconds, but maybe I had, I don't think I had four minutes, but I don't know. I, I felt like I had no time at all. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, then I played very badly. I, yeah, I so what was the my... last moment where you missed this like chances for the weather victory? Yeah, you know, just generally, I'm just, um, I'm just, you know, the moment I was born already, I think, was when, <laughs> when things were getting difficult. It was never it's so, always well, honestly, like, that, like yes. I had like seconds, it was never obvious to me, the, because the problem is, okay, I have the extra pawn, but I have a very it's bad night on g6. It's never easy. Like the long term, night, yes. like, so mm -hmm. yeah, I think knight b5 was the move, I didn't even consider that move. I mean, I considered bringing the knight to d4, but I thought knight e7, knight e6, knight d4, okay. and, um, I didn't even consider knight b5, and I had no time, and the thing is, if I sort of guess king g2, uh, long, long term I'm a little bit um, not doing as winning as, as um, short term, because my knight on g6 is very, very bad, so I kind of just um, yeah. Okay, so Andy, I mean, thank you so much, I mean, the, the day was not so bad, three draws, but I wish you all the best of luck in the next round. Thank you. And we are going back to the studio, things are getting crazy. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Anastasia. I missed at birth. Uh, something I like went that. Wrong at birth. Anish might have missed some moves in the game, but he missed none of the jokes in the right. interview. Right. No, he didn't miss a moment <laughs> there. And we've got this uh, fascinating position. You don't normally see four pass pawns getting this close to promotion, and the players are on increment, as we've just seen. The last trick, uh, Sam is hoping that after B takes, he's going to play B6 and hoping that his B pawn will somehow magically make it after King takes B3 to He could have taken the knight there and just gone F2, F1 check because he gives the first check, but B takes A6 is uh, also not bad at all, of course. It's because not, of B6, not you take... He's, no, he's playing yeah, knight, knight A5 check, check as well. Knight A5 check, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's still a position that is quite tricky to play on 10 seconds because at some point you have to trust that he will give mate with And did you see that? I think he missed it. I yeah, think he missed 9 yeah. he, he really did. And Ray is played. Oh! It yeah, up. now you, you probably have to go in with F2. Uh, but yeah, but you, it's just a queen though, right? It should just be winning. Rook C5 check. check. King B4, Rook C1, Rook G1 should be enough. Yes. That should Ooh. be enough. Yes. Still gets there. Really? It became slightly trickier than it needed to be because he was 15 moves ago. He was, I think, more winning than he, than he is here. But Rook this should still, and if this you should go still a, carry the day. Yeah, if you go a seven, you take the rook and you queen with a check. Yeah, you yes. can also you can also go f1 check, win only the rook, and then go rook f8 and not allow the even more clean. Yeah, I'm not yes. sure which one is cleaner. Both <laughs> both seem perfectly perfectly winning to me. Knight c6 check on the board. Yeah. Choose a square, any square. B5, I guess. Yeah, why not? So d4, you just pick up knight d4 check. You just pick up the pawn on a6. Yeah, you know, you're even happier then because you don't even have to worry. But you have to play a7 here and gamble, but it's not much of a gamble. Yeah. Um, he yeah. doesn't even no do gamble. that. That is resigns, and with that, a big win for Ray Robson. It really was a topsy turvy affair. I think for Sam, he came in uh, tied for first, and he kind of felt that. Uh, he had some chances in this game against Ray, and he'll be disappointed. And for Ray, uh, great sense of relief uh, after the first two ra rounds. Uh, Ray, uh, and we're going to shoot back to studio with Anastasia and guest. And we have Lekwang Le Liam here with us. Liam, hello and welcome to the studio. It's really nice to see you here. Mm -hmm. And it's the um, third time that you're participating in St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. How did it feel to play today in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be here playing in this strong tournament. And I think today I couldn't ask for a better start. Absolutely, two and a half out of three, and it could have been even better if you would win this in the second round, right? So, but let's let's check the game one uh, where you played against Wesley Song. I think there was really interesting moment around this this time. Can you please yeah, check so what happened? Yeah. So when I play uh, this knight e4, I thought he would just take on e4 and mm -hmm. bishop e4, queen d6, and it's very drawish. Um, I can wait, I can play rook c1, and nothing much is happening here, I think it should be a draw. And then he got a bit ambitious, I guess, and he played this move, um, queen g6, and then I have this knight c5. So now after bishop f5, he's already a little bit tricky, because after knight d7, he told me he missed this move. I would think so, knight d7 is easy to miss, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is that black wants to play f6, but this move is... Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little bit uh, tricky. Let's say I go here, 
and then I potentially have a D6 as well. So, and he was a little bit low on time, so he couldn't evaluate it. So I think he, from this moment, he um, didn't find the best move, yeah, and then I, I managed to win this. Um, after D6, I think it's already winning. Uh, I had Knight F6 here as well, but I thought Queen F5 first is more accurate, yes. because I'm threatening Knight E5, also Knight F6 now. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's already lost. When did Thank you see you. this idea, Knight F6? Let's show it. It's such a brilliant mo move that, uh, I mean, I'm ready to show it again. I'm in Knight F6 here. Yes, uh, yes. At the end, look. Yeah, so I, I had this idea the entire time when I play after D6. I already saw that I have ideas like moving the Knight and then D7 forking the two rooks. Yeah. Uh, but here it really works best because if I if I play Knight F6 here... Mm -hmm. um, There's a difference. Uh, the difference is that Black still the e5 pawn is is easier to defend on e5, mm -hmm. so it should be still winning for white, but it may take a little bit more time. And the difference in the game is that the pawn on e4 is a much uh, is much weaker. And after I I go here, d7, um, I don't think there's a defense for black. For example, yeah. black may play f5, but okay, I can go like rook d5, uh, knight e7, let's say rook e5, and then. Um, potentially, I'll go G4 later. It's so really nice that both rooks be, uh, keep yeah. uh, hanging. <laughs> I don't have to take them. <laughs> you don't you need even yes. to take them immediately. This exactly. is really cool. Um, so let's go to check the, the other games. Let's go for the one you won. I mean, the third round, right? Yeah. So um, let's have a look. We just finished right now against Jeffrey Jean. Well, let's go to some yeah. critical moments. So, um, I think I misplayed the uh, opening or the middle game a little bit. Around here, I thought I had a um, very decent position. I think I'm supposed to take on c6 like this and go knight e5. And then rook h3 ideas, queen g4, queen h5. And white should have a small pressure. But um, the way it happened in the game, it was just equal. I, I thought um, at this point he was repeating the move and I could have taken a draw, but I thought, okay, let's let's play a little bit and see what happens. Yeah, that was an interesting um, moment our commentators were discussing. I mean, did you want just to repeat the position once, or you were really thinking to to make a draw? <laughs> well, usually, um, you know, in in these moments, it doesn't hurt to repeat once and mm -hmm. get some time and see what your opponent's attention. So you are. have this habit, yes, of repeating. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's a good habit. Also, it kind of you know shows who is. <laughs> <laughs> in charge of this position, exactly. because uh, I'm the only one who is deciding to play on him. Mm -hmm. Of course, it wasn't much. Um, I think somewhere around here, uh, yes, this is the critical moment. After c4, I took dc, and here he should have just taken back with bc, and then I was planning king e4, and then just he can have rook c8, and this is um, very drawish is uh, eventually we will exchange on the pieces. Though, yeah. yeah, but g4 is potentially mm -hmm. weak. So the problem is that uh, I think he missed this move after king e2, bc, and then I have bishop e3. And this is already a little bit tricky. Um, I see that the engine here says black and horn with bishop takes e3, rook takes e3, and some move like king f7. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it's still a pawn, um, a pawn down for black, so it wasn't so easy. And the way I play, uh, after bishop e3, he didn't take, and that was just losing for black. So I would say I was a little bit lucky in this game, um, but uh, that kind of compensated for the second game where I couldn't win. Yes, yes, exactly. It was so winning at the end. I mean, coming first day, two and a half points. Um, is it important for you to start well the tournament? I think so. I think in the tournaments that I got a good result, usually I start very well. Um, so definitely that's a good start, but it's only the first day and I will play um, all the other opponents are still super strong, so I don't expect any easy day. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for your comments and I think it's time to go back to the studio if nobody has questions. <laughs> Thank you, Anastasia. <laughs> Our congratulations to a very uh, deserving uh, first place uh, player, uh, Tanya, after three rounds of rabbit. What a fantastic day for Liam, who was the last minute replacement for Ding Liren. It's so truly. coming into the tournament and having wild a dream card. start, a wild card into wow. the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz finishes the day with two wins and a draw, a total of five points. Ali Reza Feruja also has reasons to be very pleased with his play today Indeed. in second position with Ray Robson.
Absolutely, as we see uh, several players tied uh, at 50%. I think Sam will be a little bit dis disappointed with 50% and Fabiano uh, most especially. Uh, those players uh, at the bottom of the table there well, oh, great. <laughs> well, what a start, Peter, for uh, I'm just kind of catching my breath there. Yeah. Uh, I was really, really stunned that uh, th this game that uh, Ray turned around. I mean, it's yeah, that was That was around. a very, very interesting game. And uh, you, you rarely see this mass of pawns all seemingly promoting at the same time. So very picturesque towards the end and very exactly. nicely, nicely fought by Ray, who's had a difficult day, I think, but finishing it on such a high will, will stand him in good stead. But I think the story of the day clearly is... Uh, uh, Liam, who should have been on 100%. Right. Uh, as last minute replacements, uh, <laughs> as, as the superstition goes, you know, somebody who gets, gets on a plane in the last minute generally does very well in the tournament. So we wish him well. And we're not surprised he's doing well. He actually is, like, I think, a very well established, very strong player yeah. just outside the, the absolute elite. Right. Doing great in uh, shorter time controls. So that's that's his day for sure. Absolutely. And we're going to leave it to Anastasia in studio all by herself this time to give her final thoughts of a very eventful day one. Anastasia, close the show. Yeah, I felt a little bit lonely without you guys, but still I had a chance to see the players and the venue, so I hope you feel also jealous about it a little bit. <laughs> so I had a chance to to, sp to speak with the players and, um, for example, Yanni Pomna, she was definitely disappointed with, with not only with his result, but the way he plays. And I think it, it's because he didn't play at all for one month. This is what he said. Um, I mean, Alireza, I think, is um, getting <laughs> better and better today. He started with a victory, those two draws, still we'll see what will happen after. And of course, impressive result by uh, Liam, Lequang Liam. Um, I remember him from 2013 when he became the World uh, Blitz Champion. So I'm not surprised that he's doing well with short time controls. I mean, things are getting very, very interesting and we'll see what, what the second day will bring us. Absolutely. So come back to you. Thank you, Anastasia, indeed. And thank you for sharing your day with us. It's always nice to have you in um, studio with us and just tell your friends where you're hanging out. Tanya, Peter, to you both, thank you for coming to St. Louis and making it so much more uh, enjoyable. Thank you both. It was an awesome day one and we will see you tomorrow, Absolutely. same time, same place as the action continues in the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. See you all tomorrow. See you then. This has been a presentation of the St. Louis Chess Club. Any reproduction or distribution of this content without the express written consent of the St. Louis Chess Club is prohibited.